Section 14 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. Out of the Closet a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. The Man Who Became a Woman, Part 1, by Sherwood Anderson. My father was a retail druggist in our town, out in Nebraska, which was so much like a thousand other towns I've been in since, that there's no use falling around and taking up your time and mine trying to describe it. Anyway, I became a drug clerk, and after father's death, the store was sold, and mother took the money and went west to her sister in California, giving me four hundred dollars with which to make my start in the world. I was only nineteen years old then. I came to Chicago, where I worked as a drug clerk for a time, and then, as my health suddenly went back on me, perhaps because I was so sick of my lonely life in the city, and of the sight and smell of the drug store, I decided to set out on what seemed to me then the great adventure, and became for a time a tramp, working now and then when I had no money, but spending all the time I could loafing around out of doors or riding up and down the land on freight trains and trying to see the world. I even did some stealing in lonely towns at night. Once a pretty good suit of clothes that someone had left hanging out on a clothesline and once some shoes out of a box in a freight car but I was in constant terror of being caught and put into jail, so realised that success as a thief was not for me. The most delightful experience of that period of my life was when I once worked as a groom or swipe with racehorses, and it was during that time I met a young fellow of about my own age who has since become a writer of some prominence. The young man of whom I now speak had gone into racetrack work as a groom to bring a kind of flourish, a high spot, he used to say, into his life. He was then unmarried and had not been successful as a writer. What I mean is he was free and I guess with him, as with me, there was something he liked about the people who hang about a racetrack the touts, swipes, drivers, niggers and gamblers. You know what a gaudy, undependable lot they are, if you've ever been around the tracks much, about the best liars I've ever seen, and not saving money or thinking about morals, like most druggists, dry goods merchants and the others who used to be my father's friends in our Nebraska town and not bending the knee much either. Or kowtowing to people they thought must be grander or richer or more powerful than themselves. What I mean is they were an independent, go to the devil, come have a drink of whiskey kind of a crew, and when one of them won a bet, knocked him off, we called it, his money was just dirt to him while it lasted. No king or president or soap manufacturer, gone on a trip with his family to Europe, could throw on more dog than one of them with his big diamond rings and the diamond horseshoe stuck in his necktie and all. I liked the whole lot pretty well and he did too. He was groomed temporarily for a pacing gelding named Lumpy Joe, owned by a tall black moustached man named Alfred Craneborg, and trying the best he could to make the bluff to himself, he was a real one. 
It happened that we were on the same circuit, doing the West Pennsylvania County Fairs all that fall, and on fine evenings we spent a good deal of time walking and talking together. Let us suppose it to be a Monday or Tuesday evening, and our horses had been put away for the night. The racing didn't start until later in the week, maybe Wednesday usually. There was always a little place called a dining hall run mostly by the Women's Christian Temperance Associations of the towns and we would go there to eat where we could get a pretty good meal for 25 cents. At least then we thought it pretty good. I would manage it so that I sat beside this fellow, whose name was Tom Means, and when we had got through eating, we would go look at our two horses again, and when we got there, Lumpy Joe would be eating his hay in his box stall, and Alfred Craneborg would be standing there, pulling his moustache, and looking as sad as a sick crane. But he wasn't really sad. You two boys want to go down to see the girls. I'm an old duffer and way past that myself. You go on along. I'll be setting here anyway, and I'll keep an eye on both the horses for you, he would say. So we would set off, going not into the town to try to get in with some of the town girls, who might have taken up with us because we were strangers and racetrack fellows, but out into the country. Sometimes we got into a hilly country and there was a moon. The leaves were falling off the trees and lay in the road so that we kicked them up with the dust as we went along. To tell the truth, I suppose I got to love Tom Means, who was five years older than me, although I wouldn't have dared say so then. Americans are shy and timid about saying things like that, and a man here don't dare own up he loves another man, I found out, and they are afraid to admit such feelings to themselves even. I guess they're afraid it may be taken to mean something it don't need to at all. Anyway, we walked along and some of the trees were already bare and looked like people standing solemnly beside the road and listening to what we had to say. Only I didn't say much. Tom Means did most of the talking. Sometimes we came back to the racetrack and it was late and the moon had gone down and it was dark. Then we often walked round and round the track, sometimes a dozen times, before we crawled into the hay to go to bed. Tom talked always on two subjects, writing and racehorses, but mostly about racehorses. The quiet sounds about the race tracks and the smells of horses and the things that go with horses seemed to get him all excited. Oh, hell, Herman Dudley, he would burst out suddenly. Don't go talking to me. I know what I think. I've been around more than you have, and I've seen a world of people. There isn't any man or woman, not even a fellow's own mother, as fine as a horse, that is to say, a thoroughbred horse. Sometimes he would go on like that a long time speaking of people he had seen and their characteristics. He wanted to be a writer later, and what he said was that when he came to be one, he wanted to write the way a well-bred horse runs or trots or paces. Whether he ever did it or not, I can't say. He has written a lot, but I'm not too good a judge of such things. Anyway, I don't think he has. But when he got on the subject of horses, he certainly was a derby. I would never have felt the way I finally got to feel about horses or enjoyed my stay among them half so much if it hadn't been for him. 
Often he would go on talking for an hour, maybe, speaking of horses' bodies and of their minds and wills as though they were human beings. Lord help us, Herman, he would say, grabbing hold of my arm. Don't it get you up in the throat? I say now, when a good one, like that lumpy Joe I'm swiping, flattens himself at the head of the stretch and he's coming and you know he's coming and you know his heart's sound and he's game and you know he isn't going to let himself get licked. Don't it get to you, Herman? Don't it get to you like the old Harry? That's the way he would talk and then later, sometimes, he'd talk about writing and get himself all het up about that too. He had some notions about writing I've never got myself around to thinking much about. But just the same, maybe his talk, working in me, has led me to want to begin to write this story myself. There was one experience of that time on the tracks that I am forced, by some feeling inside myself, to tell. Well, I don't know why, but I've just got to. It will be kind of like confession is, I suppose, to a good Catholic. Or maybe, better yet, like cleaning up the room you live in if you are a bachelor, like I was for so long. The room gets pretty mussy, and the bed not made some days, and clothes, and things thrown on the closet floor, and maybe under the bed. And then you clean all up and put on your new sheets and then you take off all your clothes and get down on your hands and knees and scrub the floor so clean you could eat bread off it. And then you take a walk and come home after a while and your room smells sweet and you feel sweetened up and better inside yourself too. What I mean is this story has been on my chest and I've often dreamed about the happenings in it, even after I married Jessie and was happy. Sometimes I even screamed out at night, and so I said to myself, I'll write the dang story, and here it goes. Fall had come on, and in the mornings now, when we crept out of our blankets, spread out on the hay in the tiny lofts above the horse stalls, and put our heads out to look around, there was a white rime of frost on the ground. When we woke, the horses woke too. You know how it is at the tracks. The little barn-like stalls with the tiny lofts above are all set along in a row, and there are two doors to each stall, one coming up to a horse's breast, and then a top one that is only closed at night and in bad weather. In the mornings the upper door is swung open and fastened back and the horses put their heads out. There is the white rime on the grass over inside the grey oval the track makes. Usually there is some outfit that has six, ten or even twelve horses and perhaps they have a negro cook who does his cooking at an open fire in the clear space before the row of stalls, and he is at work now, and the horses with their big fine eyes are looking about and whinnying. And a stallion looks out at the door of one of the stalls and sees a sweet-eyed mare looking at him and sends up his trumpet call, and a man's voice laughs, and there are no women anywhere in sight or no sign of one anywhere, and everyone feels like laughing and usually does. It's pretty fine, but I didn't know how fine it was until I got to know Tom Means and heard him talk all about it. At the time the thing happened of which I am trying to tell now, Tom was no longer with me. A week before his owner, Alfred Craneborg had taken his horse Lumpy Joe over into the Ohio Fair circuit and I saw no more of Tom at the tracks. There was a story going about the stores that Lumpy Joe, a big rangy brown gelding, 
wasn't really named Lumpy Joe at all, that he was a ringer who had made a fast record out in Iowa and up through the northwest country the year before, and that Craneborg had picked him up and had kept him under wraps all winter and had brought him over into the Pennsylvania country under this new name and made a clean-up in the books. I know nothing about that and never talked to Tom about it, but anyway, he, Lumpy Joe and Craneborg were all gone now. I suppose I'll always remember those days and Tom's talk at night and before that in the early September evenings how we sat around in front of the stalls and Craneborg sitting on an upturned feed box and pulling at his long black moustache and sometimes humming a little ditty one couldn't catch the words of. It was something about a deep well and a little grey squirrel crawling up the sides of it, and he never laughed or smiled much, but there was something in his solemn grey eyes, not quite a twinkle, something more delicate than that. The others talked in low tones, and Tom and I sat in silence. He never did his best talking except when he and I were alone. For his sake, if he ever sees my story, I should mention that at the only big track we ever visited, at Reedville, Pennsylvania, we saw old Pop Gears, the great racing driver himself. His horses were at a place far away across the tracks from where we were stabled. I suppose a man like him was likely to get the choice of all the good places for his horses. We went over there one evening and stood about and there was Gears himself, sitting before one of the stalls on a box tapping the ground with a riding whip. They called him, around the tracks, the silent man from Tennessee, and he was silent, that night anyway. All we did was to stand and look at him for maybe a half hour, and then we went away, and that night Tom talked better than I had ever heard him. He said that the ambition of his life was to wait until Pop Gears died and then write a book about him and to show in the book that there was at least one American who never went nutty about getting rich or owning a big factory of being any other kind of a hell of a fellow. He's satisfied, I think, to sit around like that and wait until the big moments of his life come, when he heads a fast one into the stretch, and then, darn his soul, he can give all of himself to the thing right in front of him, Tom said, and then he was so worked up he began to blubber. We were walking along the fence on the inside of the tracks, and it was dusk, and in some trees nearby, some birds, just sparrows maybe, were making a chirping sound, and you could hear insects singing, and where there was a little light, off to the west between some trees, motes were dancing in the air. Tom said that about Pop Gears, although I think he was thinking most about something he wanted to be himself, and wasn't and then he went and stood by the fence and sort of blubbered, and I began to blubber too, although I didn't know what about. But perhaps I did know after all. I suppose Tom wanted to feel, when he became a writer, like he thought old Pop must feel when his horse swung around the upper turn, and there lay the stretch before him, and if he was going to get his horse home in front, he had to do it right then. What Tom said was that any man had something in him that understands about a thing like that, but that no woman ever did except up in her brain. He often got off things like that about women, but I notice he later married one of them just the same. 
But to get back to my knitting. After Tom had left, the stable I was with kept drifting along through nice little Pennsylvania county seat towns. My owner, a strange, excitable kind of man from over in Ohio, who had lost a lot of money on horses but was always thinking he would maybe get it all back in some big killing, had been playing in pretty good luck that year. The horse I had, a tough little gelding, a five-year-old, had been getting home in front pretty regular, and so he took some of his winnings and bought a three-years-old black-pacing stallion named Oh My Man. My gelding was called Picket Boy, because when he was in a race and had got into the stretch, my owner always got half wild with excitement and shouted so you could hear him a mile and a half. Go, Picket Boy, Picket Boy, Picket Boy, he kept shouting, and so when he had got hold of this good little gelding, he had named him that. The gelding was a fast one all right. As the boys at the track used to say, he picked em up sharp and set em down clean. And he was what we called a natural racehorse, right up to all the speed he had and didn't require much training. All you got to do is to drop him down on the track and he'll go was what my owner was always saying to other men when he was bragging about his horse. And so, you see, after Tom left, I hadn't much to do evenings, and then the new stallion, the three-year-old, came on with a negro swipe named Bert. I liked him fine, and he liked me, but not the same as Tom and me. We got to be friends all right, and I suppose Bert would have done things for me, and maybe me for him, that Tom and me wouldn't have done for each other. But with a negro you couldn't be close friends like you can with another white man. There's some reason you can't understand, but it's true. There's been too much talk about the difference between whites and blacks, and you're both shy, and anyway... No use trying, and I suppose Bert and I both knew it, and so I was pretty lonesome. Something happened to me that happened several times when I was a young fellow that I have never exactly understood. Sometimes now I think it was all because I had got to be almost a man and had never been with a woman. I don't know what's the matter with me. I can't ask a woman. I've tried it a good many times in my life, but every time I've tried, the same thing happened. Of course, with Jessie now, it's different, but at the time of which I'm speaking, Jessie was a long ways off, and a good many things were to happen to me before I got to her. Around a racetrack, as you may suppose, the fellows who are swipes and drivers and strangers in the towns do not go without women. They don't have to. In any town there are always some fly girls will come around a place like that. I suppose they think they are falling with men who lead romantic lives. Such girls will come along by the front of the stalls where the racehorses are and if you look all right to them they will stop and make a fuss over your horse. They rub their little hands over the horse's nose and then is the time for you. If you aren't a fellow like me who can't get up the nerve, then is the time for you to smile and say, Hello kid and make a date with one of them for that evening uptown after supper. I couldn't do that, although the Lord knows I tried hard enough, often enough. A girl would come along alone, and she would be a little thing and give me the eye, and I would try and try but couldn't say anything. Both Tom and Bert afterwards used to laugh at me about it sometimes. But what I think is that, had I been able to speak up to one of them and had managed to make a date with her, nothing would have come of it. 
we would probably have walked around the town and got off together in the dark somewhere, where the town came to an end, and then she would have had to knock me over with a club before it got any further. And so there I was, having got used to Tom and our talks together. And Bert, of course, had his own friends among the black men. I got lazy and mopey and had a hard time doing my work. It was like this. Sometimes I would be sitting, perhaps under a tree, in the late afternoon when the races were over for the day and the crowds had gone away. There were always a lot of other men and boys who hadn't any horses in the races that day, and they would be standing or sitting about in front of the stalls and talking. I would listen for a time to their talk, and then their voices would seem to go far away. The things I was looking at would go far away too. Perhaps there would be a tree not more than a hundred yards away, and it would just come out of the ground and float away like a thistle. It would get smaller and smaller, away off there in the sky, and then suddenly, bang, it would be back where it belonged, in the ground, and I would begin hearing the voices of the men talking again. When Tom was with me that summer, the nights were splendid. We usually walked about and talked until pretty late, and then I crawled up into my hole and went to sleep. Always out of Tom's talk, I got something that stayed in my mind, after I was off by myself, curled up in my blanket. I suppose he had a way of making pictures as he talked, and the pictures stayed by me as Bert was always saying pork chops did by him. Give me the old pork chops, they stick to the ribs, Bert was always saying, and with the imagination it was always that way about Tom's talks. He started something inside you that went on and on, and your mind played with it like walking about in a strange town and seeing the sights and you slipped off to sleep and had splendid dreams and woke up in the morning feeling fine. And then he was gone, and it wasn't that way any more, and I got into the fix I have described. At night I kept seeing women's bodies and women's lips and things in my dreams and woke up in the morning feeling like the old Harry. Bert was pretty good to me, he always helped me call Picket Boy out after a race, and he did the things himself that take the most skill and quickness, like getting the bandages on a horse's legs smooth, and seeing that every strap is setting just right, and every buckle drawn up to just the right hole, before your horse goes out on the track for a heat. Bert knew there was something wrong with me and put himself out not to let the boss know. When the boss was around, he was always bragging about me. The brightest kid I've ever worked with around the tracks, he would say and grin, and that at a time when I wasn't worth my salt. When you go out with the horses, there is one job that always takes a lot of time. In the late afternoon, after your horse has been in a race, and after you have washed him and rubbed him out, he has to be walked slowly, sometimes for hours and hours, so he'll call out slowly and won't get muscle-bound. I got so I did that job for both our horses, and Bert did the more important things. It left him free to go talk or shoot dice with the other niggers, and I didn't mind. I rather liked it, and after a hard race even the stallion, oh my man, was tame enough, even when there were mares about. You walk and walk and walk, around in a little circle, and your horse's head is right by your shoulder, and all around you the life of the place you are in is going on, and in a queer way you get so you aren't really a part of it at all. 
Perhaps no one ever gets as I was then, except boys that aren't quite men yet, and who, like me, have never been with girls or women. To really be with them, up to the hilt, I mean. I used to wonder if young girls got that way too, before they married, or did what we used to call go on the town. If I remember it right, though, I didn't do much thinking then. Often I would have forgotten supper if Bert hadn't shouted at me and reminded me, and sometimes he forgot and went off to town with one of the other niggers, and I did forget. There I was with the horse, going slow, 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 around a circle that way. The people were leaving the fairgrounds now, some afoot, some driving away to the farms in wagons and fords. Clouds of dust floated in the air, and over to the west, where the town was, maybe the sun was going down, a red ball of fire through the dust. Only a few hours before, the crowd had been all filled with excitement and everyone shouting. Let us suppose my horse had been in a race that afternoon, and I had stood in front of the grandstand with my horse blanket over my shoulder, alongside of Bert, perhaps, and when they came into the stretch, my owner began to call in that queer high voice of his that seemed to float over the top of all the shouting up in the grandstand. And his voice was saying over and over, Go, pick it, boy, pick it, boy, pick it, boy, the way he always did, and my heart was thumping so I could hardly breathe, and Bert was leaning over and snapping his fingers and muttering, Come, little sweet, come on home, your mamma wants you. Come get your lasses and bread, little picket boy. Well, all that was over now, and the voices of the people left around were all low. And Picket Boy, I was leading him slowly around the little ring, to call him out slowly, as I've said. He was different too. Maybe he had pretty nearly broken his heart, trying to get down to the wire in front, or getting down there, in front and now everything inside him was quiet and tired, as it was nearly all the time those days in me, except in me tired, but not quiet. You remember I've told you we always walked in a circle, round and round and round. I guess something inside me got to going round and round and round too. The sun did sometimes, and the trees and the clouds of dust. I had to think sometimes about putting down my feet so they went straight down in the right place and I didn't get to staggering like a drunken man. And a funny feeling came that it is going to be hard to describe. It had something to do with the life in the horse and in me. Sometimes, these late years, I've thought maybe Negroes would understand what I'm trying to talk about now better than any white man ever will. I mean something about men and animals, something between them. Something that can perhaps only happen to a white man when he has slipped off his base a little, as I suppose I had then. I think maybe a lot of horsey people feel it sometimes, though. It's something like this, maybe. Do you suppose it could be that something we whites have got and think such a lot of and are so proud about isn't much of any good after all? It's something in us that wants to be big and grand and important, maybe, and won't let us just be like a horse or a dog or a bird can. Let's say Picket Boy had won his race that day. He did that pretty often that summer. Well, he was neither proud like I would have been in his place, or mean in one part of the inside of him either. He was just himself, doing something with a kind of simplicity. 
That's what Picket Boy was like, and I got to feeling it in him as I walked with him slowly in the gathering darkness. I got inside him in some way I can't explain, and he got inside me. Often we would stop walking for no cause, and he would put his nose up against my face. I wished he was a girl sometimes, or that I was a girl and he was a man. It's an odd thing to say, but it's a fact. Being with him that way, so long, and in such a quiet way, cured something in me a little. Often after an evening like that, I slept all right and did not have the kind of dreams I've spoken about. But I wasn't cured for very long, and couldn't get cured. My body seemed all right and just as good as ever, but there wasn't no pep in me. Then the fall got later and later and we came to the last town we were going to make before my owner laid his horses up for the winter, in his home town over across the state line in Ohio, and the track was up on a hill, or rather in a kind of high plain above the town. It wasn't much of a place and the sheds were rather rickety and the track bad, especially at the turns. As soon as we got to the place and got stabled, it began to rain and kept it up all week so the fair had to be put off. As the purses weren't very large, a lot of the owners shipped right out but our owner stayed. The fair owners guaranteed expenses whether the races were held the next week or not. And all week there wasn't much of anything for Bert and me to do but clean manure out of the stores in the morning, watch for a chance when the rain let up a little to jog the horses around the track in the mud and then clean them off, blanket them and stick them back in their stalls. It was the hardest time of all for me. Bert wasn't so bad off as there were a dozen or two blacks around and in the evening they went off to town, got liquored up a little and came home late, singing and talking even in the cold rain. And then one night I got mixed up in the thing I'm trying to tell you about. It was a Saturday evening and when I look back at it now, it seems to me everyone had left the tracks but just me. In the early evening, swipe after swipe came over to my stall and asked me if I was going to stick around. When I said I was, he would ask me to keep an eye out for him, that nothing happened to his horse. Just take a stroll down that way now and then, eh, kid? One of them would say. I just want to run up to town for an hour or two. I would say yes, to be sure, and so pretty soon it was dark as pitch up there in that little ruined fairground and nothing living anywhere around but the horses and me. I stood it as long as I could, walking here and there in the mud and rain and thinking all the time I wished I was someone else and not myself. If I was someone else, I thought, I wouldn't be here but down there in the town with the others. I saw myself going into saloons and having drinks and later going off to a house maybe and getting myself a woman. I got to thinking so much that as I went stumbling around up there in the darkness, it was as though what was in my mind was actually happening. Only I wasn't with some cheap woman, such as I would have found had I had the nerve to do what I wanted, but with such a woman as I thought then I should never find in this world. She was slender and like a flower and with something in her like a racehorse too, something in her like picket boy in the stretch, I guess. And I thought about her and thought about her until I couldn't stand thinking any more. I'll do something anyway, I said to myself. 
So, although I had told all the swipes I would stay and watch their horses, I went out of the fairgrounds and down the hill a ways. I went down until I came to a little low saloon, not in the main part of the town itself, but halfway up the hillside. The saloon had once been a residence, a farmhouse perhaps, but if it was ever a farmhouse, I'm sure the farmer who lived there and worked the land on that hillside hadn't made out very well. The country didn't look like a farming country, such as one sees all about the other county seat towns we had been visiting all through the late summer and fall. Everywhere you looked there were stones sticking out of the ground and the trees mostly of the stubby, stunty kind. It looked wild and untidy and ragged, that's what I mean. On the flat plain up above, where the fairground was, there were a few fields and pastures, and there were some sheep raised, and in the field right next to the tracks, on the furthest side from town, on the back stretch side, there had once been a slaughterhouse, the ruins of which were still standing. It hadn't been used for quite some time, but there were bones of animals lying all about in the field, and there was a smell coming out of the old building that would curl your hair. The horses hated the place, just as we swipes did, and in the morning when we were jogging them around the track in the mud, to keep them in racing condition, Picket Boy and Oh My Man both raised old Ned every time we headed them up the back stretch and got near to where the old slaughterhouse stood. They would rear and fight at the bit and go off their stride and run until they got clear of the rotten smells, and neither Bert nor I could make them stop. It's a hell of a town down there, and this is a hell of a track for racing. Bert kept saying. If they ever have their danged old fair, someone's going to get spilled and may be killed back here. Whether they did or not, I don't know, as I didn't stay for the fair, for reasons I'll tell you pretty soon. But Bert was speaking sense all right. A racehorse isn't like a human being. He won't stand for it to have to do his work in any rotten, ugly kind of dump the way a man will. And he won't stand for the smells a man will either. But to get back to my story again. There I was, going down the hillside in the darkness and the cold soaking rain and breaking my word to all the others about staying up above and watching the horses. When I got to the little saloon, I decided to stop and have a drink or two. I'd found out long before that about two drinks upset me, so I was two-thirds piped and couldn't walk straight, but on that night I didn't care a tinker's dam. So I went up a kind of path out of the road toward the front door of the saloon. It was in what must have been the parlour of the place when it was a farmhouse and there was a little front porch. I stopped before I opened the door and looked about a little. From where I stood I could look right down into the main street of the town like being in a big city like New York or Chicago and looking down out of the 15th floor of an office building into the street. The hillside was mighty steep and the road up had to wind and wind or no one could ever have come up out of the town to their plagued old fair at all. It wasn't much of a town I saw. A main street with a lot of saloons and a few stores, one or two dinky moving picture places, a few forts, hardly any women or girls in sight and a raft of men. I tried to think of the girl I had been dreaming about as I walked around in the mud and darkness up at the fairground, living in the place, but I couldn't make it. 
It was like trying to think of Picket Boy getting himself worked up to the state I was in then and going into the ugly dump I was going into. It couldn't be done. All the same, I knew the town wasn't all right there in sight. There must have been a good many of the kinds of houses Pennsylvania miners live in back in the hills or around a turn in the valley in which the main street stood. What I suppose is that it being Saturday night and raining, the women and kids had all stayed at home and only the men were out, intending to get themselves liquored up. I've been in some other mining town since, and if I was a miner and had to live in one of them, or in one of the houses they live in with their women and kids, I'd get out and liquor myself up too. So there I stood looking, and as sick as a dog inside myself, and as wet and cold as a rat in a sewer pipe. I could see the mass of dark figures moving about down below, and beyond the main street there was a river that made a sound you could hear distinctly, even up where I was, and over beyond the river were some railroad tracks with switch engines going up and down. I suppose they had something to do with the mines in which the men of the town worked. Anyway, as I stood watching and listening, there was now and then a sound like thunder rolling down the sky. And I suppose that was a lot of coal, maybe a whole carload being let down plunk into a coal car. And then besides there was, on the side of a hill far away, a long row of coke ovens. They had little doors through which the light from the fire within leaked out, and as they were set closely, side by side, they looked like the teeth of some big man-eating giant lying and waiting over there in the hills. The sight of it all, even the sight of the kind of hell holes men are satisfied to go on living in, gave me the fantods and the shivers right down in my liver, and on that night I guess I had in me a kind of contempt for all men, including myself, that I've never had so thoroughly since. Come right down to it, I suppose women aren't so much to blame as men. They aren't running the show. End of section 14 Recording by Ashley Jane Section 15 of Out of the Closet A collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. The Man Who Became a Woman, Part 2, by Sherwood Anderson. Then I pushed open the door and went into the saloon. There were about a dozen men, miners I suppose, playing cards at tables in a little long dirty room with a bar at one side of it and with a big red-faced man with a moustache standing back of the bar. The place smelled as such places do where men hang around who have worked and sweated in their clothes and perhaps slept in them too and have never had them washed but have just kept on wearing them. I guess you know what I mean if you've ever been in a city. You smell that smell in a city, in street cars on rainy nights when a lot of factory hands get on. I got pretty used to that smell when I was a tramp and pretty sick of it too. And so I was in the place now, with a glass of whiskey in my hand, and I thought all the miners were staring at me, which they weren't at all, but I thought they were, and so I felt just the same as though they had been. 
and then I looked up and saw my own face in the old cracked looking-glass back of the bar. If the miners had been staring or laughing at me, I wouldn't have wondered when I saw what I looked like. It, I mean my own face, was white and pasty-looking, and for some reason, I can't tell exactly why, it wasn't my own face at all. It's a funny business I'm trying to tell you about, and I know what you may be thinking of me as well as you do, so you needn't suppose I'm innocent or ashamed. I'm only wondering. I've thought about it a lot since, and I can't make it out. I know I was never that way before that night, and I know I've never been that way since. Maybe it was lonesomeness, just lonesomeness, gone on in me too long. I've often wondered if women generally are lonesomer than men. The point is that the face I saw in the looking-glass back of that bar when I looked up from my glass of whisky that evening wasn't my own face at all, but the face of a woman. It was a girl's face, that's what I mean. That's what it was. It was a girl's face and a lonesome and scared girl too. She was just a kid at that. When I saw that the glass of whisky came pretty near falling out of my hand, but I gulped it down, put a dollar on the bar and called for another. I've got to be careful here. I'm up against something new, I told myself. If any of these men in here get on to me, there's going to be trouble. When I had got the second drink in me, I called for a third, and I thought, when I get this drink down, I'll get out of here and back up the hill to the fairground before I make a fool of myself and begin to get drunk. And then, while I was thinking and drinking my third glass of whisky, the men in the room began to laugh, and of course I thought they were laughing at me. But they weren't. No one in the place had really paid any attention to me. What they were laughing at was a man who had just come in at the door. I've never seen such a fellow. He was a huge big man with red hair that stuck straight up like bristles out of his head and he had a red-haired kid in his arms. The kid was just like himself, big, I mean, for his age, and with the same kind of stiff red hair. He came and set the kid up on the bar close beside me and called for a glass of whisky for himself and all the men in the room began to shout and laugh at him and his kid. Only they didn't shout and laugh when he was looking, so he could tell which ones did it, but did all their shouting and laughing when his head was turned the other way. They kept calling him cracked, the crack is getting wider in the old tin pan, someone sang, and then they all laughed. I'm puzzled, you see, just how to make you feel as I felt that night. I suppose, having undertaken to write this story, that's what I'm up against, trying to do that. I'm not claiming to be able to inform you or to do you any good. I'm just trying to make you understand some things about me as I would like to understand some things about you or anyone if I had the chance. Anyway, the whole blamed thing, the thing that went on, I mean, in that little saloon on that rainy Saturday night wasn't like anything quite real. I've already told you how I looked into the glass back of the bar and had seen there not my own face but the face of a scared young girl. Well, the men, the miners, sitting at the tables in the half-dark room, the red-faced bartender, the unholy-looking big man who had come in and his queer-looking kid now sitting on the bar, 
all of them were like characters in some play, not like real people at all. There was myself that wasn't myself, and I'm not any fairy. Anyone who has ever known me knows better than that. And then there was the man who had come in. There was a feeling came out of him that wasn't like the feeling you get from a man at all. It was more like the feeling you get maybe from a horse, only his eyes weren't like a horse's eyes. Horse's eyes have a kind of calm something in them, and his hadn't. If you've ever carried a lantern through a ward at night, going along a path, and then suddenly you felt something funny in the air and stopped, and there ahead of you somewhere were the eyes of some little animal gleaming out at you from a dead wall of darkness. The eyes shine big and quiet, but there is a point right in the centre of each where there is something dancing and wavering. You aren't afraid the little animal will jump at you. You are afraid the little eyes will jump at you. That's what's the matter with you. Only, of course, a horse, when you go into his stall at night, or a little animal you had disturbed in a wood that way, wouldn't be talking, and the big man who had come in there with his kid was talking. He kept talking all the time, saying something under his breath, as they say, and I could only understand now and then a few words. It was his talking made him kind of terrible. His eyes said one thing and his lips another. They didn't seem to get together as though they belonged to the same person. For one thing the man was too big. There was about him an unnatural bigness. It was in his hands, his arms, his shoulders, his body, his head, a bigness like you might see in trees and bushes in a tropical country perhaps. I've never been in a tropical country, but I've seen pictures. Only his eyes were small. In his big head they looked like the eyes of a bird, and I remember that his lips were thick, like Negro's lips. He paid no attention to me or to the others in the room, but kept on muttering to himself, or to the kid sitting on the bar, I couldn't tell to which. First he had one drink, and then, quick, another. I stood staring at him and thinking, a jumble of thoughts, I suppose. What I must have been thinking was something like this. Well, he's one of the kind you are always seeing about towns, I thought. I meant he was one of the cracked kind. In almost any small town you go to, you will find one and sometimes two or three cracked people walking around. They go through the street muttering to themselves, and people generally are cruel to them. Their own folks make a bluff at being kind, but they aren't really, and the others in the town, men and boys, like to tease them. They send such a fellow the mild, silly kind, on some fool errand after a round square or a dozen post holes or tie cards on his back saying kick me or something like that and then carry on and laugh as though they had done something funny. And so there was this cracked one in that saloon and I could see the men in there wanted to have some fun putting up some kind of horse play on him but they didn't quite dare. He wasn't one of the mild kind, that was a cinch. I kept looking at the man and at his kid and then up at that strange unreal reflection of myself in the cracked looking glass back of the bar. Rats, rats, digging in the ground, mine as a rat's, little jackrabbit, I heard him say to his solemn-faced kid. I guess, after all, maybe he wasn't so cracked. The kid sitting on the bar kept blinking at his father like an owl caught out in the daylight, 
and now the father was having another glass of whisky. He drank six glasses, one right after the other, and it was cheap ten-cent stuff. He must have had cast iron insides all right. Of the men in the room there were two or three. Maybe they were really more scared than the others, so had to put up a bluff of bravery by showing off, who kept laughing and making funny cracks about the big man and his kid, and there was one fellow was the worst of the bunch. I'll never forget that fellow because of his looks and what happened to him afterwards. He was one of the showing-off kind, all right, and he was the one that had started the song about the crack getting bigger in the old tin pan. He sang it two or three times, and then he grew bolder and got up and began walking up and down the room, singing it over and over. He was a showy kind of man, with a fancy vest on which there were brown tobacco spots, and he wore glasses. Every time he made some crack he thought was funny, he winked at the others, as though to say, You see me? I'm not afraid of this big fellow. And then the others laughed. The proprietor of the place must have known what was going on, and the danger in it, because he kept leaning over the bar and saying, Shush, now quit it to the showy-off man, but it didn't do any good. The fellow kept prancing like a turkey cock, and he put his hat on one side of his head and stopped right back of the big man and sang that song about the crack in the old tin pan. He was one of the kind you can't shush until they get their blocks knocked off, and it didn't take him long to come to it that time anyhow because the big fellow just kept on muttering to his kid and drinking his whisky as though he hadn't heard anything. And then suddenly he turned, and his big hand flashed out, and he grabbed not the fellow who had been showing off, but me. With just a sweep of his arm, he brought me up against his big body. Then he shoved me over with my breast jammed against the bar, and looking right into his kid's face, he said, Now you watch him, and if you let him fall, I'll kill you. In just quite ordinary tones, as though he was saying good morning to some neighbour. Then the kid leaned over and threw his arms around my head, and in spite of that, I did manage to screw my head around enough to see what happened. It was a sight I'll never forget. The big fellow had whirled around, and he had the showy-off man by the shoulder now, and the fellow's face was a sight. The big man must have had some reputation as a bad man in the town, even though he was cracked, for the man with the fancy vest had his mouth open now, and his hat had fallen off his head, and he was silent and scared. Once, when I was a tramp, I saw a kid killed by a train. The kid was walking on the rail and showing off before some other kids, by letting them see how close he could let an engine come to him before he got out of the way. And the engine was whistling, and a woman over on the porch of a house nearby was jumping up and down and screaming, and the kid let the engine get nearer and nearer, wanting more and more to show off, and then he stumbled and fell. God, I'll never forget the look on his face, in just the second before he got hit and killed, and now, there in that saloon, was the same terrible look on another face. I closed my eyes for a moment and was sick all through me, and then, when I opened my eyes, the big man's fist was just coming down in the other man's face. The one blow knocked him cold, and he fell down like a beast hit with an axe. And then the most terrible thing of all happened. The big man had on heavy boots, 
and he raised one of them and brought it down on the other man's shoulder as he lay white and groaning on the floor. I could hear the bones crunch and it made me so sick I could hardly stand up, but I had to stand up and hold on to that kid or I knew it would be my turn next. Because the big fellow didn't seem excited or anything, but kept on muttering to himself, as he had been doing when he was standing peacefully by the bar, drinking his whisky, and now he had raised his foot again, and maybe this time he would bring it down in the other man's face and just eliminate his map for keeps, as sports and prize fighters sometimes say. I trembled like I was having a chill. But thank God at that moment the kid, who had his arms around me, and one hand clinging to my nose so that there were the marks of his fingernails on it the next morning, at that moment the kid, thank God, began to howl, and his father didn't bother any more with the man on the floor, but turned around, knocked me aside, and taking his kid in his arms, tramped out of that place, muttering to himself, as he had been doing ever since he came in. I went out too, but I didn't prance out with any dignity, I'll tell you that. I slunk out like a thief or a coward, which perhaps I am, partly, anyhow. And so there I was, outside there in the darkness, and it was as cold and wet and black and God-forsaken a night as any man ever saw. I was so sick at the thought of human beings that night I could have vomited to think of them at all. For a while I just stumbled along in the mud of the road, going up the hill, back to the fairground, and then almost before I knew where I was I found myself in the stall with Picket Boy. That was one of the best and sweetest feelings I've ever had in my whole life, being in that warm stall alone with that horse that night. I had told the other swipes that I would go up and down the row of stalls now and then and have an eye on the other horses, but I had altogether forgotten my promise now. I went and stood with my back against the side of the wall, thinking how mean and low and all balled up and twisted up human beings can become, and how the best of them are likely to get that way any time just because they are human beings and not simple and clear in their minds and inside themselves as animals are, maybe. Perhaps you know how a person feels at such a moment. There are things you think of, odd little things you had thought you had forgotten. Once, when you were a kid, you were with your father, and he was all dressed up, as for a funeral or Fourth of July, and was walking along a street holding your hand. And you were going past a railroad station, and there was a woman standing. She was a stranger in your town and was dressed as you had never seen a woman dressed before and never thought you would see one looking so nice. Long afterwards you knew that was because she had lovely tasting clothes, such as so few women have really, but then you thought she must be a queen. You had read about queens in fairy stories and the thoughts of them thrilled you. What lovely eyes the strange lady had and what beautiful rings she wore on her fingers. Then your father came out from being in the railroad station, maybe to set his watch by the station clock, and took you by the hand, and he and the woman smiled at each other, in an embarrassed kind of way, and you kept looking longingly back at her, and when you were out of her hearing, you asked your father if she really were a queen. And it may be that your father was one who wasn't so very hot on democracy and a free country and talked up bunk about a free citizenry. And he said he hoped she was a queen and maybe, for all he knew, she was. Or maybe, 
when you get jammed up as I was that night and can't get things clear about yourself or other people and why you are alive, or for that matter why anyone you can think about is alive, you think not of people at all but of other things you have seen and felt, like walking along a road in the snow in the winter, perhaps out in Iowa, and hearing soft warm sounds in a barn close to the road, or of another time when you were on a hill and the sun was going down and the sky suddenly became a great soft-coloured bowl, all glowing like a jewel-handled bowl. A great queen in some faraway mighty kingdom might have put on a vast table out under the tree once a year when she invited all her loyal and loving subjects to come and dine with her. I can't, of course, figure out what you try to think about when you are as desolate as I was that night. Maybe you are like me and inclined to think of women, and maybe you are like a man I met once on the road, who told me that when he was up against it he never thought of anything but grub and a big, nice, clean, warm bed to sleep in. I don't care about anything else, and I don't ever let myself think of anything else, he said. If I was like you and went to thinking about women sometime, I'd find myself hooked up to some skirt and she'd have the old double cross on me and the rest of my life, maybe, I'd be working in some factory for her and her kids. As I say, there I was anyway up there alone with that horse in that warm stall in that dark lonesome fairground, and I had that feeling about being sick at the thought of human beings and what they could be like. Well, suddenly I got again the queer feeling I'd had about him once or twice before. I mean the feeling about our understanding each other in some way I can't explain. So having it again I went over to where he stood and began running my hands all over his body, just because I loved the feel of him and as sometimes, to tell the plain truth, I felt about touching with my hands the body of a woman I've seen and who I thought was lovely too. I ran my hands over his head and neck and then down over his hard, firm, round body and then over his flanks and down his legs. His flanks quivered a little, I remember, and once he turned his head and stuck his cold nose down along my neck and nipped my shoulder a little, in a soft, playful way. It hurt a little, but I didn't care. So then I crawled up through a hole into the loft above, thinking that night was over anyway, and glad of it. But it wasn't, not by a long sight. As my clothes were all soaking wet, and as we raced, track swipes didn't own any such things as nightgowns or pyjamas, I'd had to go to bed naked, of course. But we had plenty of horse blankets, and so I tucked myself in between a pile of them and tried not to think any more that night. The being with Picket Boy and having him close right under me that way made me feel a little better. Then I was sound asleep and dreaming, and bang, like being hit with a club by someone who has sneaked up behind you, I got another wallop. What I suppose is that, being upset the way I was, I had forgotten to bolt the door to Picket Boy's stall down below, and two negro men had come in there, thinking they were in their own place, and had climbed up through the hole where I was. They were half lit up, but not what you might call dead drunk, and I suppose they were up against something, a couple of white swipes, who had some money in their pockets, wouldn't have been up against. What I mean is that a couple of white swipes, having liquored themselves up and being down there in the town on a bat, if they wanted a woman or a couple of women, would have been able to find them. 
There is always a few women of that kind can be found around any town I've ever seen or heard of, and of course a bartender would have given them the tip where to go. But a negro up there in that country where there aren't any, or anyway mighty few negro women, wouldn't know what to do when he felt that way and would be up against it. It's so always. Bert and several other Negroes I've known pretty well have talked to me about it lots of times. You take now a young Negro man, not a racetrack swipe or a tramp or any other low-down kind of fellow, but, let us say, one who has been to college and has behaved himself and tried to be a good man the best he could and be clean, as they say. He isn't any better off, is he? If he has made himself some money and wants to go sit in a swell restaurant or go to hear some good music or see a good play at the theatre, he gets what we used to call on the tracks, the messy end of the dung fork, doesn't he? And even in such low-down place as what people call a bad house, it's the same way. The white swipes and others can go into a place where they have negro women fast enough and they do it too. But you let a negro swipe try it the other way around and see how he comes out. You see, I can think this whole thing out fairly now, sitting here in my own house and writing, and with my wife Jessie in the kitchen making a pie or something and I can show just how the two negro men who came into that loft where I was asleep were justified in what they did. And I can preach about how the negroes are up against it in this country, like a daisy. But I'll tell you what, I didn't think things out that way that night. For you understand what they thought, they being half liquored up, and when one of them had jerked the blankets off me, was that I was a woman. One of them carried a lantern, but it was smoky and dirty and didn't give out much light. So they must have figured it out, my body being pretty white and slender then, like a young girl's body, I suppose, that some white swipe had brought me up there. The kind of girls around a town that will come with a swipe to a racetrack on a rainy night aren't very fancy females, but you'll find that kind in the towns all right. I've seen many a one in my day. And so I figure, these two big buck niggers being piped that way just made up their minds they would snatch me away from the white swipe who had brought me out there and who had left me lying carelessly around. Just you lie still, honey. We ain't gwin hurt you none, one of them said with a little chuckling laugh that had something in it besides a laugh too. It was the kind of laugh that gives you the shivers. The devil of it was I couldn't say anything, not even a word. Why I couldn't yell out and say, what the hell? and just kid them a little and shoo them out of there, I don't know, but I couldn't. I tried and tried so that my throat hurt, but I didn't say a word. I just lay there staring at them. It was a mixed-up night. I've never gone through another night like it. Was I scared? Lord Almighty, I'll tell you what I was scared because the two big black faces were leaning right over me now, and I could feel their liquored-up breaths on my cheeks, and their eyes were shining in the dim light from that smoky lantern, and right in the centre of their eyes was that dancing, flickering light I've told you about your seeing in the eyes of wild animals when you were carrying a lantern through the woods at night. It was a puzzler. All my life, you see, me never having any sisters, and at that time never having had a sweetheart either, I had been dreaming and thinking about women, and I suppose I'd always been dreaming about a pure innocent one for myself, 
made for me, by God, maybe. Men are that way. No matter how big they talk about, let the women go hang, they've always got that notion tucked away inside themselves, somewhere. It's a kind of chesty man's notion, I suppose, but they've got it, and the kind of up-and-coming women we have nowadays, who are always saying, I'm as good as a man and will do what the men do, are on the wrong trail if they really ever want to, what you might say, hog-tie, a fellow of their own. So I had invented a kind of princess, with black hair and a slender willowy body to dream about, and I thought of her as being shy and afraid to ever tell anything she really felt to anyone but just me. I suppose I fancied that if I ever found such a woman in the flesh, I would be the strong, sure one, and she the timid, shrinking one. And now I was that woman, or something like her, myself. I gave a kind of wriggle, like a fish, you have just taken off the hook. What I did next wasn't a thought-out thing. I was caught, and I squirmed, that's all. The two niggers both jumped at me, but somehow, the lantern having been kicked over and having gone out the first move they made, well, in some way, when they both lunged at me, they missed. As good luck would have it, my feet found the hole where you put hay down to the horse in the stall below, and through which we crawled up when it was time to go to bed in our blankets up in the hay, and down I slid, not bothering to try to find the ladder with my feet, but just letting myself go. In less than a second I was out of doors in the dark and the rain and the two blacks were down the hole and out the door of the stall after me. How long or how far they really followed me I suppose I'll never know. It was black dark and raining hard now and a roaring wind had begun to blow. Of course, my body being white, it must have made some kind of a faint streak in the darkness as I ran, and anyway, I thought they could see me, and I knew I couldn't see them, and that made my terror ten times worse. Every minute I thought they would grab me. You know how it is when a person is all upset and full of terror as I was. I suppose maybe the two niggers found me for a while, running across the muddy racetrack and into the grove of trees that grew in the oval inside the track, but likely enough, after just a few minutes, they gave up the chase and went back, found their own place and went to sleep. They were liquored up, as I've said, and maybe partly funning too. But I didn't know that if they were. As I ran I kept hearing sounds, sounds made by the rain coming down through the dead old leaves left on the trees and by the wind blowing, and it may be that the sound that scared me most of all was my own bare feet stepping on a dead branch and breaking it or something like that. There was something strange and scary a steady sound, like a heavy man running and breathing hard, right at my shoulder. It may have been my own breath, coming quick and fast. And I thought I heard that chuckling laugh I had heard up in the loft, the laugh that sent the shivers right down through me. Of course, every tree I came close to looked like a man standing there, ready to grab me and I kept dodging and going, bang, into other trees. My shoulders kept knocking against trees in that way, and the skin was all knocked off, and every time it happened I thought a big black hand had come down and clutched at me and was tearing my flesh. How long it went on I don't know, maybe an hour, maybe five minutes. But anyway, the darkness didn't let up 
and the terror didn't let up, and I couldn't, to save my life, scream or make any sound. Just why I couldn't, I don't know. Could it be because at the time I was a woman, while at the same time I wasn't a woman? It may be that I was too ashamed of having turned into a girl and being afraid of a man to make any sound. I don't know about that. It's over my head. But anyway, I couldn't make a sound. I tried and tried, but my throat hurt from trying and no sound came. And then, after a long time, or what seemed like a long time, I got out from among the trees inside the track and was on the track itself again. I thought the two black men were still after me, you understand, and I ran like a madman. Of course, running along the track that way, it must have been up the back stretch. I came after a time to where the old slaughterhouse stood, in that field beside the track. I knew it by its ungodly smell, scared as I was. Then, in some way, I managed to get over the high old fairground fence and was in the field where the slaughterhouse was. All the time I was trying to yell or scream or be sensible and tell those two black men that I was a man and not a woman, but I couldn't make it. And then I heard a sound like a board cracking or breaking in the fence and thought they were still after me. So I kept on running like a crazy man in the field and just then I stumbled and fell over something. I've told you how the old slaughterhouse field was filled with bones that had been lying there a long time and had all been washed white. There were heads of sheep and cows and all kinds of things. And when I fell and pitched forward, I fell right into the midst of something, still and cold and white. It was probably the skeleton of a horse lying there. In small towns like that, they take an old worn-out horse that has died and haul him off to some field outside of town and skin him for the hide that they can sell for a dollar or two. It doesn't make any difference what the horse has been, that's the way he usually ends up. Maybe even Picket Boy or Oh My Man or a lot of other good fast ones I've seen and known have ended that way by this time. And so I think it was the bones of a horse lying there and he must have been lying on his back. The birds and wild animals had picked all his flesh away and the rain had washed his bones clean. Anyway, I fell and pitched forward and my side got cut pretty deep and my hands clutched at something. I had fallen right in between the ribs of the horse and they seemed to wrap themselves around me close. And my hands, clutching upwards, had got hold of the cheeks of that dead horse and the bones of his cheeks were cold as ice with the rain washing over them. White bones wrapped around me and white bones in my hands. There was a new terror now that seemed to go down to the very bottom of me, to the bottom of the inside of me, I mean. It shook me like I have seen a rat in a barn shaken by a dog. It was a terror like a big wave that hits you when you were walking on a seashore, maybe. You see it coming and you try to run and get away, but when you start to run inshore, there is a stone cliff you can't climb. So the wave comes high as a mountain and there it is, right in front of you, and nothing in all this world can stop it. And now it had knocked you down and rolled and tumbled you over and washed you clean, clean but dead maybe. And that's the way I felt. I seemed to myself dead with blind terror. It was a feeling like the finger of God running down your back and burning you clean, I mean. 
It burned all that silly nonsense about being a girl right out of me. I screamed at last, and the spell that was on me was broken. I'll bet the scream I let out of me could have been heard a mile and a half. Right away I felt better, and crawled out from among the pile of bones. And then I stood on my own feet again, and I wasn't a woman or a young girl any more, but a man and my own self. And as far as I know, I've been that way ever since. Even the black night seemed warm and alive now, like a mother might to a kid in the dark. Only I couldn't go back to the racetrack because I was blubbering and crying and was ashamed of myself and of what a fool I had made of myself. Someone might see me and I couldn't stand that, not at that moment. So I went across the field, walking now, not running like a crazy man, and pretty soon I came to a fence and crawled over and got into another field in which there was a straw stack I just happened to find in the pitch darkness. The straw stack had been there a long time and some sheep had nibbled at it until they had made a pretty deep hole like a cave in the side of it. I found the hole and crawled in it and there were some sheep in there, about a dozen of them. When I came in, creeping on my hands and knees, they didn't make much fuss, just stirred around a little and then settled down. So I settled down amongst them too. They were warm and gentle and kind, like Picket Boy and being in there with them made me feel better than I would have felt being with any human person I knew at that time. So I settled down and slept after a while, and when I woke up it was daylight and not very cold and the rain was over. The clouds were breaking away from the sky now, and maybe there would be a fair the next week, but if there was I knew I wouldn't be there to see it because what I expected to happen did happen. I had to go back across the fields and the fairground to the place where my clothes were, right in the broad daylight, and me stark naked, and of course I knew someone would be up and would raise a shout, and every swipe and every driver would stick his head out and would whoop with laughter and there would be a thousand questions asked, and I would be too mad and too ashamed to answer, and would perhaps begin to blubber, and that would make me more ashamed than ever. It all turned out just as I expected, except that when the noise and the shouts of laughter were going it the loudest, Bert came out of the stall where Oh My Man was kept, and when he saw me, he didn't know what was the matter, but he knew something was up that wasn't on the square, and for which I wasn't to blame. So he got so all fired mad, he couldn't speak for a minute, and then he grabbed a pitchfork and began prancing up and down before the other stalls, giving that gang of swipes and drivers such a royal old dressing down as you never heard. You should have heard him sling language. It was grand to hear. And while he was doing it, I sneaked up into the loft, blubbering because I was so pleased and happy to hear him swear that way. And I got my wet clothes on quick and got down and gave Picket Boy a goodbye kiss on the cheek and lit out. The last I saw of all that part of my life was Bert, still going it, and yelling out for the man who had put up a trick on me to come out and get what was coming to him. He had the pitchfork in his hand and was swinging it around, and every now and then he would make a kind of lunge at a tree or something. He was so mad through, and there was no one else in sight at all and Bert didn't even see me cutting out along the fence through a gate and down the hill and out of the racehorse and the tramp life for the rest of my days. End of section 15 Recording by Ashley Jane
Section 16 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Out of the Deeps by Elizabeth Stoddard. Horace Hampton brooded by the fire in his dusky parlour, and his cousin George Hampton sat near him. When a jet of flame darted from the grate and lighted up their faces, they saw the grief which was busy at their hearts. For a long time they had been silent, intent upon their cigars. Now one moved his hand, and the other his foot, and then each supposed the other was about to speak. Horace and George were cousins. Horace was married, a prosperous man of business, and George was a bachelor and a lawyer. Both were men of means, lived in the same circle, enjoyed the same amusements, and many of their attachments were in common. Consequently, they were much in each other's society, and Charlotte Hamden, the wife of Horace, looked upon George as one of her family. A few weeks before this period, Horace, not able to leave his business, permitted Charlotte to take their only son, a boy of fourteen, to France, to be educated in the college at Amiens. She crossed the sea in safety, left her son, and started on the return voyage in the steamer Andromeda. When her arrival was nearly due, a terrible gale sprung up and extended along the Atlantic seaboard, which lasted several days. Prayers for those at sea went up from all interested souls, and a raging anxiety devoured both Horace and George. The nominal date of the Andromeda's arrival went by. Other steamers came in, more or less ravaged by the storm. News of shipwreck were rife. The underwriters were busy. But nothing was heard of the Andromeda. At first the papers gave plausible reasons, mentioned the seaworthy character of the steamer, and the ability of her commander, and then became oblivious. Afterwards, when a list of her passengers was published, more than one person read the name of Charlotte Hamden with regret. She was popular in her circle, and deserved to be, still in her brightest prime, handsome and lovable in all respects. Her friends, in their obituary remarks, said that her life might be compared to a party of pleasure sailing over a calm lake on a summer's day. Now her awful fate had been mysterious, annihilated by the dreadful sea in some sudden spasm of relentless fury, and engulfed in the dark world of a deep which never gives up its dead. Horace and George watched and waited still, with hopes that hourly turned to despair, and refused to own their fatal dread to each other. One day a ship came into port with tidings which confirmed the wreck of the Andromeda. Sailing north of Hatteras, she had come in contact with a mass of floating gear and secured it. There was evidence that a useless effort had been made by some drowning wretches to tie spars and boards together. A portion of a bulkhead was with it. With a coarse brush some ship's hand had drawn the outline of a dromedary with a huge hump, and upon that were the half-effaced letters which composed the name Andromeda. The day this news appeared, Horace and George met on the pier where the ship was moored, with the same errand, that of seeing with their own eyes, and hearing with their own ears, the truth. Hand griping hand, they turned away, and brokenly said that all hope was gone. Oh, cried poor Horace, to have no last service to perform, to know that this loss must be forever invisible. As if she were merely absent, no last memories to turn to, but one temporary farewell, replied George. The evening found them together by the deserted fireside. George broke the silence at last. Is dinner nearly ready? he asked. Half an hour yet, replied Horace, holding his watch to the firelight. Will you have the gas lighted? No. Something lies so heavy at my heart that I have resolved to unburden myself. My dear boy, said Horace, 
surprised that he should choose the present moment for a personal confidence, but thinking that he meant it for his own distraction, he added that he was all attention. "'We are such complicated creatures,' began George, "'and circumstances so arrange our consciences that all reasoning is baffled. "'Were Charlotte living, it would be impossible for me to make this confession, "'though living or dead, to her I am the same man. "'I have long loved her, Horace, as no man should love the wife of his friend "'or the wife of any man.' By the stress of my suffering and my sympathy for you, I tell you, we are one in this loss. Horace was dumb. Another chasm seemed to open in his life. What else should he see in the dark backward and abyss of time? Are you amazed? continued George. Charlotte has never dreamed of me. To her I have been your friend. The reflection of our friendship has chastely fallen on her affectionate heart. Unconsciously, Horace drew a breath of relief, which George, with deep sadness, perceived, and went on. I tell you this partly because, if mere abstract love is noble, mine has been, and partly to prove to you that I have entered into your loss as no other being can, and with the hope that my pure and faithful love may prove a bond between us, and an everlasting solace. To all intents and worldly purposes, your son shall be my son, and together, as white-headed old men, we will watch and aid his progress into manhood and the duties of life. George ended with a hysterical sob. His instincts told him that Horace was less great than himself at this moment, and he was disappointed. Horace, too, was now conscious of a want of magnanimity. But how was it possible to resist that vital jealousy which invades the soul of a man when the woman whose sole possession is his own comes in question with another man? He longed to be alone that he might go back over all the past of their mutual lives. But swallowing something, he knew not what, he rose suddenly, offered his hand to George, and in a husky voice said, "'It's all right, my dear boy. Such matters scare one at first, you know.' But upon my word, I see no occasion to wonder over what you have told me. I have not now to learn how much we are alike. Spare me all criticism, Horace. The judgment day may be anticipated sometimes. Charlotte was my ideal of all that was noble and beautiful. Why should I not pay her this tribute to you now? Dinner was announced. Dinner that comes as inexorably as death. Dinner that must be prepared, must be eaten. Dinner, like the king, never dies. Both felt the relief of the announcement. The dinner passed off with a few commonplace remarks, and soon after George withdrew to his own solitary apartments in an adjoining street. When alone, he questioned his course, and condemned himself for sentimentality. Of what use to reveal the inner life, and show the pure flame of the soul burning on a sacred altar, to one whose limitation suggested a dark lantern, the slides of which shut over its own feeble wick at any approach. Calmer than he had been for many nights, however, he fell asleep, and more than once dreamed of the touch of a vanished hand. The old ways were resumed in Audley Street. George paid his daily visit there, and he and Horace were seen abroad as formerly. People mentioned them as the inseparable mourners, again referring to Charlotte's blighted life, which had been rounded so completely by such a husband and such a friend. It was now in the full tide of falling leaves, more than a month since the confirmation of the Andromeda's loss. Horace and George, inhabiting the little smoking den upstairs, the rest of the house being closed, for they could not endure yet to be where Charlotte's belongings were, felt an additional melancholy when rain fell, or high winds roared round the walls. The picture of a ghastly sea rose before them, rent and torn by the wind like clouds. Figures with despairing gestures tossed wildly to and fro, and agonized cries ascended from an unfathomable depth and distance of space, reaching them, lost, mingled, and spent by the wind, whose merciless errand it was to bring them. This made Horace and George close their teeth and inwardly strangle the strange noises which stifle their own hearts. "'Suppose we were to shut the house at once,' asked Horace. 
It grows too dismal. This howling weather drives my spirits down into my boots, and no tugging at the straps fetches them up again. What do you say to a Canadian trip? I want to see my agent in Toronto. As you please, answered George with a sigh. It is all one to me. It seems to me the most congenial place here. There is distraction in travel, though, and if you want to be distracted, go we will. I hardly feel it a duty to try and test my feelings, George. Will you remain if I go? Oh, confound it, no. We must ruth and know my it. Having begun so, I'll go. I believe I have lost all spring. My days are like zinc, my nights like lead. And so they grimly talked and laughed. The trip was decided on two days from that time. There was a little more bustle than usual in Audley Street at the appointed hour of departure. Horace and George were to leave by an evening train. Dinner was ordered an hour earlier. Some stir of packing the trunk of Horace by the housekeeper made things wear a familiar aspect. When Horace turned his latchkey and entered the hall, seeing open doors, lighted rooms, and a general movement of life, the old familiar sense of home smote his sick heart. He looked up in the empty air, and his soul cried, My lost life and love and home! O oh, treasures mocking my memory! Would that I could die this moment! He was mechanically wiping his hot face when George came in, with an assumption of cheerfulness, speaking loudly and stepping about as if he liked it. Old boy, said Horace, putting away his handkerchief, Maggie is getting up a first-rate dinner for us. She says we must start on strengthening diet. I declare she is a trump. I feel bound to the servants. They all are trumps. Showed so much feeling by George. Good, interposed George. I am awfully hungry. Of course you are, muttered Horace. And you have been eating as much as Charles Goldfinch this past month. We have a fair night to leave in, said George, as they commenced their soup. Yes, we have had a calm day. Our Indian summer sets in now. Both dropped in a reverie, remembering the past. What have you here, Pat? asked Horace. Beef, of course, sir. Horace took his carver as Pat raised the cover. A rumbling noise was heard in the street, which they listened to. Wheels were thundering up the street, and horses were galloping. Too soon for us, said George, taking his watch out. But it stops here, answered Horace. Pshaw, cried George, his face flushing deeply. A carriage was at the door, and the bell was pulled. Its wire was then a true electric wire. It gave the knowledge of a coming event like lightning. A curious cry and stir came up the stairs, and Horace and George sprang from their chairs and flew down. They saw Hannah, the maid, supporting Charlotte Hamden, Charlotte alive, but speechless from emotion, pale, altered, but still herself. Behind her stood a young man, with a big railway rug in one hand, and several packages in the other. "'Bless me,' he said, with an affected accent, but half crying too. "'Our heroine gives out at the last moment.' Horace took his wife in his arms. Not a word was spoken." George slid down the stair in a dead faint. Pat's picking him up made a diversion, and Horace carried Charlotte to the dining room, followed by all except George, who was rallying from his faint by himself with a host of sensations which he believed no man had ever felt before. "'What does this wonderful providence mean?' asked Horace, kneeling by Charlotte, whom he had placed on the sofa. "'I am afraid to look away from you, lest I should find myself a madman.' It means, replied Charlotte's companion leisurely, ridding himself of his traps, that we kept the boat tolerably dry, and that your wife has more nerve than any other woman upon earth. But what extraordinary introductions do I have to America? The denizens of the coast where we were stranded have a very limited view of the earth, but a very comprehensive one of the sea, and their rights therefrom. Consequently, we found it impossible to convey tidings sooner of ourselves. "'Dear Horace,' said Charlotte, "'Mr. Egremont Moyston may joke as he will. "'He has saved my life.' "'Horace fell to shaking his hand violently, 
and stared at him with eyes full of feeling which he could not express. Nonsense, continued Mr. Moyston. We undoubtedly aided each other. Mr. Hamden, we had a touch of brain fever which delayed us. We were thrown only six miles above the Bateau Lighthouse, but we might as well have landed in Patagonia. The white trash who kept us had no sense of what country they were in. Pomenko Courthouse was the idea of their outside world. No conveyances, no comfort of any sort could we obtain. We were compelled to remain there till I was able to prowl about and get down to the Bateau Light to learn our whereabouts. From point to point the wonderful narrative went on. Dinner was renewed. The servants, stricken with astonishment and admiration, lost their sense of decorum, and even the cook came up and occupied the edge of a chair, without remembering, as was her duty, that her plane was so much lower than the company that no number of kitchen stairs could measure it. George had recovered himself and returned. "'And so you missed your poor Charlotte, dear George?' she asked. "'Very much,' he replied. "'Do I look badly?' as if you had suffered. Yet, dear Mrs. Hamden, said Mr. Moyston very seriously, if you and I should consult the glass, we could not find the traces of suffering that we may behold in the faces of your husband and brother. At the word brother, Horace felt a violent throb in all his frame. Heavens! George was no brother. He was his wife's devoted, lifelong lover. In spite of the situation and the circumstances, the blood flew like birds through every vein. It appeared an inexorable necessity that he should go away by himself, and reflect upon his own feelings, and speculate upon those of George, and guess at the management of the clouded future. Why, exclaimed Charlotte, George's hair has grown white. So it had. Horace's was not changed a whit, and this he acknowledged to himself when he saw her eyes scanning his ebon locks. He wished they were a dead white. No, oh, indeed, laughed George. Being a little worried at your absence, I left off my hair restorer. Now that you have returned. For the life of him, he could not utter another word. His lips trembled so. Charlotte rose, went to him, and kissed him, and said softly, I thank God more than ever for having restored me to those who so tenderly love me. Now, Horace, I must shut my eyes and sense for the night. Pat, take the best care of Mr. Moyston. This house is his home. By Jove, Mr. Hamden, said Mr. Moyston, as Horace withdrew with Charlotte, is there anything in antiquity to beat our case? I have gone through the Greek tragedies and fed on our stalwart British classics, but I do not find its match. By the way, said George absently, I am not the brother of Mrs. Hamden's husband, but his cousin. We are very much together, however. Oh, answered Mr. Boyston, America is the most extraordinary place. Home isn't a flea bite. Pray accept my gratitude, Mr. Moyston. I divine by Mrs. Hamden's manner what the nature of your service has been. He looked at him with so profound a thankfulness that Mr. Moyston was affected by this praise, and for the first time indicated emotion. "'It is just what she would have done for my sister,' he replied hastily, and then they shook hands. Horace re-entered. Charlotte had retired, he said. He had tried to keep up his composure before her, for he saw how shattered her nerves were, but he could have no rest till he heard the full account of the disaster and rescue. It was grey dawn before the men separated. The occasion had made them firm friends. Horace was ready to give half his money to Mr. Moyston, and George half his affection. The journey was given up, of course. As George looked round for his valise, Mr. Moyston expressed some surprise. "'Do you go from here at this hour?' A mighty longing came over George to remain under the roof with her who had been so miraculously restored. He looked at Horace, and Horace made no response. Human feeling came over him again. He could not be magnanimous, and George turned away with a sigh. Mr. Moyston perceived there was some hidden fact or feeling between them. "'My apartment is very near,' said George carelessly. "'And by the way, Mr. Moyston, I hope you will share it a part of the time. Bachelors prefer their solitary quarters, you know.' 
"'I hate to bachelordom from this out,' replied Mr. Moyston. "'I have lately seen all the virtues under the sun in Mrs. Hamden. "'Can I find another in this country?' "'Is he in love with her, too?' thought poor Horace. "'I suppose so. Confound him. He is a hero. "'And George's hair must needs turn white. "'I am off. Horace bolt the door to keep Charlotte in.' What will Herbert say to these tidings of his mother? Herbert, his son. Horace had not thought of him yet. George was in advance even there. Boys are boys, he replied quickly. I'll warrant you he has played cricket today. As he ought to, laughed Mr. Moyston, making a move towards the door, feeling an internal uneasiness. Oh, this has given me a shock, said Horace vaguely. I am not equal to it. "'George, I tell you, I am not equal to it, and I can't bear it. "'You always were the strongest, and now your hair is got white. "'By George, do you know she showed me her arm with a great scar on it "'where she was knocked down on deck? "'I don't believe she is here at all. "'The scar is here. Nothing else, you know, George.' "'He staggered and grew frightfully pale. "'He shook his head from side to side and groaned pitifully.' The shock added to his great sorrow has been too much for him, said Mr. Moyston. Fetch some brandy. We must rub him. He is about to have a stroke. Just my luck in America, he said to himself. George, stricken to the heart, but collected, made use of all available means. But Horace sunk momently, babbling at intervals about Charlotte, whom George would not at present disturb, and finally became wholly insensible. Whatever fate changes or returns, God still disposes. Charlotte, bearing the greatest exposure, suffering and vicissitude, survived, and Horace, in the ease and comfort of his orderly life, was struck with paralysis. His head and heart were not strong enough for the burdens placed upon them. He lingered two years, a helpless but gentle childish man, sedulously tended by George, whose secret was carefully protected from Charlotte. Mr. Moyston alone discovered it. "'I forswear England for the present,' he said one day. "'I find more character in America. "'George, noble as you are, you need me for a while, "'and as I was the means of bringing Charlotte safely out of a crisis, "'I shall stay till I see you landed in the haven which shall be your right and rest. "'Not a word. "'I love Charlotte as I love no other woman,' and I honour and respect you. Hurrah for the colonies of King George! Just you propose going to England to leave her now for the fun. I have never proposed anything, answered George, and I shall never propose. It will not be necessary, my dear boy. End of section 16《Out of the Closet》A Collection of Early LGBTQ Plus Fiction This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Halper, Summit, New Jersey.《Out of the Closet》A Collection of Early LGBTQ Plus Fiction Section 17. There and Here by Alice Brown Perhaps Ruth Hollis was no more conscious at one time than another of her loneliness and heart-hunger for Rosamond Ware, the friend of her childhood and, indeed, her entire life. It was an ever-present pain, not poignant now, but grown into that emptiness of loss which attends a broken kinship. Ruth had lived for her thirty-one years in the standstill colonial flavor town of Devonport. Rosamond, on the death of her father, mother, and two brothers in the space of a week, had gone to Italy to be with an older brother, a man with a jangled body and a tempered artist's soul. That had not been altogether desirable, for the very fineness of his nature imposed its limitations, and he exacted much, even while he gave— she had been there eight years, from month to month prophesying her return, 
but never being quite able to effect it. Her unwilling feet would not drag themselves back to America. She longed for it. She brooded over shivered associations with a passionate regret. But when the moment came for clasping the lax link again, cowardice shot up in her and cried off. Her grief was poignant enough already. When she thought of voluntarily sharpening its edge, the apprehensive nerves rebelled. The house at Devonport had been given her by will, and now it was standing exactly as the family tragedy left it. The unworn garments in the closets could hardly fall more absolute prey to mice and moth. They were in ruins already. But daily the dust and mildew of time wrote a sadder record on the blurring page, and the inexorable master of all spurred himself to show what havoc he could compass, left to his own cruel will. Again and again Ruth wrote her friend, begging her to have the house opened, aired, and cleaned, not for the sake of thrift only, she urged, but because the place was dear to both of them. There they had played together at mimic living, and loved and dreamed after living began. It was her home, too, according to spiritual tenure, and she had a right to speak. But Rosamond always answered, not yet. Time had rent her web of life, and she was still too selfish to enlarge the rift made in the nature of things. One late twilight in an ice-bound spring, Ruth was wandering about the rooms of her own home, setting them in order by an observant touch here or there, and making ready to close the house for the night. The rest of the family had gone on sudden summons to spend a day or two with an uncle twenty miles away, whose prodigal son had come home, and who thus bade all his accessible kin to the rejoicing. Ruth, for no tangible reason, had been disinclined to go. As the day drew nearer, her unwillingness increased, and at the very last she refused entirely, promising to spend the night and the next day with Aunt Bernard, a mile's distance out of the town. The two maids, having been given sudden holiday, had already fastened their domain and departed. Ruth meant every minute to follow them, but the house so wooed her in its simmering afternoon warmth that she still lingered and dallied with her purpose. The fires were dying safely down, but there was a red glow in every room. The scented geraniums were sweet from the windows, and the stillness seemed benignant. At length, unable to conjure up more excuses for idling, she did get on her hat and cloak and stood fastening the last button before the front window, where the snow lay dead white, and the great chestnut tree stretched gaunt arms against the darkening blue. She stopped with an arrested motion in putting on her gloves. Someone was coming. It was a woman walking very fast, yet very lightly. With a buoyant motion Ruth seemed to know. She wore a flowing cloak and a great hat with a long feather. Ruth watched her with a tightening at her throat and a straining of the eyes. She came nearer, stopped, and waved her hand. It was growing dark so fast that a tangible veil seemed falling between them, but Ruth was sure she smiled. "'Rose!' she called wildly from the window. "'Rosamond! Rosamond!' The woman nodded. Ruth tore out of the front door, dropping her gloves behind her, and ran down the path. Now the newcomer was laughing, and Ruth felt a sudden passionate relief at the sweet familiarity of the sound. She began to see in that instant what her loneliness had been. She sobbed a little. "'I don't believe it,' she whispered. "'You are not really you.' "'That's your impudence,' said Rosamond, "'as if I'd take the trouble to be anybody else.' They were walking into the house together, side by side and hand in hand. Ruth never knew whether they had kissed or not. It was quite likely they had not, for Rosamond was an elusive creature, who held that there are few moments when the soul is the better for the body's sacrament. Inside, the dark had fallen thick. "'Let me get a lamp,' said Ruth, again with a little sob of joy completed. "'I want to see you.' "'No, Grandmother Wolf, not tonight. "'You're going over to the house with me.' Ruth turned back from the table and let her match burn out. "'Not tonight, dear,' she entreated. "'It's cold. It's awful. You would break your heart.' 
Ah, say yes, coaxed Rosamond in her old spoiled fashion. Just to step inside and see whether we want to stay. Just to peep in. Why, Ruth, it's home. But while she spoke, she was at the door, and Ruth was following her, saying, martyr-wise, You'll have your way, of course. It's to be expected. But I do wish you wouldn't. Wait till morning, Rose. Only till the fires are built. Rosamond laughed lightly and happily. Not an hour, not a minute. Come, shut that door and race me to the old stump. No letters in it now. The door banged behind them, and they ran together down the frozen drive. Rose was mad with glee. She sped like a stream of darkness, softly, glidingly. She was first at the stump, and she stayed there till Ruth came up, panting. Over the crust now, she laughed in a bright exhilaration. Come, come. But though she ran in little dashes and waited between, Ruth, making what shift she could to follow, crashed through and gave it up. Come back, she called. You're a fay. I'm a good twenty pounds heavier. That's according to precedent. Don't you see? It won't bear. But Rosamond skimmed back like a leaf, and then they went on soberly, side by side again. Ruth kept turning to look at her. "'You certainly are changed,' said she. "'But, oh, you're so pretty. "'You've got a radiance. "'You seem to shine. "'Are you my old chum?' "'Your old chum, your pal in vulgar moments, "'your rose to keep. "'Then don't you wither.' "'Rosamond laughed again, "'with that thrilling undercurrent "'more significant than mirth. "'I may be transplanted,' said she, "'but wither, no. "'See the little twigs pricking through the crust?' Hear the tips of the pine trees talking. Oh, what a world, what a world. How you enjoy, exactly like your old apostrophes, hot and hot. You're the most universal lover I know. You're the moon that looks on many brooks. Berries? However do you manage to see them in this light? But then, you always were owl-eyed and cat-footed. It was only a short stretch of road to the Ware homestead and then a long driveway wound up through the grounds. There the thick evergreens, untrimmed for many years, so encroached upon the way that they half-sheltered it from snow and made it still accessible. Rosamond kept darting into the fir woods to return laden with news. Do you remember how we used to gather cones and burn them on the anvil rock? The pines are full. And the hollow locust where we found the squirrel's nest? Nobody has touched it since that day, and his greatest great-grandson lives there now. Do you remember how we used to do up nuts in our hair and sit under the tree to let him pull them out? The hepaticas on the bank are in such a temper, you can't think. They're waked up and ready to sprout, and there's no encouragement. That's according to the light of the spirit. Even you can't see under the snow, sharp eyes. Ruth spoke from the dreamy acquiescence born of full content. She knew quite well that they ought not to be going by night into a deserted house, but Rosamond's assurance had lulled her will to sleep. She was penetrated by the wonder of seeing this dearest creature in the world, whom she had pictured broken and desolate. So lightsome and free of care, she had no thought beyond the happy relief. The last sweep of the driveway brought them out in front of the old house, spacious and still imposing, though so evidently the subject of a lingering death. Ruth paused an instant, not daring to look into her friend's face, and only guessing what grief must be painted there, but Rosamond dropped her arm and ran up the steps alone. "'Welcome home,' she called blithely. "'Welcome. Why do you wait?' Ruth had stopped now in a detaining afterthought. "'We're simpletons,' said she." The key is at the Dayton's, where you left it. That's a sign we're not to go in. Come back, dear, and wait till morning. But Rosamond held her place. Come up here, doubter, cried she. When was anything lost by trying? The oracle appears because you have previously besieged the shrine. Come on. There now. Shall I lift the latch? Shall I? It yielded with the old familiar click, and the great door swung open. Ruth gave a joyous little cry. You witch, you've got the key already. She put a hand on Rosamond's cloak in gentle suasion. Let me go in first, please. I can't bear to have you feel how cold it is. 
with no one to welcome you. Why, it's light. An airy intangibility of warmth and fragrance poured out upon them like a river delayed and eager. The odors were familiar and sweet, a mystic alembic made of the breath of flowers, but so fused that you could never say which was heliotrope and which the spice of pinks. They made up a sweetness bewildering to the sense. Oh, she cried again, enchantress, Merlin and Ariel in one. Rosamond shut the door behind them. The spirit of a delicate witchery was playing on her face while she led the way into the front room on one side of the hall. This had been the family meeting place and talking place in days gone by. It lay there smiling in happy renewal of the past. A fire flickered on the hearth with the burgeoning of new flame above old embers. The tall clock ticked in measureless content. The firelight seemed to fill the room. Ruth drew a long breath of rapturous recognition. "'How like you,' she murmured. "'You came days ago, weeks ago. "'You put it all in order, for me. "'But the intention isn't all. "'Somebody else might have thought of it, "'but nobody could have done it. "'So you like it? "'Then I'm glad.' Two chairs were ready before the blaze. They threw off their wraps and sank into the accustomed places. They sat for a time in silence while the clock ticked. "'Do you remember?' began Ruth. "'Yes, that was the last time we were here together. I was telling you over and over again that the lonesome house would kill me. I behaved like a child, an ignorant, untrained child. I won't hear you blamed. You were beside yourself. I was a child.' repeated Rosamond conclusively. I can't imagine anyone so ignorant, so pathetic in ignorance. I told you death denied the laws of life. I could only think of my mother in her coffin. I was a savage. Ruth turned and looked at her in the firelight. Her face lay soft and lovely under a very happy seriousness. She seemed absolutely serene, with the well-being of outdoor things, the pine trees and the snow. Rosamond, said her friend impulsively, have you got religion? Rosamond laughed out. You are so droll, she answered at once. I might as well ask, have you got air in your lungs? Have you? But you're so changed, and for the better, you've grown. I had to grow, said Rosamond whimsically, part of it at a jump. But let's not talk about finalities. There's one thing I meant to write you about. I made my will two months ago and left this house for a home for tired women. It's to be called the Margaret Home, for my own mother, you know. It's to be for middle-aged, tired women, their very own, so that they can come here from the cities and rest. I have named you executor, but I wanted to speak about it, too. There's nothing in particular to say, for you would always know how I should like things. Still, I thought it would be well to mention it. Ruth drew nearer in sudden fear, but the firelight, still playing over Rosamond's face, only brought out the wholesome tints of ruddy cheek and clear gray eye. "'You are not going to die,' she spoke with that poignant, foolish alarm ever hid in the heart of love. Rosamond smiled straight into her eyes, and her strength and beauty seemed to diffuse a certain power like beams of light. Her voice thrilled through the ear to the heart. I'm not going to die. I am safe, contented, happy. I've often thought, began Ruth hesitatingly, I have hoped you would marry. I never expected you to be serene, a lone stick like me. You have such an appetite for joy. How could you be contented with that one glory left out? Rosamond did not answer at once but the peace of her presence still made itself felt, and Ruth was sure she had not proved her too far. "'That is one of the things I meant to tell you tonight,' she began slowly, as if she had some difficulty in making her phrases fit. It was not left out. Three years ago I met someone in Italy. He died, and so if I... In any case, I should never have married. Her voice was still musical and unmoved, and Ruth looked at her in amazement. There seemed to be nothing to say. Rosamond went on, broodingly. 
You will be glad to know how perfect it was. We understood each other from the first. Whatever it may mean to say I am yours, you are mine, was true for us. It was when that feeling came that I began to understand life a little better. It was my alphabet. I never spoke about it to you because he died so soon after we found each other. And I didn't take it well. Then I was a child, too. For the first time, some remote sadness crept into her voice. A tinge of regret for a beauty missed. Ruth could not answer. She was beginning not to understand. Her friend seemed to speak from the state of one charged with a knowledge not to be shared. However, continued Rosamond, rousing herself and calling back her former lightness, it's absurd to wish we had been better and braver and sweeter. What's done is done, and now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. Ruth dared probe her no further. She felt invisible barriers. Is this another of your witch ways? she asked, with a groping return to the tangible. "'Flowers everywhere? "'I've been spearing through the dark and naming them. "'That's goldenrod in the big jar at my feet. "'Asters, too. "'Those are columbines on the mantel. "'And you've put mignonette and heliotrope on the table, "'just where they used to stand. "'Do you carry the magic lamp? "'In my day, florists never brought the seasons "'quite together like righteousness and peace.' "'Rosamond put on a merry disdain. "'Magic lamp,' quoth she, a kitchen cupboard full. You might as well learn now that lamps seem magical only when they're out of place. Come, old lady, isn't it your bedtime? Do you still go when it's dark under the table? Yes, but not tonight. Still, I suppose we ought to be getting home. I hate to leave this fire. At least, let's take some of the flowers with us. With us, forsooth. We're going to stay here. No, child, not in mildewed beds. I draw my line at that. Rosamond took both her hands and drew her up from the chair. Come and see, she said. The ocular proof. I scorn to argue. She led the way out into the hall and up the broad worn stairs. Ruth followed like a child. I'm a coward and you know it, said she. But tonight I'm not afraid. I wouldn't have believed I could be induced to stay till this hour in a deserted house with only sweet you to protect me. But here I am, and here I means to stick, if you say so. The spacious hall above was peopled with playing lights and moving shadows. The clock on the landing ticked with ancient peace. The firelight came smiling and beckoning from the two opposite rooms at the head of the stairs. Ruth, speechless, stepped into one chamber and then the other. The fires blazed opulently. The beds were ready, turned down in the V-shape both girls had learned from their mothers. It seemed to belong to their childhood together. "'Are we going to stay here?' Ruth cried. "'Here together? Why, it's like Christmas. It's like heaven. "'Into bed with you. I'm going down, but I'll come back again presently and tuck you up. And, if you lie still like a good little lady, I'll tell you a story. Ruth began throwing off her clothes in haste. Rosamond, she called blithely after her, cover up the sitting room fire. We forgot the fender. So much of life is a barren gleaning after the true harvest. Little broken impressions, scintillae of feeling, stay floating about in the memory and happy is he who can fit them into some sort of a patchwork when days are bare again. Ruth was never so happy, so well content, she remembered afterwards, as when, with an absorbing delight in physical well-being and a charming sense of the new and absolutely desirable, she made ready for bed, stopping here and there as she moved about the room to greet some ancient treasure with a murmur of delight. There was the red cow with one horn, they had milked her daily in other times. There were the wax flowers they had tried to imitate, but alas, poor little handmaids, because they worked surreptitiously, with the curious secretiveness of childhood, they had no instruction and no material save the beeswax in their mother's work baskets, chewed into wads by their patient teeth. 
There, oh joy, was Miranda, the oldest doll of all, with her abbreviated skirt and long pantalettes, sitting woodenly in a corner, quite unmoved by this strange, bright resurrection. Ruth gave her a kiss in passing, a passionate kiss for the sake of former days. She took a handful of sweet peas from the bunch on the mantel and dropped them in Miranda's lap. Joy was cheap enough to share. Then she slipped into bed and waited. Rosamond came. She placed a chair by the bedside and, seating herself, drew Ruth's hand into hers. Once upon a time, she began, did you cover up the fire? It's all right. Once upon a time, there was a little child, and he was always crying because he didn't know the difference between here and there. He was always hating to be here and longing to be there. So one day, a strong one came and said to him, Come, you silly thing, you may go there if you want to. And he set him on a feather of one of his wings and took him there. And there was a place you couldn't imagine if I should describe it to you. The best I can do is to say it was all flowers and living odors and pine trees and clear sunlight and sweet winds. It's a place where everybody can be tucked up at night. What makes you have any night? asked Ruth from her doze. Have it all day. Leave out the stars? The night dews? The council of the leaves? No, we must have night there. But there, black is just as lovely as white. So it's all one. And the child was happy at once. But the strong one smiled and said to him, It is always so. They are all happy at once, and they might have been before if they have had eyes to see that here is there and there is here. And the child said, But Ruth was soft asleep and breathing peacefully, and Rosamond smiled with great tenderness. Ruth remembered afterwards that Rosamond bent over her once to kiss her on the eyelids, but only to check herself and to draw back among the shadows. The late moon was regnant in the chamber when she came broad awake. Rosamond was standing over her, one hand on hers. "'Oh, what made you wake me? What made you?' she cried, quite querulous in her loss. "'I was dreaming such a dream. I was in a place I never saw. I can't describe it. I'm forgetting it now. But they were telling me something, the one thing, you know, that explains everything.' She sat up in bed and tried to grasp at the fleeting memory. It's gone. She was near crying as she said it. I almost had the words, but they won't stay. Rosamond paid no attention. Hurry, she whispered. Get up and dress. We are going over to your house now. Come. Ruth sprang out of bed and mechanically laid hands on her clothing. She hesitated for a moment to study Rosamond's face. You're not frightened? she asked. What is it? I've let you sleep too long, that's all. Don't question, my dear one. Come. She did indeed look pale, but something so sweet and comforting still hung about her in the smiling room that Ruth was not afraid. It did not come to her till afterwards that somebody, an alien somebody or something, might be in the house. Rosamond gave a quick little movement of relief when the last hook was fastened. She had Ruth's hat and cloak on her arm, and she pressed them upon her in eager haste. Then she threw her own cloak about her and drew Ruth down the stairs. Ruth forgot to step cautiously lest they be heard. She remembered afterward how her boots clicked and the rustling of her dress. The fire still flickered in the sitting room, and the air of the house exhaled a summer sweetness. Rosamond threw open the front door to an icy breath, she parted her lips and caught at it in sobbing relief. Ah, she sighed, that's good. The door closed behind them, and they hurried away down the path. Rosamond swept on like a shadow, her cloak billowing behind her in the wind. A picture flashed before Ruth's vision of their coming, when they had hurried in play. Now their haste was tragic. Rosamond! she called with all the breath left in her. You've forgotten your hat. You'll get your death. Come, come, called Rosamond over her shoulder. Hurry, hurry. 
Then give me your hand. I can't keep up with you. Not now. Her voice came back like a dying sound on the wind. Hurry. They ran like fleeting clouds. Ruth was capable of more than she could have believed. But, fast as she sped, Rosamond was ever before her, a shapeless dusk in the moonlight. There, you mad thing, Ruth began as they reached her own door, but the urgency of haste clung to her, and she could not finish. She fitted the key to the lock and stood aside. Go in, breathed Rosamond faintly. Go in, dear one, dear one. Ruth stepped over the sill and the door closed behind her. She turned and tugged at it with a sudden sense of loss. It would not yield. She put forth all her strength. Rosamond, she called. Push! I can't move it! When the door opened, Ruth looked out on the sterile dusk of the early morning. The moon had gone down, and the earth seemed mourning her. And no one was there. She bent forward into the darkness. Rosamond, she said. Rosamond! There was no answer. A rustle came from the one oak tree in the yard. Then there was silence, for the wind had died. In the midst of her gathering alarm, a strange peace, a sense of the sweetness and naturalness of the world, fell upon her like a charm, and she smiled out into the darkness as if it had become a friendly face. Then, in serenity of soul, she thought it all out. Rosamond was ever a sprite. Now she was playing her a trick. She had gone into the shrubbery to hide. Call, and she would not answer. Leave her unnoticed, and a moment would bring her tapping at the window. She shut the door and went in. The rooms were still warm, though the hearth fires had died, and she took a fur cloak from the hall in passing, threw it about her, and sat down by the window to wait. And as she waited, the same lovely content of the evening stole over her again. She closed her eyes, and to a purring sense of spiritual warmth the dream began where it left off, and she learned the secret which explains everything. But she never could remember that dream. She started awake with the sense of someone in the room. The fire was blazing up over new kindling, the sun lay warm on her shoulder. Her mother stood there, and the maid was bringing in wood. Ruth rubbed her eyes and worked her way out of her wraps. "'What a sleep!' she yawned. "'Oh, I remember. But what made you come home?' Her mother was looking at her very sadly. She took Ruth's hand. "'I had to come,' said she. "'We've had bad news, and I didn't want you to hear it from anyone else. "'Ruth, you must be brave. Rosamond died yesterday. "'They wired her Aunt Amy from Italy.' Ruth regarded her with straining eyes. Then she began to laugh. "'My poor child,' said her mother, beginning to rub the hand she held. Ruth drew it away. "'You mustn't, Mummy, you mustn't,' said she. "'Don't be sorry for me. It isn't sad. It's lovely, only you don't know it. There's been a queer mistake. No, I won't tell you. Just come with me, and I'll give you a surprise. Here's your shawl. Put it on.' She threw it about her, found some gloves, and pressed them upon her. Life seemed very dramatic since last night's prologue. She drew her mother along in merry haste, but at the door Mrs. Hollis left her for a moment to step back into the kitchen and whisper a word to Nora. Watch the way we go and tell Mr. Hollis to follow us. Tell him I can't explain, but he must come. Then she went out where Ruth was waiting, tapping her foot impatiently, and scanning the path, the shrubbery, the road, lest she be caught herself by her own surprise. She ran an arm through her mother's and hurried her down the walk. When they passed the stump post office, she laughed again, but her mother's quick look of pain recalled her. Poor mother, she said in a demure coaxing. Wait a bit, and you'll laugh too. So Rosamond is dead. The tears came fast down her mother's cheeks. Yes, dead, she said. You don't realize it. Ruth tried hard to be serious. Not yet, she assented. Just now you're realizing for two. They were rounding the curve of the drive. But I don't see any smoke. The thriftless thing, she's let the fires go down. They mounted the steps together, and Ruth, in happy assurance, 
laid her hand upon the latch. It did not yield. Her mother stood looking wildly down the drive and praying for her husband to come. Ruth, her self-possession inexplicably overthrown, was beating at the door. Rosamond, she was calling. Oh, Rosamond, let me in. Don't be cruel. Let me in. Dear, come home, said her mother, crying bitterly. Come home. Ruth knelt and tried to look through the keyhole. She sprang to her feet. I'm going in, she said. I will go in. She ran round to the side piazza, on a level with the long windows, opened a blind, and broke a pane with her hand. The blood dripped down on the glass. She turned the fastening, threw up the window, and stepped in, and her mother followed. The room was dark, save for the light from that one window, for all the other blinds were closed. She ran up to the clock and looked it in the face. It was dead and still, the impassive hands pointing stolidly to a lying hour. She laid her hands upon it, as if to shake it into life. The dust lay thick over table and chairs. She threw herself upon her knees before the fireplace and thrust her hand into the ashes. They were cold. "'Mother!' she cried out piteously. Mother! Come home, dear, come home. Ruth rose to her feet, sick with wonder, yet reanimated by one last hope. Just a minute, she implored, and ran up the dusty stairs. The door of her own sleeping room was closed, but she flung it open and walked shudderingly into the darkness within. The bed was unmade, with only a mildewed cover over the mattress. A mouse fled silently across the floor, a swift brown shadow. Where was the china cow? Where was Miranda? With a throb of premonitory knowledge, she threw up the cover of the trunk near the bed. There lay the doll, on orderly rows of playthings packed away for doomsday. They looked as if they might have been there years. Her mother had followed her, and Ruth turned about, trying to smile. I begin to understand it now, she said. I'll go home. You mustn't think I'm crazy. I'm not. They descended the stairs together and crossed the deserted sitting room. At the window, Mrs. Hollis paused before stepping out. I can't understand it, she said musingly. The house isn't in the least musty. It's as sweet as a garden. Sweeter. Ruth stopped short arrested by the truth. The odors of the night were all about her, and as she stood there accepting them, great peace and the sense of security fell upon her like a mantle. She began to smile. And they might all be happy, she said to herself, if they could only remember that there is just the same as here. End of Section 17 Recording by Nancy Halper Summit, New Jersey. Section 18 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Rutger. August 21st, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Marjorie Daw. Marjorie Daw by Thomas Bailey Aldrich. Chapter 1. Dr. Dillon to Edward Delaney Esquire at the Pines near Rye, New Hampshire. August 8th, 1872. My dear sir, I am happy to assure you that your anxiety is without reason. Fleming will be confined to the sofa for three or four weeks and will have to be careful at first how he uses his leg. A fracture of this kind is always a tedious affair. Fortunately, the bone was very skillfully set by the surgeon who chanced to be in the drugstore where Fleming was brought after his fall, and I apprehend no permanent inconvenience from the accident. 
Fleming is doing perfectly well physically, but I must confess that the irritable and morbid state of mind into which he has fallen causes me a great deal of uneasiness. He is the last man in the world who ought to break his leg. You know how impetuous our friend is ordinarily. What a soul of restlessness and energy. Never content unless he's rushing at some object like a sportive bull at a red shawl, but amiable withal. He is no longer amiable. His temper has become something frightful. Miss Fanny Fleming came up from Newport, where the family are staying for the summer to nurse him, but he packed her off the next morning in tears. He has a complete set of Balzac's works, 27 volumes piled up near his sofa to throw at Watkins whenever that exemplary serving man appears with his meals. Yesterday, I very innocently brought Fleming a small basket of lemons. You know, it was a strip of lemon peel on the curbstone that caused our friend's mischance. Well, he no sooner set his eyes upon those lemons than he fell into such a rage as I cannot adequately describe. This is only one of the moods, and the least distressing. At other times, he sits with bowed head regarding his splintered limb, silent, sullen, despairing. When this fit is on him, and it sometimes lasts all day, nothing can distract his melancholy. He refuses to eat, does not even read the newspapers. Books, except as projectiles for Watkins, have no charms for him. His state is truly pitiable. Now, if he were a poor man with a family depending on his daily labor, this irritability and despondency would be natural enough. But in a young fellow of 24, with plenty of money and seemingly not a care in the world, the thing is monstrous. If he continues to give way to his vagaries in this manner, he will end up by bringing on an inflammation of the fibula. It was the fibula he broke. I am at my wit's end to know what to prescribe for him. I have anesthetics and lotions to make people sleep and soothe pain, but I've no medicine that will make a man have a little common sense. That is beyond my skill, but maybe it is not beyond yours. You are Fleming's intimate friend, his fitus akats. Write to him, write to him frequently, distract his mind, cheer him up, and prevent him from becoming a confirmed case of melancholia. Perhaps he has some important plans disarranged by his present confinement. If he has, you will know, and will know how to advise him judiciously. I trust your father finds the change beneficial. I am, my dear sir, with great respect, etc. Chapter 2. Edward Delaney to John Fleming, West 38th Street, New York. August 9th, 1872. My dear Jack, I had a line from Dylan this morning and was rejoiced to learn that your hurt is not as bad as reported. Like a certain personage, you are not so black and blue as you are painted. Dylan will put you on your pins again in two or three weeks, if you will only have the patience and follow his counsels. Did you get my note of last Wednesday? I was greatly troubled when I heard of the accident. I can imagine how tranquil and saintly you are with your leg in the trough. It is deuced awkward, to be sure, just as we had promised ourselves a glorious month together at the seaside, but we must make the best of it. It is unfortunate, too, that my father's health renders it impossible for me to leave him. I think he has much improved. The sea air is his native element, but he still needs my arm to lean upon in his walks and requires someone more careful than a servant to look after him. I cannot come to you, dear Jack, but I have hours of unemployed time on hand, and I will write you a whole post office full of letters, if that will divert you. Heaven knows I haven't anything to write about. It isn't as if we were living at one of those beach houses, then I could do you some character studies and fill your imagination with groups of sea goddesses, with their, or somebody else's, raven and blonde manes hanging down their shoulders. You should have Aphrodite in morning wrapper, in evening costume, and in her prettiest bathing suit. But we are far from all that here. We have rooms in a farmhouse on a crossroad two miles from the hotels and lead the quietest of lives. 
I wish I were a novelist. This old house with its sanded floors and high wainscots and its narrow windows looking out upon a cluster of pines that turn themselves into aeolian harps every time the wind blows would be the place in which to write a summer romance. It should be a story with the odors of the forest and the breath of the sea in it. It should be a novel like one of that Russian fellow's, what's his name? Turguinif, Turguinif. Turgenif, Turgenif, Turgenju. Nobody knows how to spell him. Yet I wonder if even Eliza or an Alexandra Pavlovna could stir the heart of a man who has constant twinges on his leg. I wonder if one of our own Yankee girls of the best type, haughty and spirituelle, would be of any comfort to you in your present deplorable condition. If I thought so, I would hasten down to the surf house and catch one for you. Or better still, I would find you one over the way. Picture yourself a large white house just across the road nearly opposite our cottage. It is not a house but a mansion built perhaps in the colonial period with rambling extensions, a gambrel roof, and a wide piazza on three sides a self-possessed high-bred piece of architecture with its nose in the air. It stands back from the road and has an obsequious retinue of fringed elms and oaks and weeping willows. Sometimes in the morning and oftener in the afternoon, when the sun has withdrawn from that part of the mansions, a young woman appears on the piazza with some mysterious Penelope web of embroidery in her hand or a book. There is a hammock over there, of pineapple fibers it looks from here. A hammock is very becoming when one is 18 and has golden hair and dark eyes and an emerald-colored illusion dress looped up after the fashion of a Dresden china shepherdess and is chaussé, like a bell of the time of Louis XIV. All this splendor goes into that hammock and sways there like a pond lily in the golden afternoon. The window of my bedroom looks down on that piazza, and so do I. But enough of the nonsense which ill becomes a sedate young attorney taking his vacation with an invalid father. Drop me a line, dear Jack, and tell me how you really are. State your case. Write me a long, quite letter. If you are violent or abusive, I'll take the law to you. Chapter 3. John Fleming to Edward Delaney August 11th, 1872. Your letter, dear Ned, was a godsend. Fancy what a fix I am in. I, who never had a day's sickness since I was born. My left leg weighs three tons. It is embalmed in spices and smothered in layers of fine linen like a mummy. I can't move. I haven't moved for 5,000 years. I am of the time of Pharaoh. I lie from morning till night on a lounge, staring into the hot street. Everybody is out of town enjoying himself. The brown stone front houses across the street resemble a row of particularly ugly coffins set up on end. A green mold is settling on the names of the deceased, carved on the silver door plates. Sardonic spiders have sewed up the keyholes. All is silence and dust and desolation. I interrupt this moment to take a shy at Watkins with the second volume of César Birotteau. Missed him. I think I could bring him down with a copy of Saint-Beuve or the Dictionnaire Universel if I had it. These small Balzac books somehow do not quite fit my hand, but I will fetch him yet. I have an idea that Watkins is tapping the old gentleman's Chateau Nequim. Duplicate key of the wine cellar. Hibernian soirees in the front basement. Young chiops upstairs snug in his surrendments. Watkins glides into my chamber with that colorless hypocritical face of his drawn out like a long accordion. But I know he grins all the way down the stairs and is glad I have broken my leg. Was not my evil star in the very zenith when I ran up to town to attend that dinner at Delmonico's? I didn't come up altogether for that. It was partly to buy Frank Livingstone's roan mare Margot, 
and now I shall not be able to sit in the saddle these two months. I'll send the mare down to you at the Pines. Is that the name of the place? Old Dylan fancies that I have something on my mind. He drives me wild with lemons. Lemons for a mind diseased? Nonsense. I'm only as restless as the devil under this confinement, a thing I'm not used to. Take a man who has never had so much as a headache or a toothache in his life, strap one of his legs in a section of water spout, keep him in a room in the city for weeks with the hot weather turned on, and then expect him to smile and purr and be happy? It is preposterous. I can't be cheerful or calm. Your letter is the first consoling thing I have had since my disaster ten days ago. It really cheered me up for half an hour. Send me a screed, Ned, as often as you can if you love me. Anything will do. Write me more about that little girl in the hammock. That was very pretty, all that about the Dresden China shepherdess and the pond lily. The imagery a little mixed, perhaps, but very pretty. I didn't suppose you had so much sentimental furniture in your upper story. It shows how one may be familiar for years with the reception room of his neighbor and never suspect what is directly under his mansard. I suppose your loft stuffed with dry legal parchments, mortgages, and affidavits. You take down a package of manuscript, and lo, there are lyrics and sonnets and canzonettas. You really have a graphic, descriptive touch, Edward Delaney, and I suspect you of anonymous love tales in the magazines. I shall be a bear until I hear from you again. Tell me about your pretty inconnu across the road. What is her name? Who is she? Who is her father? Where is her mother? Who is her lover? You cannot imagine how this will occupy me. The more trifling, the better. My imprisonment has weakened me intellectually to such a degree that I find your epistolary gifts quite considerable. I am passing into my second childhood. In a week or two, I shall take to India rubber rings and prongs of coral. A silver cup with an appropriate inscription would be a delicate attention on your part. In the meantime, write. Chapter 4. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 12th, 1872. The sick Pasha shall be amused. Bismillah. He wills it so. If the storyteller becomes prolix and tedious, the bowstring and the sack, and two Nubians to drop him into the pistaqua. But truly, Jack, I have a hard task. There is literally nothing here, except the little girl over the way. She is swinging in the hammock at this moment. It is to me compensation for many of the ills of life to see her now and then put out a small kid boot, which fits like a glove, and set herself going. Who is she, and what is her name? Her name is Daw, only daughter of Mr. Richard M. Daw, ex-colonel and banker. Mother dead. One brother at Harvard, elder brother killed at the Battle of Fair Oaks ten years ago. Old, rich family, the Daws. This is the homestead, where the father and daughter pass eight months of the twelve, the rest of the year in Baltimore and Washington. The New England winter too many for the old gentleman. The daughter is called Marjorie, Marjorie Daw. Sounds odd at first, doesn't it? But after you say it over to yourself a half a dozen times, you like it. There's a pleasing quaintness to it, something prim and violet-like. Must be a nice sort of girl to be called Marjorie Daw. I had mine host of the Pines in the witness box last night and drew the foregoing testimony from him. He has charge of Mr. Daw's vegetable garden and has known the family these 30 years. Of course, I shall make the acquaintance of my neighbors before many days. It will be next to impossible for me not to meet Mr. Daw or Miss Daw in some of my walks. The young lady has a favorite path to the sea beach. I shall intercept her some morning and touch my hat to her. Then the princess will bend her fair head to me with a courteous surprise, not unmixed with haughtiness. Will snub me, in fact. All this for thy sake, O Pasha, of the snapped axle tree. How oddly things fall out. Ten minutes ago I was called down to the parlor. 
You know the kind of parlors on the farmhouses on the coast, a sort of amphibious parlor with seashells on the mantelpiece and spruce branches in the chimney place, where I found my father and Mr. Dodd doing the antique polite thing to each other. He had come to pay his respects to his new neighbors. Mr. Daw is a tall, slim gentleman of about 55 with a florid face and snow-white mustache and side whiskers. Looks like Mr. Dombey, or as Mr. Dombey would have looked if he had served a few years in the British Army. Mr. Daw was a colonel in the late war, commanding the regiment in which his son was a lieutenant. Plucky old boy, backbone of New Hampshire granite. Before taking his leave, the colonel delivered himself of an invitation as if he were issuing a general order. Miss Daw has a few friends coming at 4 p.m. to play croquet on the lawn parade ground and have tea cold rations on the piazza. Will we honor them with our company or be sent to the guardhouse? My father declines on the plea of ill health. My father's son bows with as much suavity as he knows and accepts. In my next, I shall have something to tell you. I shall have seen the little beauty face to face. I have a presentiment, Jack, that this daw is a rara avis. Keep up your spirits, my boy, until I write you another letter, and send me along word how's your leg. Chapter 5. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 13, 1872. The party, my dear Jack, was as dreary as possible a lieutenant of the Navy, the rector of the Episcopal Church at Stillwater, and a society swell from the haunt. The lieutenant looked as if he had swallowed a couple of his buttons and found the bullion rather indigestible. The rector was a pensive youth of the Daffy Down Dilly sort, and the swell from the haunt was a very weak tidal wave indeed. The women were much better, as they always are. The two Miss Kingsburys of Philadelphia staying at the Seashell House. Two bright and engaging girls. But Marjorie Daw! The company broke up soon after tea, and I remained to smoke a cigar with the colonel on the piazza. It was like seeing a picture to see Miss Marjorie hovering around the old soldier and doing a hundred gracious little things for him. She brought the cigars and lighted the tapers with her own delicate fingers in the most enchanting fashion. As we sat there, she came and went in the summer twilight and seemed with her white dress and pale golden hair like some lovely phantom that had sprung into existence out of the smoke wreaths. If she had melted into the air like the statue of Galatea in the play, I should have been more sorry than surprised. It was easy to perceive that the old colonel worshipped her and she him. I think the relation between an elderly father and a daughter just blooming into womanhood the most beautiful possible. There is in it a subtle sentiment that cannot exist in the case of a mother and daughter or that of a son and mother. But this is getting into deep water. I sat with the Dawes until half past ten and saw the moon rise on the sea. The ocean that had stretched motionless and black against the horizon was changing by magic into a broken field of glittering ice interspersed with marvelous silvery fjords. In the far distance, the Isle of Shoals loomed up like a group of huge bergs drifting down on us. The polar regions in a June thaw. It was exceedingly fine. What did we talk about? We talked about the weather and you. The weather has been disagreeable for several days past, and so have you. I glided from one topic to the other very naturally. I told my friends of your accident, how it had frustrated all our summer plans, and what our plans were. I played quite the spirited solo on the fibula. Then I described you, or rather, I didn't. I spoke of your amiability, of your patience under this severe affliction, of your touching gratitude when Dylan brings you little presents of fruit, of your tenderness to your sister Fanny, whom you would not allow to stay in town to nurse you, and how you heroically sent her back to Newport, preferring to remain alone with Mary, the cook, and your man Watkins, to whom, by the way, you were devotedly attached. If you had been there, Jack, you wouldn't have known yourself. I should have excelled as a criminal lawyer, if I had not turned my attention to a different branch of jurisprudence. 
Miss Marjorie asked all manner of leading questions concerning you. It did not occur to me then, but it struck me forcibly afterwards that she evinced a singular interest in the conversation. When I got back to my room, I recalled how eagerly she leaned forward, with her full snowy throat in strong moonlight, listening to what I said. Positively, I think I made her like you. Miss Thaw is a girl whom you would like immensely. I can tell you that. A beauty without affectation. A high and tender nature. If one can read the soul in the face. And the old colonel is a noble character, too. I'm glad that the Dawes are such pleasant people. The Pines is an isolated spot, and my resources are few. I fear I should have found life here somewhat monotonous before long, with no other society than that of my excellent sire. It is true, I might have made a target of the defenseless invalid, but I haven't a taste for artillery, moi. Chapter 6. John Fleming to Edward Delaney. August 17th, 1872. For a man who hasn't a taste for artillery, it occurs to me, my friend, you are keeping up a pretty lively fire on my inner works. But go on. Cynicism is a small brass field piece that eventually bursts and kills the artillery men. You may abuse me as much as you like, and I shall not complain. For I don't know what I should do without your letters. They are curing me. I haven't hurled anything at Watkins since last Sunday, partly because I have grown more amiable under your teaching, and partly because Watkins captured my ammunition one night and carried it off to the library. He is rapidly losing the habit he had acquired of dodging whenever I rub my ear or make a slight motion with my right arm. He is still suggestive of the wine cellar, however. You may break, you may shatter Watkins if you will, but the scent of Roederer will hang round him still. Ned, that Miss Daw must be a charming person. I certainly like her. I like her already. When you spoke in your first letter of seeing a young girl swinging in a hammock under your chamber window, I was somehow strangely drawn to her. I cannot account for it in the least. What you have subsequently written of Miss Daw has strengthened the impression. You seem to be describing a woman I have known in some previous state of existence or dreamed of in this. Upon my word, if you were to send me her photograph, I believe I should recognize her at a glance. Her manner, that listening attitude, her traits of character, as you indicate them, the light hair and the dark eyes, they are all familiar things to me. Asked a lot of questions, did she? Curious about me? That is strange. You would laugh in your sleeve, you wretched old cynic, if you knew how I lie awake nights with my gas turned down to a star, thinking of the pines and the house across the road. How cool it must be down there. I long for the salt smell in the air. I picture the colonel smoking his cheroot on the piazza. I send you and Miss Daw off on afternoon rambles along the beach. Sometimes I let you stroll with her under the elms in the moonlight for you are great friends by this time, I take it, and see each other every day. I know your ways and your manners. Then I fall into a truculent mood and would like to destroy somebody. Have you noticed anything in the shape of a lover hanging around the Colonel, Lars, and Panats? Does that lieutenant of the horse marines or that young Stillwater parson visit the house much? Not that I am pining for news of them, but any gossip of the kind would be in order. I wonder, Ned, you don't fall in love with Miss Daw. I am right to do it myself. Speaking of the photographs, couldn't you manage to slip one of her carts to visit from her album? She must have an album, you know, and send it to me. I will return it before it could be missed. That's a good fellow. Did the mare arrive safe and sound? It will be a capital animal this autumn for Central Park. Oh, my leg? I forgot about my leg. It's better. Chapter 7. Edward Delaney to John Flemick. August 20th, 1872. You are correct in your surmises. I am on the most friendly terms with our neighbors. The colonel and my father smoke their afternoon cigar together in our sitting room or on the piazza opposite, and I pass an hour or two of the day or the evening with the daughter. 
I am more and more struck by the beauty, modesty, and intelligence of Miss Daw. You ask me why I do not fall in love with her. I will be frank, Jack. I have thought of that. She is young, rich, accomplished, uniting in herself more attractions, mental and personal, than I can recall in any girl of my acquaintance. But she lacks the something that would be necessary to inspire in me that kind of interest. Possessing this unknown quality, a woman neither beautiful nor wealthy nor very young could bring me to her feet. But not Miss Daw. If we were shipwrecked together on an uninhabited island, let me suggest a tropical island, for it costs no more to be picturesque, I would build her a bamboo hut. I would fetch her breadfruit and coconuts. I would fry yams for her. I would lure the ingenious turtle and make her nourishing soups, but I wouldn't make love to her, not under 18 months. I would like to have her for a sister, that I might shield her and counsel her and spend half my income on old thread lace and camel hair shawls. We are off the island now. If such were not my feeling, there would still be an obstacle to my loving Miss Daw. A greater misfortune could scarcely befall me than to love her. Fleming, I am about to make a revelation that will astonish you. I may be all wrong in my premises and consequently in my conclusions, but you shall judge. That night when I returned to my room after the croquet party at the Dawes and was thinking over the trivial events of the evening, I was suddenly impressed by the air of eager attention with which Miss Daw had followed my account of your accident. I think I mentioned this to you. Well, the next morning... As I went to mail my letter, I overtook Miss Daw on the road to Rye, where the post office is, and accompanied her thither and back, an hour's walk. The conversation again turned to you, and again I remarked that inexplicable look of interest which had lighted up her face the previous evening. Since then, I have seen Miss Daw perhaps ten times, perhaps oftener, and on each occasion I found that when I was not speaking of you or your sister or of some person or place associated with you, I was not holding her attention. She would be absent-minded. Her eyes would wander away from me to the sea or to some distant object in the landscape. Her fingers would play with the leaves of a book in a way that convinced me she was not listening. At these moments, if I abruptly changed the theme, I did it several times as an experiment and drop some remark about my friend Fleming, then the somber blue eyes would come back to me instantly. Now, is not this the oddest thing in the world? No, not the oddest. The effect which you tell me was produced on you by my casual mention of an unknown girl swinging in a hammock is certainly a strange. You can conjecture how the passage in your letter of Friday startled me. Is it possible, then, that two people who have never met and who are hundreds of miles apart can exert a magnetic influence on each other? I have read of such psychological phenomenon, but never credited them. I leave the solution of the problem to you. As for myself, all other things being favorable, it would be impossible for me to fall in love with a woman who listens to me only when I am talking of my friend. I am not aware that anyone is paying marked attention to my fair neighbor. The lieutenant of the Navy, he is stationed at Rivermouth, sometimes drops in of an evening and sometimes the rector from Stillwater. The lieutenant, the oftener. He was there last night. I should not be surprised if he had an eye to the heiress. But he is not formidable. This dog carries a neat little spear of irony and the honest lieutenant seems to have a particular facility for impaling himself on the point of it. He is not dangerous, I should say. Though I have known a woman to satirize a man for years, and marry him after all. Decidedly, the lowly rector is not dangerous. Yet again, who has not seen cloth of frieze, victorious in the lists where cloth of gold went down? As to the photograph, there is an exquisite ivory type of Marjorie in passe partout on the drawing room mantelpiece. It would be missed at once if taken. I would do anything reasonable for you, Jack, but I've no burning desire to be hauled up before the local justice of the peace on a charge of petty larceny. P.S. Enclosed is a spray of mignonette, which I advise you to treat tenderly.
Yes, we talked of you again last night, as usual. It's becoming a little dreary for me. Chapter 8 Edward Delaney to John Fleming August 22nd, 1872 Your letter in reply to my last has occupied my thoughts all morning. I do not know what to think. Do you mean to say that you are seriously half in love with a woman whom you have never seen? With a shadow, a chimera? For what else can Miss Daw be to you? I do not understand it at all. I understand neither you nor her. You are a couple of ethereal beings moving in finer air than I can breathe with my commonplace lungs. Such delicacy of sentiment is something that I admire without comprehending. I am bewildered. I am of the earth earthy, and I find myself in the incongruous position of having to do with mere souls, with natures so finely tempered that I run some risk of shattering them in my awkwardness. I am as Caliban among the spirits. Reflecting on your letter, I am not sure that it is wise in me to continue this correspondence. But no, Jack, I do wrong to doubt the good sense that forms the basis of your character. You are deeply interested in Miss Daw. You feel that she is a person whom you may perhaps greatly admire when you know her. At the same time, you bear in mind that the chances are ten to five that when you do come to know her, she will fall short of your ideal, and you will not care for her in the least. Look at it in this sensible light, and I will hold back nothing from you. Yesterday afternoon, my father and myself rode over to Rivermouth with the Dawes. A heavy rain in the morning had cooled the atmosphere and laid the dust. To Rivermouth, it is a drive of eight miles along a winding road lined all the way with wild barberry bushes. I never saw anything more brilliant than these bushes. The green of the foliage and the faint blush of the berries intensified by the rain. The colonel drove with my father in front. Miss Daw and I on the back seat. I resolved that for the first five miles your name should not pass my lips. I was amused by the artful attempts she made at the start to break through my reticence. Then a silence fell upon her, and she became suddenly gay. That keenness which I enjoyed so much when it was exercised on the lieutenant was not so satisfactory directed against myself. Miss Daw has a great sweetness of disposition, but she can be disagreeable. She is like the young lady in the rhyme, with the curl on her forehead. When she is good, she is very, very good, and when she is bad, she is horrid. I kept my resolution, however, but on the return home I relented and talked of your mare. Miss Daw is going to try a side saddle on Margot in the morning. The animal is a trifle too light for my weight. By the by, I nearly forgot to say that Miss Daw sat for a picture yesterday to a river mouth artist. If the negative turns out well, I am to have a copy, so our ends will be accomplished without crime. I wish, though, I could send you the ivory type in the drawing room. It is cleverly colored and would give you an idea of her hair and eyes, which, of course, the other will not. No, Jack, the spray of mignonette did not come from me. A man of 28 does not enclose flowers in his letters to another man. But don't attach too much significance to the circumstance. She gives sprays of mignonette to the rector, sprays to the lieutenant. She has even given a rose from her bosom to your slave. It is her jocund nature to scatter flowers like spring. If my letters sometimes read disjointedly, you must understand that I never finish one at a sitting, but write at intervals when the mood is on me. The mood is not on me now. Chapter 9 Edward Delaney to John Fleming August 23, 1872 I have just returned from the strangest interview with Marjorie. She has all but confessed to me her interest in you. But with what modesty and dignity? Her words elude my pen as I attempt to put them on paper, and indeed it was not so much what she said as her manner, and that I cannot reproduce. 
Perhaps it was of a piece with the strangeness of this whole business that she should tacitly acknowledge to a third party the love she feels for a man she has never beheld. But I have lost, through your aid, the faculty of being surprised. I accept things as people do in dreams. Now that I am again in my room, it all appears like an illusion. The black masses of reverentish shadow under the trees the fireflies whirling in the pyrrhic dances among the shrubbery, the sea over there, Marjorie sitting on the hammock. It is past midnight, and I am too sleepy to write more. Thursday morning. My father has suddenly taken it into his head to spend a few days at the shoals. In the meanwhile, you will not hear from me. I see Marjorie walking in the garden with the colonel. I wish I could speak to her alone, but she'll probably not have an opportunity before we leave. Chapter 10. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 28, 1872. You were passing into your second childhood, were you? Your intellect was so reduced that my epistolary gifts seemed quite considerable to you, did they? I rise superior to the sarcasm in favor of the eleventh instant when I notice that five days' silence on my part is sufficient to throw you into the depths of despondency. We returned only this morning from Appledore, that enchanted island, at four dollars a day. I find on my desk three letters from you. Evidently there is no lingering doubt in your mind as to the pleasure I derive from your correspondence. These letters are undated but in what I take to be the latest are two passages that require my consideration. You will pardon my candor, dear Fleming, but the conviction forces itself upon me that as your leg grows stronger, your head becomes weaker. You ask my advice on a certain point. I will give it. In my opinion, you could do nothing more unwise than to address a note to Miss Daw, thanking her for the flower. It would, I am sure, offend her delicacy beyond pardon. She knows you only through me. You are to her an abstraction, a figure in a dream, a dream from which the faintest shock would awaken her. Of course, if you enclose a note to me and insist on its delivery, I shall deliver it. But I advise you not to do so. You say you are able, with the aid of a cane, to walk about your chamber and that you propose to come to the pines the instant Dylan thinks you strong enough to stand the journey. Again, I advise you not to. Do you not see that every hour you remain away, Marjorie's glamour deepens and your influence over her increases? You will ruin everything by precipitancy. Wait until you are entirely recovered in any case. Do not come without giving me warning. I fear the effect of your abrupt advent here under the circumstances. Miss Daw was evidently glad to see us back again and gave me both hands in the frankest way. She stopped at the door a moment this afternoon in the carriage. She had been over to Rivermouth for her pictures. Unluckily, the photographer had spilt some acid on the plate, and she was obliged to give him another sitting. I have an intuition that something is troubling Marjorie. She had an abstracted air not usual with her. However, it may be only my fancy. I end this, leaving several things unsaid, to accompany my father on one of those long walks which are now his chief medicine and mine. Chapter 11. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 29, 1872. I write in great haste to tell you what has taken place here since my letter of last night. I am in the utmost perplexity. Only one thing is plain. You must not dream of coming to the Pines. Marjorie has told her father everything. I saw her for a few minutes an hour ago in the garden, and as near as I could gather from her confused statement, the facts are these. Lieutenant Bradley, that's the naval officer stationed at Rivermouth, has been paying court to Miss Daw for some time past, but not so much to her liking as to that of the colonel, who it seems is an old friend of the young gentleman's father. Yesterday, I knew she was in some trouble when she drove up to our gate. The colonel spoke to Marjorie of Bradley, urged his suit, I infer. Marjorie expressed her dislike for the lieutenant with characteristic frankness and finally confessed to her father 
Well, I really do not know what she confessed. It must have been the vaguest of confessions and must have sufficiently puzzled the colonel. At any rate, it exasperated him. I suppose I am implicated in the matter and that the colonel feels bitterly towards me. I do not see why. I have carried no messages between you and Miss Daw. I have behaved with the greatest discretion. I can find no flaw anywhere in my proceeding. I do not see that anybody has done anything except the colonel himself. It is probable, nevertheless, that the friendly relations between the two houses will be broken off. A plague o' both your houses, say you. I will keep you informed, as well as I can, of what occurs over the way. We shall remain here until the second week in September. Stay where you are, or, at all events, do not dream of joining me. Colonel Daw is sitting on the piazza looking rather wicked. I have not seen Marjorie since I parted with her in the garden. Chapter 12 Edward Delaney to Thomas Dillon, M.D., Madison Square, New York. August 30th, 1872. My dear doctor, if you have any influence over Fleming, I beg of you to exert it to prevent his coming to this place at present. There are circumstances which I will explain to you before long that make it of the first importance that he should not come into this neighborhood. His appearance here, I speak advisedly, would be disastrous to him. In urging him to remain in New York or to go to some inland resort, you will be doing him and me a real service. Of course, you will not mention my name in this connection. You know me well enough, my dear doctor, to be assured that, in begging your secret cooperation, I have reasons that will meet your entire approval when they are made plain to you. We shall return to town on the 15th of next month, and my first duty will be to present myself to your hospitable door and satisfy your curiosity, if I have excited it. My father, I am glad to state, has so greatly improved that he can no longer be regarded as an invalid. With great esteem, I am, etc., etc. Chapter 13. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 31st, 1872. Your letter announcing your mad determination to come here has just reached me. I beseech you to reflect a moment. The step would be fatal to your interests and hers. You would furnish just cause for irritation to R.W.D. And though he loves Marjorie devotedly, he is capable of going to any lengths if opposed. You would not like, I am convinced, to be the means of causing him to treat her with severity. That would be the result of your presence at the Pines at this juncture. I am annoyed to be obliged to point out these things to you. We are on very delicate ground, Jack. The situation is critical, and the slightest mistake in a move would cost us the game. If you consider it worth winning, be patient. Trust a little to my sagacity. Wait and see what happens. Moreover, I understand from Dylan that you are in no condition to take so long a journey. He thinks the air of the coast would be the worst thing possible for you, that you ought to go inland if anywhere. Be advised by me, be advised by Dylan. Chapter 14 Telegrams September 1st, 1872 1. To Edward Delaney Letter received Dylan be hanged I think I ought to be on the ground, J.F. 2. To John Fleming. Stay where you are. You would only complicate matters. Do not move until you hear from me, E.D. 3. To Edward Delaney. My being at the Pines could be kept a secret. I must see her, J.F. 4. To John Fleming. Do not think of it. It would be useless. R.W.D. has locked M. in her room. You would not be able to effect an interview. E.D. 5. To Edward Delaney. Locked her in her room? Good God, that settles the question. I shall leave by the 1215 Express. J.F. Chapter 15. The Arrival. 
On the second day of September 1872, as the Down Express, due at 3.40, left the station at Hampton, a young man, leaning on the shoulder of a servant, whom he addressed as Watkins, stepped from the platform into a hack and requested to be driven to the Pines. On arriving at the gate of a modest farmhouse a few miles from the station, the young man descended with difficulty from the carriage and, casting a hasty glance across the road, seemed much impressed by some peculiarity in the landscape. Again leaning on the shoulder of the person Watkins, he walked to the door of the farmhouse and inquired for Mr. Edward Delaney. He was informed by the aged man who answered his knock that Mr. Delaney had gone to Boston the day before, but that Mr. Jonas Delaney was within. This information did not appear satisfactory to the stranger, who inquired if Mr. Edward Delaney had left any message for Mr. John Fleming. There was a letter for Mr. Fleming if he were that person. After a brief absence, the aged man reappeared with a letter. Chapter 16. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. September 1, 1872. I am horror-stricken at what I have done. When I began this correspondence, I had no other purpose than to relieve the tedium of your sick chamber. Dylan told me to cheer you up. I tried to. I thought that you entered into the spirit of the thing. I had no idea until within a few days that you were taking matters au grand sérieux. What can I say? I am in sackcloth and ashes. I am a pariah, a dog of an outcast. I tried to make a little romance to interest you, something soothing and idyllic, and by Jove, I have done it only too well. My father doesn't know a word of this, so don't jar the old gentleman any more than you can help. I fly from the wrath to come when you arrive. For, oh, dear Jack, there isn't any piazza, there isn't any hammock, there isn't any Marjorie Daw. End of section 18. Section 19 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Two Friends by Mary E. Wilkins. I wish you'd just look down the road again, Miss Dunbar, and see if you see anything of Abby coming. I don't see a sign of her. It's a real trial for you to be so short-sighted, ain't it, Sarah? I guess it is. Why, you wouldn't believe it, but I can't see anybody out in the road to tell who tis. I can see something moving, and that's all, unless there's something peculiar about him that I can tell him by. I can always tell old Mr. Wickham. He's got a kind of a hitch when he walks, you know. And Miss Addison White always carries a parasol, and I can tell her. I can see something bobbing overhead, and I know who tis. Queer, ain't it, how she always carries that parasol? Why, I've seen her with it in the dead of winter when the sun was shining, and t'was freezing cold, no more need of a parasol. She is to carry it to keep off the sun and wind, cause her eyes are weak, I suppose. Why, I never knew that. Abby said she told her so. Abby giggled right in her face one day when she met her with it. She didn't. She did. Laughed right out. She said she couldn't help it nohow. You know Abby laughs terrible easy. There was Miss White sailing along with her parasol hoisted, she said, as fine as a fiddle. You know Miss White always walks kind of nipping anyhow, and she's pretty dressy. And it was an awful cold, cloudy day, Abby said. The sun didn't shine, and it didn't storm, and there wasn't no earthly use for a parasol anyway that she could see. So she kind of snickered. I suppose it struck her funny all of a sudden. Miss White took it just as quick, Abby said, and told her kind of short that her eyes were terrible weak, and she had to keep them shaded all the time she was outdoors. The doctor had given her orders to. Abby felt pretty streaked about it. You don't see her coming yet, do you? No, I don't. I thought I see somebody then, but it ain't her. It's the patch boy, I guess. Yes, tis him. What do you think of Abby, Sarah? Think of Abby? What do you mean, Miss Dunbar? Why, I mean, 
How do you think she is? Do you think her cough is as bad as twas? Sarah Arnold, who was a little light woman of fifty, thin-necked and round-backed, with blue protruding eyes in her tiny pale face, pursed up her mouth and went on with her work. She was sewing some red roses on to a black lace bonnet. I never thought her cough was very bad anyhow, as far as I was concerned, said she finally. Why, you didn't? I thought it sounded pretty bad. I've been feeling kind of worried about her. Tain't nothing in the world but a throat cough. Her mother before her used to cough just the same way. It sounds kind of hard, but tain't the kind of cough that kills folks. Why, I cough myself half the time. Sarah hacked a little as she spoke. Old Miss Vane died of consumption, didn't she? Consumption? Just about as much consumption as I've got. Miss Vane died of liver complaint. I guess I know. I was living right in the house. Well, of course you'd be likely to know. I was thinking that was what I'd heard, that's all. Some folks did call it consumption, but it wasn't. See anything of Abby? No, I don't. You ain't worried about her, are you? Worried? No, I ain't got no reason to be worried that I know of. She's old enough to take care of herself. Always, the supper table's been set in an hour, and I don't see where she is. She just went down to the store to get some coffee. It's kind of damp tonight. Tain't damp enough to hurt her, I guess, well as she is. Maybe not. It's a pretty bonnet you're making. Well, I think it's going to look pretty well. I didn't know as twould. I didn't have much to do with. I suppose it's Abby's. Of course it's Abby's. I guess you wouldn't see me coming out in no such bonnet as this. Why, you ain't any older than Abby, Sarah. I'm different looking, said Sarah, with a look which might have meant pride. The two women were sitting on a little piazza at the side of the story-and-a-half white house. Before the house was a small green yard with two cherry trees in it. Then came the road, then some flat green meadowlands where the frogs were singing. The grass on these meadows was a wet green, and there were some clumps of blue lilies which showed a long way off in it. Beyond the meadows was a southwest sky which looked low and red and clear, and had birds in it. It was seven o'clock of a summer evening. Mrs. Dunbar, tall and straight, with a dark, leathery face, whose features were gracefully cut, sat primly in a wooden chair, which was higher than Sarah's little rocker. "'I know Abby looks well in most everything,' said she. "'I never saw her try on anything that she didn't look well in. There's good-looking women, but there ain't many like Abby. Most folks are a little dependent on their bonnets, but she wasn't, never. Sky blue or grass greens was all one.' She'd look as if t'was just made for her. See anything of her coming? Mrs. Dunbar turned her head, and her dark profile stood out in the clear air. There's somebody coming, but I guess it ain't. Yes, tis, too. She's coming. I can see her, said Sarah joyfully in a minute. Abby Vane, where have you been? She called out. The approaching woman looked up and laughed. Did you think you'd lost me? Said she as she came up the piazza step. I went into Miss Parsons, and I stayed longer than I meant to. Agnes was there. She'd just got home, and she began to cough violently. You had not to give way to that tickling in your throat, Abby, said Sarah sharply. She'd better go into the house out of this damp air, said Mrs. Dunbar. Land, the air won't hurt her none. But maybe you'd better come in, Abby. I want to try on this bonnet. I wish you'd come too, Miss Dunbar. I want you to see if you think it's deep enough in the back. There, said Sarah, after the three women had entered, and she tied the bonnet onto Abby's head, picking the bows out daintily. Oh, it's real handsome on her, said Mrs. Dunbar. Red roses on a woman of my age, laughed Abby. Sarah's bound to rig me up like a young girl. Abby stood in the little sitting room before the glass. The blinds were wide open to let the evening light in. Abby was a large, well-formed woman. She held her bonneted head up, and drew her chin back with an air of arch pride. The red roses bloomed meetly enough above her candid, womanly forehead. "'If you can't wear red roses, I don't know who can,' said Sarah, looking up at her with pride and resentment. "'You could wear a white dress to meetin' and look as well as any of them. "'Look here, where'd you get the lace for this bonnet?' asked Abby suddenly. She had taken it off and was examining it closely. "'Oh, twas some I had.' See here, you tell the truth now, Sarah Arnold. Did you take this off your black silk dress? It don't make no odds where I took it from. You did. 
What made you do it? Tain't worth talking about. I always despised it on the dress. Why, Sarah Arnold, that's just the way she does, said Abby to Mrs. Dunbar. If I didn't watch her, she wouldn't leave herself a thing to put on. After Mrs. Dunbar had gone, Abby sat down in a large covered rocking chair and leaned her head back. Her eyes were parted a little and her teeth showed. She looked ghastly all at once. What ails you? said Sarah. Nothing. I'm a little tired, that's all. What are you holding on to your side for? Oh, nothing. It ached a little, that's all. Mine's been aching all the afternoon. I should think you better come out and have something to eat. The table's been setting an hour and a half. Abby rose meekly and followed Sarah into the kitchen with a sort of weak stateliness. She'd always had a queenly way of walking. If Abby Vane should fall a victim to consumption some day, no one could say that she had brought it upon herself by non-observance of hygienic rules. Long miles of country road had she traversed with her fine swinging step, her shoulders thrown well back, her head erect in her day. She had had the whole care of their vegetable garden. She had weeded and hoed and dug. She had chopped wood and raked hay and had picked apples and cherries. There had always been a settled and amicable division of labor between the two women. Abby did the rough work, the man's work of the establishment, and Sarah, with her little slim, nervous frame, the woman's work. All the dressmaking and millinery was Sarah's department, all the cooking, all the tidying and furbishing of the house. Abby rose first in the morning and made the fire, and she pumped the water and brought the tubs for the washing. Abby carried the purse, too. The two had literally one between them, one worn black leather wallet. When they went to the village store, if Sarah made the purchase, Abby drew forth the money to pay the bill. The house belonged to Abby. She had inherited it from her mother. Sarah had some shares in the village bank, which kept them in food and clothes. Nearly all the new clothes bought would be for Abby, though Sarah had to employ many a subterfuge to bring it about. She alone could have unraveled the subtlety of that diplomacy by which the new cashmere was made for Abby instead of herself, by which the new mantle was fitted to Abby's full, shapely shoulders instead of her own lean, stooping ones. If Abby had been a barbarous empress who exacted her cook's head as a penalty for failure, she could have found no more faithful and anxious artist than Sarah. All the homely New England recipes which Abby loved shone out to Sarah as if written in letters of gold. That nicety of adjustment through which the appetite should neither be cloyed by frequency nor tantalized by desire was a constant study with her. I found out just how many times a week Abby likes mince pie, she told Mrs. Dunbar triumphantly once. I've been studying it out. She likes mince pie just about twice to really relish it. She eats it other times, but she don't really hanker after it. I've been keeping count about six weeks now, and I can tell pretty well. Sarah had not eaten her own supper tonight, so she sat down with Abby at the little square table against the kitchen wall. Abby could not eat much, though she tried. Sarah watched her, scarcely taking a mouthful herself. She had a trick of swallowing convulsively every time Abby did, whether she was eating herself or not. Ain't gonna have any custard pie, said Sarah. Why not? I went to work and made it on purpose. Abby began to laugh. Well, I'll tell you what tis, Sarah, said she, nears as I can put it. I've got just about as much feeling about taking vittles as a pillow tick has about being stuffed with feathers. Ain't you been eating nothing this afternoon? Nothing but them few cherries before I went out. How is just enough to take your appetite off? I can never taste a thing between meals without feeling it. Well, I dare say that was it. Any of them cherries in the house now? Yes, there's some in the cupboard. Want some? I'll get them. Sarah jumped up and got a plate of beautiful red cherries and set them on the table. Let me see. These came off the Sarah tree, said Abby meditatively. There wasn't any on the Abby one this year. No, said Sarah shortly. Kind of queer, wasn't it? It always bore ever since I can remember. I don't see nothing very queer about it. It was frostbit that cold spell last spring. That's all that ails it. Why, the other one wasn't. This one's more exposed. The two round symmetrical cherry trees in the front yard had been called Abby and Sarah ever since the two women could remember. The fancy had originated somehow far back in their childhood and ever since it had been the Abbey tree and the Sarah tree. 
Both had borne plentifully until this season, when the abbey tree displayed only her fine green leaves in fruit time, and the Sarah tree alone was rosy with cherries. Sarah had picked some that evening, standing primly on a chair under the branches, a little basket on her arm, poking her pale, inquisitive face into the perennial beauties of her woody namesake. Abby had been used to picking cherries after a more vigorous fashion, with a ladder, but she had not offered to this season. "'I couldn't get many, couldn't reach nothing but the lowest branches,' said Sarah tonight, watching Abby eat the cherries. "'I guess you'd better take the ladder out there tomorrow. They're dead ripe, and the birds are getting them. I scared off a whole flock today.' "'Well, I will if I can,' said Abby. "'Will if you can? Why, there ain't no reason why you can't, is there?' No, not that I know of. The next morning, Abby painfully dragged the long ladder around the house to the tree and did her appointed task. Sarah came to the door to watch her once, and Abby was coughing distressingly up amongst the green boughs. Don't give up to that tickling in your throat, for pity's sake, Abby, she called out. Abby's laugh floated back in answer, like a brave song from the tree. Presently, Mrs. Dunbar came up the path. She lived alone herself and was a constant visitor. She stood under the tree, tall and lank and vigorous, in her straight-skirted brown cotton gown. "'For the land's sake, Abby, you don't mean to say you're picking cherries,' she called out. "'Are you crazy?' "'Hush!' whispered Abby between the leaves. "'I don't see why she's crazy,' spoke up Sarah. "'She always picks them. "'You don't catch me giving up picking cherries till I'm a hundred, said Abby loudly. "'I'm a regular cherry bird.' Sarah went into the house soon, and directly Abby crawled down the ladder. She was dripping with perspiration and trembling. "'Abby Vane, I'm all out of patience,' said Mrs. Dunbar. Abby sank down on the ground. "'It's this cherry bird's last season,' said she, with a pathetic twinkle in her eyes. "'There ain't no sense in your doing so. Well, I've picked enough for a while, I guess. Give me that other basket,' said Mrs. Dunbar harshly, and I'll go up and pick. You can pick some for yourself, coughed Abby. I don't like them, said Mrs. Dunbar, jerking herself up the ladder. Get up off the ground and go in. Abby obeyed without further words. She sat down in the sitting room rocker and leaned her head back. Sarah was stepping about in the kitchen and did not come in, and she was glad. In the course of a few months, this old-fashioned chair with its green cushion held Abby from morning till night. She did not go out any more. She had kept about as long as she could. Every summer Sunday, she had sat smartly beside Sarah in church with those brave red roses on her head. But when the cold weather came, her enemy's arrows were too sharp even for her strong mail of love and resolution. Sarah's behavior seemed inexplicable. Even now that Abby was undeniably helpless, she was constantly goading her to her old tasks. She refused to admit she was ill. She rebelled when the doctor was called. No more need of a doctor than nothing at all, she said. Affairs went on so till the middle of the winter. Abby grew weaker and weaker, but Sarah seemed to ignore it. One day she went over to Mrs. Dunbar's. One of the other neighbors was sitting with Abby. Sarah walked in suddenly. The outer door opened directly into Mrs. Dunbar's living room, and a whiff of icy air came in with her. How's Abby? asked Mrs. Dunbar. About the same. Sarah stood upright, staring. She had a blue plaid shawl over her head, and she clutched it together with her red, bony fingers. "'I've got something on my mind,' said she, "'and I've got to tell somebody. I'm going crazy.' "'What do you mean?' "'Abby's gonna die, and I've got something on my mind. I ain't treated her right.' "'Oh, Sarah Arnold, do for pity's sake sit down and keep calm.' "'I'm calm enough. Oh, what shall I do?' Mrs. Dunbar forced Sarah into a chair and took her shawl. You mustn't feel so, said she. You've been just devoted to Abby all your life, and everybody knows it. I know when folks die, we're very apt to feel as if we hadn't done right by them. But there ain't no sense in your feeling so. I know what I'm talking about. I've got something awful on my mind, and I've got to tell somebody. Sarah Arnold, what do you mean? I've got to tell. There was a puzzled look on the other woman's thin, strong face. Well, if you've got anything you want to tell, you can tell it, but I can't think of what you're driving at. Sarah fixed her eyes on the wall at the right of Mrs. Dunbar. It begins way back when we was girls. 
You know, I went to live with Abby and her mother after my folks died. Abby and me had always been together. You remember that John Marshall, that used to keep store where Simmons is about 30 years ago? When Abby was about 20, he begun waiting on her. He was a good-looking feller, and I guess he was smart, though I never took a fancy to him. He was crazy after Abby, but her mother didn't like him. She talked again him from the very first of it and wouldn't take no notice of him. She declared she shouldn't have him. Abby didn't say much. She'd laugh and tell her mother not to fret, but she'd treat him pretty well when he came. I suppose she liked him. I used to watch her and think she did. And he kept coming and coming. All the fellers were crazy about her anyhow. She was the handsomest girl that ever was seen about. She'd laugh and talk with all of them, but I suppose Marshall was the one. Well, finally Miss Vane made such a fuss that he stopped coming. T'was along about a year before she died. I never knew, but I suppose Abby told him. He went right off to Mexico. Abby didn't say a word, but I knew she felt bad. She didn't seem to care much about going into company and didn't act just like herself. Well, old Miss Vane died sudden, you know. She'd had the consumption for years, coughed ever since I could remember, but she went real quick at last, and Abby was away. She'd gone over to her Aunt Abby's in Colebrook to stay a couple days. Her aunt went well neither, and wanted to see her, and her mother seemed comfortable, so she thought she could go. We sent for her just as soon as Miss Vane was took worse, but she couldn't get home in time. So I was with Miss Vane when she died. She had her senses, and she left word for Abby. She said to tell her she'd give her consent to her marrying John Marshall. Sarah stopped. Mrs. Dunbar waited, staring. And I ain't told her from that day to this. What? I ain't never told what her mother said. Why, Sarah Arnold, why not? Oh, I couldn't have it, no how. I couldn't. I couldn't, Miss Dunbar. Seemed as if it would kill me to think of it. I couldn't have her liking anybody else and getting married. You don't know what I'd been through. All my own folks had died before I was 16 years old, and Miss Vane was gone, and she'd been just like a mother to me. I didn't have nobody in the world but Abby. I couldn't have it so. I couldn't. I couldn't. Sarah Arnold, you've been living with her all these years and been such friends and had this shut up in your mind? What are you made of? Oh, I've done everything I could for Abby. Everything. You couldn't make it up to her in such a way as that. She ain't seemed as if she fretted much. She ain't. We can't tell nothing by that. I know it. Oh, Miss Dunbar, have I got to tell her? Have I? Mrs. Dunbar, with her intent ascetic face, confronted Sarah like an embodied conscience. Tell her. Sarah Arnold, don't you let another sun go down over your head before you tell her. Oh, it don't seem as if I could. Don't you wait another minute. You go right home now and tell her if you ever want any more peace in this world. Sarah stood gazing at her a minute, trembling. Then she pulled her shawl up over her head and turned toward the door. Well, I'll see, said she. Don't you wait a minute, Mrs. Dunbar called after her again. Then she stood watching the lean, pitiful figure slink down the street. She wondered a good many times afterward if Sarah had told. She suspected that she had not. Sarah avoided her and never alluded to the matter again. She fell back on her old philosophy. Tain't nothing but Abby's going to get over, she told people. Tain't on her lungs. She'll get up as soon as it comes warmer weather. She treated Abby now with the greatest tenderness. She toiled for her day and night. Every delicacy which the sick woman had ever fancied stood waiting on the pantry shelves. Sarah went without shoes and flannels to purchase them, though the chance that they would be tasted was small. Every spare moment which she could get she sewed for Abby and folded and hung away new garments which would never be worn. If Abby ventured to remonstrate, Sarah was indignant and sewed the more. Sitting up through the long winter nights, she stitched and hemmed with fierce zeal. She ransacked her own wardrobe for material and hardly left herself a whole article to wear. Towards spring, when her little dividends came in, she bought stuff for a new dress for Abby, soft cashmere of a beautiful blue. She got patterns and cut and fitted and pleated with the best of her poor country skill. There, said she when it was completed, you've got a decent dress to put on, Abby, when you get out again. It's real handsome, Sarah, said Abby, smiling. Abby did not die till the last of May. 
She sat in her chair by the window and watched feebly the young grass springing up and the green film spreading over the tree boughs. Way over across in a neighbor's garden was a little peach tree. Abby could just see it. Just see that peach tree over there, she whispered to Sarah one evening. It was all rosy with bloom. It's the first tree I've seen blowed out this year. Suppose the abbey tree's going to blossom? I guess so, said Sarah. It's leaving out. Abby seemed to dwell on the blossoming of the abbey tree. She kept talking about it. One morning she saw some cherry trees in the next yard had blossomed, and she called Sarah eagerly. Sarah, have you looked to see if the abbey tree's blossomed? Of course it has. What's to hinder? Abby's face was radiant. Oh, Sarah, I want to see it. Well, you wait till afternoon, said Sarah, with a tremble in her voice. I'll draw you round to the front room door after dinner, and you can look through at it. People passing that morning stared to see Sarah Arnold doing some curious work in the front yard. Not one blossom was there on the abbey tree, but the Sarah tree was white. Its delicate garlanded boughs stirred softly and gave out a sweet smell. Bees murmured through them. Sarah had a ladder plunged into the roadward side of all this bloom and sweetness, and she was sawing and hacking at the white boughs. Then she would stagger across to the other tree with her arms full of them. They trailed on the green turf. They lay over her shoulders like white bayonets. All the air around her was full of flying petals. She looked like some homely spring angel. Then she bound these fair branches and twigs into the houseward side of the abbey tree. She worked hard and fast. That afternoon, one looking at the tree from the house would have been misled. That side of the abbey tree was brave with bloom. Sarah drew Abby in her chair a little way into the front room. There, said she. Oh, ain't it beautiful, cried Abby. The white branches waved before the window. Abby sat looking at it with a peaceful smile on her face. When she was back in her old place in the sitting room, she gave a bright look up at Sarah. It ain't any use to worry, she said. The abbey tree's bound to blossom. Sarah cried out suddenly. Oh, Abby, 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 what shall I do? What shall I do? She flung herself down by Abby's chair and put her face on her thin knees. Oh, Abby, Abby. Why, Sarah, you mustn't, said Abby. I ain't going to, said Sarah in a minute. She stood up and wiped her eyes. I, I know you're better, Abby, and... You'll be out pretty soon. All is, you've been sick pretty long, and it's kind of wore on me, and it's come over me all of a sudden. Sarah, said Abby solemnly, what's got to come has got to. You've got to look at things reasonable. There's two of us, and one would have to go before the other one. We've always known it. It ain't going to be as bad as you think. Miss Dunbar's coming here to live with you. I've got it all fixed up with her. She's real strong, and she can make up the fires and get the water in the tubs. You're 50 years old, and you're going to have some more years to live. But it's just going to be getting up one day after another and going to bed at night, and they'll be gone. It can be got through with. There's roads trot out through everything, and there's folks ahead with lanterns, as it were. You... Oh, Abby, Abby, stop, Sarah broke in. If you knew all there was to it... You don't know. You don't know. I ain't treated you right, Abby. I ain't. I've been keeping something from you. What have you been keeping, Sarah? Then Abby listened. Sarah told. There had always been an arch curve to Abby's handsome mouth, a look of sweet amusement at life. It showed forth plainly toward the close of Sarah's tale. Then it deepened suddenly. The poor, sick woman laughed out with a charming, gleeful ring. A look of joyful wonder flashed over Sarah's despairing face. She stood staring. Sarah, said Abby, I wouldn't have had John Marshall if he'd come on his knees after me all the way from Mexico. End of section 19. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 20 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elise D. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Martha's Lady by Sarah Orne Jewett. 1. 
One day, many years ago, the old Judge Pine House wore an unwanted look of gaiety and youthfulness. The high-fenced green garden was bright with June flowers. Under the elms in the large shady front yard you might see some chairs placed near together, as they often used to be when family were all at home and life was going on gaily with eager talk and pleasure-making. When the elder judge, the grandfather, used to quote that great author, Dr. Johnson, and say to his girls, Be brisk, be splendid, and be public. One of the chairs had a crimson silk shawl thrown carelessly over its straight back, and a passer-by, who looked in through the latticed gate between the tall gateposts with their white urns, might think that this piece of shining East Indian color was a huge red lily that had suddenly bloomed against the syringa bush. There were certain windows thrown wide open that were usually shut, and their curtains were blowing free in the light wind of a summer afternoon. It looked as if a large household had been returned to the old house to fill up the prim best rooms and find them full of cheer. It was evident to everyone in town that Miss Harriet Pine, to use the village phrase, had company. She was the last of her family, and was by no means old. But, being the last, and wanted to live with people much older than herself, she had formed all the habits of a serious elderly person. Ladies of her age, something past thirty, often wore discreet caps in those days, especially if they were married, but, being single, Miss Harriet clung to youth in this respect, making the one concession of keeping her waving chestnut hair as smooth and stiffly arranged as possible. She had been the dutiful companion of her father and mother in their latest years, all her elder brothers and sisters having married and gone, or died and gone, out of the old house. Now that she was left alone, it seemed quite the best thing, frankly, to accept the fact of age, and to turn more resolutely than ever to the companionship of duty and serious books. She was more serious and given to routine than her elders themselves, as sometimes happened when the daughters of New England gentlefolks were brought up wholly in the society of their elders. At thirty-five she had more reluctance than her mother to face an unforeseen occasion, certainly more than her grandmother, who had persevered some cheerful inheritance of gaiety and worldliness from colonial times. There was something about the look of the crimson silk shawl in the front yard to make one suspect that the sober customs of the best house in a quiet New England village were all being set at defiance. And once the mistress of the house came to stand in her own doorway, she wore the pleased but somewhat apprehensive look of a guest. In these days, New England life held the necessity of much dignity and discretion of behavior. There was the truest hospitality and good cheer in all occasional festivities, but it was sometimes at a self-conscious hospitality, followed by an inexorable return to the asceticism of both diet and of behavior. Miss Harriet Pine belonged to the very dullest days of New England, those which perhaps held the most priggishness for the learned professions, the most limited interpretation of the word evangelical, and the pettiest indifference to large things. The outbreak of a desire for larger religious freedom caused at first a most determined reaction towards formalism, especially in small and quiet villages like Ashford, intently busy with their own concerns. It was high time for a little leaven to begin its work, in this moment when the great impulses of the war for liberty had died away, and those of the coming war for patriotism and a new freedom had hardly yet begun. The dull interior of the changed life of the old house, whose former activities seemed to have fallen sound asleep, really typified these larger conditions, and a little leaven had made its easily recognized appearance in the shape of a light-hearted girl. She was Miss Harriet's young Boston cousin, Helena Vernon, who, half amused and half impatient at the unnecessary sober-mindedness of her hostess and of Ashford in general, had set herself to the difficult task of gaiety. Cousin Harriet looked on in a succession of ingenious and, on the whole, innocent attempts at pleasure, as she might have looked on the frolics of a kitten who easily substitutes a ball of yarn for the uncertainties of a bird or a wind-blown leaf, and who may, at any moment, ravel the fringe of a sacred curtain-tassel in preference to either. Helena, with her mischievous, appealing eyes, with her enchanting old songs and her guitar, seemed the more delightful and even reasonable because she was so kind to everybody and because she was a beauty. She had the gift of most charming manners. There was all the unconscious lovely ease and grace that had come with the good breeding of her city home, where many pleasant people came and went. 
She had no fear, one almost said no respect of the individual, and she did not need to think of herself. Cousin Harriet turned cold with apprehension when she saw the minister coming in at the front gate, and wondered in agony if Martha were properly attired to go to the door, and would by chance hear the knocker. It was Helena who, delighted to have anything happen, ran to the door to welcome the Reverend Mr. Crofton, as if he were a congenial friend of her own age she could behave with more or less propriety during the stately first visit and even contrived to lighten it with modest mirth and to extort the confession that the guest had a tenor voice even though sadly out of practice but when the minister departed a little flattered and hoping that he had not expressed himself too strongly for a pastor upon the poems of emerson and feeling the unusual stir of gallantry in his proper heart it was helena who caught the honoured hat of the late judge pine from its last resting-place in the hall and holding it securely in both hands mimicked the minister's self-conscious entrance she copied his pompous and anxious expression in the dim parlor in such delicious fashion that miss harriet who could not always extinguish a ready spark of the original sin of humor laughed aloud my dear she exclaimed severely at the next moment i am ashamed of your being so disrespectful and then laughed again and took the affecting old hat and carried it back to its place i would not have had any one else see you for the world she said sorrowfully as she returned feeling quite self-possessed again to the parlor doorway but helena still sat in the minister's chair with her small feet placed as his stiff boots had been and a copy of his solemn expression before they came to speaking of emerson and of the guitar i wish i had asked him if he would be so kind as to climb the cherry tree said helena unbending a little at the discovery that her cousin would consent to laugh no more there are all those ripe cherries on the top branches i can climb as high as he but i can't reach far enough for the last branch that will bear me the minister is so long and thin i don't know what mr crofton would have thought of you he is a very serious young man said cousin harriet still ashamed of her laughter martha will get the cherries for you or one of the men i should not like to have mr crofton think you were a frivolous young lady of your opportunities but helena had escaped through the hall and out the garden door at the mention of martha's name miss harriet pine sighed anxiously and then smiled in spite of her deep convictions as she shut the blinds and tried to make the house look solemn again the front door might be shut but the garden door at the other end of the broad hall was wide open upon the large sunshiny garden where the last of the red and white peonies and the golden lilies and the first of the tall blue larkspurs lent their colors in generous fashion the straight box borders were all in fresh and shining green of their new leaves and there was a fragrance of the old garden's inmost life and soul blowing from the honeysuckle blossoms on a long trellis it was now late in the afternoon and the sun was low behind great apple trees at the garden's end which threw their shadows over the short turf of the bleaching green the cherry trees stood at one side in the full sunshine and miss harriet who presently came to the garden steps to watch like a hen at the water's edge saw her cousin's pretty figure in its white dress of india muslin hurrying across the grass she was accompanied by the tall ungainly shape of martha the new maid who dull and indifferent to every one else showed a surprising willingness and allegiance to the young guest martha ought to be in the dining-room already slow as she is it wants but half an hour of tea-time said miss harriet as she turned and went into the shaded house it was martha's duty to wait at table and there had been many trying scenes and defeated efforts toward her education martha was certainly very clumsy and she seemed the clumsier because she had replaced her aunt a most skilful person who had but lately married a thriving farm and its prosperous owner it must be confessed that miss harriet was a most bewildering instructor and that her pupil's brain was easily confused and prone to blunders the coming of helena had been somewhat dreaded by reason of this incompetent service but the guest took no notice of frowns or futile gestures at the first tea-table except to establish friendly relations with martha on her own account by a reassuring smile they were about the same age and the next morning before cousin harriet came down helena showed by a word and a quick touch the right way to do something that had gone wrong and been impossible to understand the night before a moment later the anxious mistress came in without suspicion but martha's eyes were as affectionate as a dog's and there was a new look of hopefulness on her face 
This dreaded guest was a friend, after all, and not a foe, come from proud Boston to confound her ignorance and patient efforts. The two young creatures, mistress and maid, were hurrying across the bleaching green. "'I can't reach the ripest cherries,' explained Helena politely, "'and I think that Miss Pine ought to send some to the minister. He has just made us a call. Why, Martha, you haven't been crying again.' Yes, am said Martha sadly. Miss Pine always loves to send something to the minister, she acknowledged with interest as if she did not wish to be asked to explain these latest tears. We'll arrange some of the best cherries in a pretty dish. I'll show you how, and you shall carry them over to the parsonage after tea, said Helena cheerfully, and Martha accepted the embassy with pleasure. Life was beginning to hold moments of something like delight for the last few days. You'll spoil your pretty dress, Miss Helena. Martha gave shy warning, and Miss Helena stood back and held up her skirts with unusual care while the country girl, in her heavy blue checked gingham, began to climb the cherry tree like a boy. Down came the scarlet fruit like bright rain into the green grass. Break some nice twigs with the cherries and leaves together. Oh, you're like a duck, Martha. And Martha, flushed with delight and looking far more like a thin and solemn blue heron, came rustling down to earth again and gathered the spoils into her clean apron. That night at tea, during her handmaiden's temporary absence, Miss Harriet announced, as if by way of apology, that she thought Martha was beginning to understand something about her work. Her aunt was a treasure, and she never had to be told anything twice, but Martha has been as clumsy as a calf said the precise mistress of the house. I have been afraid sometimes that I never could teach her anything. I was quite ashamed to have you come just now and find me so unprepared to entertain a visitor. Oh, Martha will learn fast enough because she cares so much, said the visitor eagerly. I think she is a dear good girl. I do hope that she will never go away. I think she does things better every day, Cousin Harriet, added Helena pleadingly with all her kind young heart. The china closet door was open a little way, and Martha heard every word. From that moment she not only knew what love was like, but she knew love's dear ambitions. To have come from a stony hill farm and a bare, small wooden house was like a cave-dweller's coming to make a permanent home in an art museum. Such had seemed the elaborateness and elegance of Miss Pine's fashion of life, and Martha's simple brain was slow enough in its processes and recognitions. But, with this sympathetic ally and defender, this exquisite Miss Helena, who believed in her, all her difficulties appeared to vanish. Later that evening, no longer homesick or hopeless, Martha returned from her polite errand to the minister, and stood with a sort of triumph before the two ladies who were sitting in the front doorway as if they were waiting for visitors, Helena still in her white muslin and red ribbons, and Miss Harriet in thin black silk. Being happily self-forgetful in the greatness of the moment, Martha's manners were perfect, and she looked for once almost pretty and quiet as young as she was. The minister came to the door himself and returned his thanks. He said that the cherries were always his favorite fruit, and he was much obliged to both Miss Pine and Miss Vernon. He kept me waiting a few minutes while he got this book ready to send to you, Miss Helena. "'What are you saying, Martha? I have sent him nothing!' exclaimed Miss Pine, much astonished. What does she mean, Helena? Only a few cherries, explained Helena. I thought Mr. Crofton would like them after his afternoon of parish calls. Martha and I arranged them before tea, and I sent them with our compliments. Oh, I am very glad you did, said Miss Harriet, wondering, but much relieved. I was afraid— No, it was none of my mischief, answered Helena daringly. I did not think that Martha would be ready to go so soon. I should have shown you how pretty they looked among their green leaves. We put them in one of your best white dishes with the open-work edge. Martha shall show you tomorrow. Mama always likes to have them so. Helena's fingers were busy with the hard knot of a parcel. See this, Cousin Harriet, she announced proudly as Martha disappeared round the corner of the house, beaming with the pleasures of adventure and success. Look, the minister has sent me a book. Sermons on... what? Sermons... it's so dark that I can't quite see. It must be his sermons on the seriousness of life. They are the only ones he has printed, I believe, said Miss Harriet with much pleasure. 
They are considered very fine discourses. He pays you a great compliment, my dear. I feared that he noticed your girlish levity. I behaved beautifully while he stayed, insisted Helena. Ministers are only men. But she blushed with pleasure. It was certainly something to receive a book from its author, and such a tribute made her of more value than the whole reverend household. The minister was not only a man, but a bachelor, and Helena was at the age that best loves conquest. It was at any rate comfortable to be reinstated in Cousin Harriet's good graces. "'Do ask the kind gentleman to tea. He needs a little cheering up,' begged the siren in India muslin, as she laid the shiny black volume of sermons on the stone doorstep with an air of approval, but as if they had quite finished their mission. "'Perhaps I shall, if Martha improves as much as she has within the last day or two, Miss Harriet promised, hopefully. "'It is something that I always dread a little when I am all alone, but I think Mr. Cofton likes to come. He converses so elegantly.' Two. These were the days of long visits, before affectionate friends thought it quite worth while to take a hundred miles' journey merely to dine or to pass a night in one another's houses. Helena lingered through the pleasant weeks of early summer, and departed unwillingly at last to join her family at the White Hills, where they had gone, like other households of high social station, to pass the month of August out of town. The happy-hearted young guest left many lamenting friends behind her, and promised each she would come back again next year. She left the minister a rejected lover, as well as the preceptor of the academy, but with their pride unwounded, and it may have been with wider outlooks upon the world and a less narrow sympathy both for their own work in life and for their neighbor's work and hindrances. Even Miss Harriet Prine herself had lost some of the unnecessary provincialism and prejudice which had begun to harden a naturally good and open mind and affectionate heart. She was conscious of feeling younger and more free and not so lonely. Nobody had ever been so gay, so fascinating, or so kind as Helena, so full of social resource, so simple and undemanding in her friendliness. The light of her young life cast no shadow on either young or old companions. Her pretty clothes never seemed to make other girls look dull or out of fashion. When she went away up the street in Miss Harriet's carriage to take the slow train towards Boston and the gaieties of the new profile house, where her mother waited impatiently with a group of southern friends, it seemed as if there would never be any more picnics or parties in Ashford, and as if society had nothing left to do but to grow old and get ready for winter. Martha came into Miss Helena's bedroom that last morning, and it was easy to see that she had been crying. She looked just as she did in that first sad week of homesickness and despair. All for love's sake, she had been learning to do many things, and to do them exactly right. Her eyes had grown quick to see the smallest chance for personal service. Nobody could be more humble and devoted. She looked years older than Helena, and wore already a touching air of caretaking. "'You spoil me, you dear Martha,' said Helena from the bed. I don't know what they will say at home. I am so spoiled. Martha went on opening the blinds to let in the brightness of the summer morning, but she did not speak. You are getting on splendidly, aren't you? continued the little mistress. You have tried so hard that you make me ashamed of myself. At first you crammed all the flowers together, and now you make them look beautiful. Last night Cousin Harriet was so pleased when the table was so charming, and I told her that you did everything yourself, every bit. Won't you keep the flowers fresh and pretty in the house until I come back? It's so much pleasanter for Miss Pine, and you'll feed my little sparrows, won't you? They're growing so tame. Oh, yes, Miss Helena. And Martha looked almost angry for a moment. Then she burst into tears and covered her face with her apron. I couldn't understand a single thing when I first came. I have never been anywhere to see anything, and Miss Pine frightened me when she talked. It was you that made me think I could ever learn. I wanted to keep the place, Count of Mother and the little boys. We're dreadful hard-pushed. Hepsy has been good in the kitchen. She said she ought to have patience with me, for she was awkward herself when she first came. Helena laughed. She looked so pretty under the tasseled white curtains. I dare say Hepsy tells the truth, she said. I wish you had told me about your mother. When I come again, some day we'll drive up country, as you call it, to see her. Martha, I wish you would think of me sometimes after I go away. Won't you promise? And the bright young face suddenly grew grave. 
I have had hard times myself. I don't always learn things that I ought to learn. I don't always put things straight. I wish you wouldn't forget me ever, and would just believe in me. I think it does help more than anything. I won't forget, said Martha slowly. I shall think of you every day. She spoke almost with indifference, as if she had been asked to dust a room, but she turned aside quickly and pulled the little mat under the hot water jug just out of its former straightness. Then she hastened away down the long white entry, weeping as she went. 3. To lose out of sight the friend whom one has loved and lived to please is to lose joy out of life. But if love is true, there comes a presently higher joy of pleasing the ideal, that is to say, the perfect friend. The same old happiness is lifted to a higher level. As for Martha, the girl who stayed behind in Ashford, nobody's life could seem duller to those who could not understand. She was slow of step, and her eyes were almost always downcast, as if intent upon incessant toil. But they startled you when she looked up with their shining light. She was capable of the happiness of holding fast to a great sentiment, the ineffable satisfaction of trying to please one whom she truly loved. She never thought of trying to make other people pleased with herself. All she lived for was to do the best she could for others, and to conform to an ideal which grew at last to be like a saint's vision, a heavenly figure painted upon the sky. On Sunday afternoons in summer, Martha sat by the window of her chamber, a low-storied little room, which looked into the side-yard and the great branches of an elm-tree. She never sat in the old wooden rocking-chair except on Sundays like this. It belonged to the day of rest and to happy meditation. She wore her plain black dress and a clean white apron, and held in her lap a little wooden box with a brass ring on top for a handle. She was past sixty years of age and looked even older, but there was the same look on her face that it had sometimes worn in girlhood. She was the same Martha. Her hands were old-looking and work-worn, but her face still shone. It seemed like yesterday that Helena Vernon had gone away, and it was more than forty years. War and peace had brought their changes and great anxieties. The face of the earth was furrowed by floods and fire. The faces of mistresses and maid were furrowed by smiles and tears. And in the sky, the stars shone on as if nothing had happened. The village of Ashford added a few pages to its unexciting history. The minister preached. The people listened. Now and then a funeral crept along the street. And now and then the bright face of a little child rose above the horizon of a family pew. Miss Harriet Pine lived on in the large white house which gained more and more distinction because it suffered no changes save successive repaintings and a new railing about its stately roof. Miss Harriet herself had moved far beyond the uncertainties of an anxious youth. She had long ago made all her decisions and settled all necessary questions. Her scheme of life was as faultless as the miniature landscape of a Japanese garden and as easily kept in order. The only important change she would ever be capable of making was the final change to another and a better world, and for that nature itself would gently provide and her own innocent life. Hardly any great social event had ruffled the easy current of life since Helena Vernon's marriage. To this Miss Pine had gone, stately in appearance and carrying gifts of some old family silver which bore the Vernon crest, but not without some protest in her heart against the uncertainties of married life. Helena was so equal to a happy independence and even to the assistance of other lives grown strangely dependent upon her quick sympathies and instinctive decisions that it was hard to let her sink personality into the affairs of another. Yet a brilliant English match was not without its attractions to an old-fashioned gentlewoman like Miss Pine, and Helena herself was amazingly happy. One day there had come a letter to Ashford in which her very heart seemed to beat with love and self-forgetfulness to tell Cousin Harriet of such new happiness and high hope. "'Tell Martha all that I say about my dear Jack,' wrote the eager girl. "'Please show my letter to Martha and tell her I shall come home next summer and bring the handsomest and best man in the world to Ashford. I have told him all about the dear house and the dear garden. There was never such a lad to reach for cherries with his six foot two. Miss Pine, wandering a little, gave the letter to Martha, who took it deliberately, and as if she wondered too, and went away to read it slowly by herself. Martha cried over it, and felt a strange sense of loss and pain. It hurt her heart a little to read about the cherry-picking. Her idol seemed to be less her own, since she had become the idol of a stranger. 
She had never taken such a letter in her hands before, but love at last prevailed since Miss Helena was happy, and she kissed the last page where her name was written, feeling overbold, and laid the envelope on Miss Pine's secretary without a word. The most generous love cannot but long for reassurance, and Martha had the joy of being remembered. She was not forgotten when the day of the wedding drew near, but she never knew that Miss Helena had asked if Cousin Harriet would not bring Martha to town. She should like to have Martha there to see her married. She would help about the flowers, wrote the happy girl. I know she will like to come, and I'll ask Mama to plan to have someone to take her all about Boston to make her have a pleasant time after the hurry of the great day is over. Cousin Harriet thought it very kind and exactly like Helena, but Martha would be out of her element. It was most imprudent and girlish to have thought of such a thing. Helena's mother would be far from wishing for any unnecessary guest just then, in the busiest part of her household, and it was best not to speak of the invitation. Some day Martha should go to Boston if she did well, but not now. Helena did not forget to ask if Martha had come, but was astonished by the indifference of the answer. It was the first thing which reminded her that she was not a fairy princess having everything in her own way in that last day before the wedding. She knew Martha would have loved to be near, for she could not help understanding in that moment of her own happiness the love that was hidden in another heart. Next day this happy young princess, the bride, cut a piece of great cake and put it into a pretty box that held one of her wedding presents. With eager voices calling her, and all her friends about her, and her mother's face growing more and more wistful at the thought of parting, she still lingered and ran to take one or two trifles from the dressing table, a little mirror and some tiny scissors that Martha would remember, and one of the pretty handkerchiefs marked with her maiden name. These she put in the box, too. It was half a girlish freak and fancy, but she could not help trying to share her happiness, and Martha's life was so plain and dull. She whispered a message and put the little package into Cousin Harriet's hand for Martha as she said goodbye. She was very fond of Cousin Harriet. She smiled with a gleam of her old fun. Martha's puzzled look and tall, awkward figure seems to stand suddenly before her eyes as she promised to come again to Ashford. Impatient voices called to Helena. Her lover was at the door, and she hurried away, leaving her old home and her girlhood gladly. If she had only known it, as she kissed Cousin Harriet goodbye, they were never going to see each other again until they were old women. The first step that she took out of her father's house that day, married and full of hope and joy, was a step that led her away from the green elms of Boston Common and away from her own country and those she loved best to a brilliant, much varied foreign life and to nearly all the sorrows and nearly all the joys that the heart of one woman could hold or know. On Sunday afternoons, Martha used to sit by the window in Ashford and hold the wooden box which a favorite young brother, who afterward died at sea, had made for her, and she used to take out of it the pretty little box with a gilded cover that had held the piece of wedding cake and the small scissors and the blurred bit of a mirror in its silver case. As for the handkerchief with the narrow lace edge, once in two or three years she sprinkled it as if it were a flower and spread it out in the sun on the old bleaching green and sat nearby in the shrubbery to watch lest some bold robin or cherry bird should seize it and fly away. 4. Miss Harriet Pine was often congratulated upon the good fortune of having such a helper and friend as Martha. As time went on, this tall, gaunt woman, always thin, always slow, gained a dignity of behavior and simple affectionateness of look which suited the charm and dignity of the ancient house. She was unconsciously beautiful like a saint, like the picturesqueness of a lonely tree which lives to shelter unnumbered lives and to stand quietly in its place. There was such rustic homeliness and constancy belonging to her, such beautiful powers of apprehension, such reticence, such gentleness for those who were troubled or sick, all these gifts and graces Martha hid in her heart. She never joined the church because she thought she was not good enough, but life was such a passion and happiness of service that it was impossible not to be devout, and she was always in her humble place on Sundays in the back pew next to the door. She had been educated by a remembrance. Helena's young eyes forever looked at her reassuringly from a gay, girlish face. Helena's sweet patience in teaching her own awkwardness could never be forgotten. "'I owe everything to Miss Helena,' said Martha, half aloud, as she sat alone by the window. 
She had said it to herself a thousand times. When she looked in the little keepsake mirror, she always hoped to see some faint reflection of Helena Vernon, but there was only her own brown New England face to look back at her wonderingly. Miss Pine went less and less often to pay visits to her friends in Boston. There were very few friends left to come to Ashford and make long visits in the summer, and life grew more and more monotonous. Now and then there came news from across the sea and messages of remembrance, letters that were closely written on thin sheets of paper, and that spoke of lords and ladies, of great journeys, of the death of little children and the proud successes of boys at school, of the wedding of Helena Dysart's only daughter. But even that happened years ago. These things seemed far away and vague, as if they belonged to a story and not to life itself. The true links with the past were quite different. There was the unvarying flock of the ground sparrows that Helena had begun to feed. Every morning Martha scattered crumbs for them from the side door steps while Miss Pine watched from the dining room window, and they were counted and cherished year by year. Miss Pine herself had many fixed habits, but little ideality or imagination, and so at last it was Martha who took thought for her mistress and gave freedom to her own good taste. After a while, without any one's observing the change, the everyday ways of doing things in the house came to be the stately ways that had once belonged only to the entertainment of guests. Happily, both mistress and maid seized all possible chances for hospitality, yet Miss Harriet nearly always sat alone at her exquisitely served table with its fresh flowers, and the beautiful old china which Martha handled so lovingly that there was no good excuse for keeping it hidden on closet shelves. Every year when the old cherry trees were in fruit, Martha carried the round white old English dish with a fretwork edge full of pointed green leaves and scarlet cherries to the minister, and his wife never quite understood why every year he blushed and looked so conscious of the pleasure, and thanked Martha as if he had received a very particular attention. There was no pretty suggestion toward the pursuit of the fine art of housekeeping in Martha's limited acquaintance with newspapers that she did not adopt. There was no refined old custom of the pine housekeeping that she consented to let go. And every day, as she had promised, she thought of Miss Helena, oh, many times in every day. Whether this thing would please her, or that would likely to fall with her fancy of ideas of fitness. As far as was possible, the rare news that reached Ashford through an occasional letter or the talk of guests was made part of Martha's own life, the history of her own heart. A worn old geography often stood at the map of Europe on the nightstand in her room, and a little old-fashioned gilt button set with a bit of glass like a ruby that had broken and fallen from the trimming of one of Helena's dresses was used to mark the city of her dwelling place. In the changes of a diplomatic life, Martha followed her lady all about the map. Sometimes the button was at Paris, and sometimes at Madrid. Once, to her great anxiety, it remained long at St. Petersburg. For such a slow scholar, Martha was not unlearned at last, since everything about life in these foreign towns was of interest to her faithful heart. She satisfied her own mind as she threw crumbs to this tame sparrows. It was all part of the same thing, and for the same affectionate reasons. 5. One Sunday afternoon, in early summer, Miss Harriet Pine came hurrying along the entry that led to Martha's room and called two or three times before its inhabitant could reach the door. Miss Harriet looked unusually cheerful and excited, and she held something in her hand. "'Where are you, Martha?' she called again. "'Come quick! I have something to tell you!' "'Here I am, Miss Pine,' said Martha, who had only stopped to put her precious box in the drawer and to shut the geography." "'Who do you think is coming this very night at half-past six? "'We must have everything as nice as we can. "'I must see Hannah at once. "'Do you remember my cousin Helena, who has lived abroad for so long? "'Miss Helena Vernon, the Honorable Mrs. Dysart, she is now?' "'Yes, I remember her,' answered Martha, turning a little pale. "'I knew that she was in this country, and I had written to ask her to come for a long visit,' continued Miss Harriet, who did not often explain things even to Martha, though she was always conscientious about the kind messages that were sent back by grateful guests. "'She telegraphs that she means to anticipate her visit by a few days and come to me at once. The heat is beginning in town, I suppose. I dare say, having been a foreigner for so long, she does not mind travelling on a Sunday.' Do you think Hannah will be prepared? We must have tea a little later. Yes, Miss Harriet, said Martha. She wondered that she could speak as usual. There was such a ringing in her ears. 
I shall have time to pick some fresh strawberries. Miss Helena is so fond of our strawberries. Why, I had forgotten, said Miss Pine, a little puzzled by something quite unusual in Martha's face. We must expect to find Mrs. Dysart a good deal changed, Martha. It is a great many years since she was here. I have not seen her since her wedding, and she has had a great deal of trouble, poor girl. You had better open the parlor chamber and make it ready before you go down. It is all ready, said Martha. I can carry some of those little sweet briar roses upstairs before she comes. Yes, you are always thoughtful, said Miss Pine, with unwanted feeling. Martha did not answer. She glanced at the telegram wistfully. She had never really suspected before that Miss Pine knew nothing of the love that had been in her heart all these years. It was half a pain and half a golden joy to keep such a secret. She could hardly bear this moment of surprise. Presently, the news gave wings for, to her willing feet. When Hannah, the cook, who never had known Miss Helena, went to the parlor an hour later on some errand to her old mistress, she discovered that this stranger guest must be a very important person. She had never seen the tea-table look exactly as it did that night, and in the parlor itself there were fresh blooming boughs in the old East India jars, and lilies in the paneled hall, and flowers everywhere as if there were some high festivity. Miss Pine sat by the window, watching, in her best dress, looking stately and calm. She seldom went out now, and it was almost time for the carriage. Martha was just coming in from the garden with the strawberries and with more flowers in her apron. It was a bright, cool evening in June. The golden robin sang in the elms, and the sun was going down behind the apple trees at the foot of the garden. The beautiful old house stood wide open to the long-expected guest. I think that I shall go down to the gate said Miss Pine, looking at Martha for approval, and Martha nodded, and they went together slowly down the broad front walk. There was a sound of horses and wheels on the roadside turf. Martha could not see at first. She stood back inside the gate behind the white lilac bushes as the carriage came. Miss Pine was there. She was holding out both arms and taking a tired, bent little figure in black to her heart. Oh, my, Miss Helena is an old woman like me and Martha gave a pitiful sob. She had never dreamed it would be like this. This was the one thing she could not bear. "'Where are you, Martha?' called Miss Pine. "'Martha will bring these in. You have not forgotten my good Martha, Helena.' Then Mrs. Dysart looked up and smiled just as she used to smile in the old days. The young eyes were still there in the changed face, and Miss Helena had come. That night, Martha waited in her lady's room, just as she used, humble and silent, and went through with the old, unforgotten, loving services. The long years seemed like days. At last she lingered a moment, trying to think of something else that might be done. Then she was going silently away, but Helena called her back. She suddenly knew the whole story and could hardly speak. "'Oh, my dear Martha,' she cried. "'Won't you kiss me good night?" Oh, Martha, have you remembered like this all these long years? End of section 20。Section 21 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pinewood Mists Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. My Lorelei, a Heidelberg Romance, by Octave Thanet. Heidelberg, July 9th, 1874. Louis is still at Frankfurt. There are inconveniences in being in love with one's husband when he has to spend half his time in Frankfurt on business. However, I will not grumble, since but for this same business we could not have afforded Europe for years. We have been here two weeks. We expect to be here two months. The town is a queer, quaint, mini-gabled, abominably paved place, with the famous Heidelberger Schloss shouldering its red walls through the trees of the western hills like the Middle Ages looking down on us. When the sun sets, its rugged towers are outlined against a golden background, such as Fra Angelico gives his Madonnas. A hotel front as the Anlage, a charming street of which only one side is bordered with cream-coloured brick, while the other rolls back in wooded hills, 
where the white caps hold their nipen and the band plays on summer nights. Louis's Prussian friend, Count von Riebnitz, recommended the hotel. Indeed, he honours it with his own long-descended presence. He is a tall young man of florid complexion and frank expression. He has regular features and a great sunburned white moustache, which he waxes at the ends. I cannot believe that his shoulders are so square and his waist so slender without some assistance from art. His regiment is stationed in Schwetzingen, but for some occult reason he seems to spend a great deal of time here. Ted Tresham is here also, my good-natured, good-looking and, I fear, slightly good-for-nothing cousin, whom I haven't seen for two years. His engagement does not seem to have sobered him particularly. Probably it is merely a family affair. Miss Tresham is so rich, and his second cousin besides. She is staying here with her aunt, Miss Guernsey, waiting for Uncle Tresham. When he comes, they are going home, and the young people are to be married in December. I have always had a curiosity to see Undyne Tresham, and now that I have opportunities, I improve them. She is worth seeing. When I look at her, I am reminded of a German Lorelei and I do not think it is the name altogether which suggests the comparison. No, for there are the deep, calm, quite indescribable eyes, the waving, soft brown hair, the mysterious smile, all that delicate and elusive loveliness which the poets give to those strange creatures who attract a passion which they cannot return. She has two marked dimples and a blue vein on her cheek. Her white teeth make her smile dazzling, and she has the very sweetest voice I have ever heard. Yet, I doubt my cousin may have made a great mistake. This too, though Miss Tresham is undeniably clever, and her manners are as charming as her face. Will Coombs was in love with her once. He never asked her to marry him. She was too jolly heartless, he said. Will has a keen streak running through his nonsense, and I fancy he was right about Undine Tresham. Graceful and cordial, and as winning as she is, there is an intangible mist of coldness about her. A curious remoteness, a persistent light-heartedness that seems to spring not from ignorance or hardness, but sheer incapacity to feel. For instance, I cannot for my life imagine those beautiful eyes of hers filled with tears. All this from two weeks' acquaintance and Will's wild talk? Decidedly, I am not timid in inference. July 10th. I know a countess. She is the first countess of my acquaintance, therefore valued. Her name is Dunin Schlepp's Wall something. Mamma has it all neatly written out on a slip of paper, which she carries about with her that she may be able to address the Nerdige Frau properly. I shall call her countess. It is short, but at the same time imposing and I have observed that they always address people so in novels. She is an amenable old woman who rouges and smokes cigarettes after dinner. Once she was a celebrated beauty, and she is still a brilliant talker, when she does not speak English. Unhappily, her politeness always leads her to converse with me in my own tongue. I can't tell her I don't understand English, so I sit at table de hoot in a desperate state of mind, listening to her unintelligible fluency and making frantic guesses at their meaning. Mamma can't understand her at all, and she thinks the poor woman is deaf. And when Mamma looks helpless and unhappy and murmurs, I beg your pardon, she yells the remark over again. Her seat at table de hoot is next to mine, and opposite we have two Americans. The elder is a middle-aged woman, the younger a girl of perhaps twenty-three. They are interesting, after a fashion, that is, the girl is, for the woman looks like nothing so much as a weak watercolour. She is so faded, indistinct and neutral tinted. But the girl is a beauty. How Titian would rave over her crispy red-gold hair, and topaz brown long-lashed eyes, and creamy white skin, with the pink glowing under the white on her oval cheeks. To me, she seems like one of his gorgeous Venetian dames come to life again, with his own luxuriant grace of contour in her figure, and his own alluring splendour of colouring in her face. I suppose nine persons out of ten would call Miss Grace Wilmot that is her name, and the watercolour's title is Mrs. Moore, a magnificently handsome woman. But I don't like her. 
To be frank, I don't like Titian. Somehow, it is an oppressive kind of beauty. There is a trifle too much of her, and then her ribbons are never quite fresh. Such things are women, Louis would say, and he would add that I was prejudiced because she flirts with Ted Tresham. Yesterday she blushed when he came into the room. He took the vacant seat beside her, it is not his seat at all, and one of the dimpled white hands stole into the table. I know from the sheepish look in the corner of Theodore's eye that he squeezed it. Undine and Mrs Guernsey were not present. I wonder if he cares for his future wife. She, I fancy, is not likely to break her heart for anyone. Still, it is impossible not to like her. She is so amusing and her manners are perfect. With her aunt, for example, nothing could be better. Mrs Guernsey is odd and fussy, and what must seem even more inexplicable to Undine, fervently enthusiastic. Yet she never loses her temper, is always willing to come home before the dew falls, carries as many extra shawls as her aunt suggests, and listens with never-failing patience to the moral reflections. Far be it from me, however, to speak one slighting word of the excellent Mrs Guernsey. She is a boon. Like Mamma, she is a hungerer and a thirster for information. I am not. It is consequently an immense relief to have flung in our power, as it were, a comrade for Mamma who is continually and infatigably improving the time. They go off together on little instructive sprees. July 15th. What a fascination there is about this quiet little town. Nothing is new. No one is excited. Even the coarse students get drunk decorously. I seem to have stepped out of the bustle and hurry and struggle of modern life. It is bliss after Chicago. Yesterday we spent the day at the castle. There I saw a young man and a young woman sitting under the lindens. They sat there all day. Half a dozen times we came back to them, always in the same attitudes. She knitting some blue woollen article, he sitting on the grass at her feet. Occasionally he would take her hand and hold it for a few moments, smiling. He had providently spread a gay handkerchief on the grass, for his clothes were new beyond a doubt, and he looked tranquilly and unreservedly happy. They said little, but several times the resaturation waiters brought them beer, and at noon they ate a great deal of bread and cheese and a large sausage which they appeared to have brought with them. When the night fell and we went homeward, we overtook them walking hand in hand among the trees. They looked supremely satisfied with life, possibly a trifle stolid, but innocent as Arcadia. Undine glanced up at them as they passed. They are happy, she said. Probably they are very lately married, but fancy two Americans spending a day in such a way. I don't like American lovers, said I. We all went up to the castle together, Undine, Ted, Mamma, and I. We rode up the hill in the most degraded manner on diminutive donkeys, with a man walking behind to guide the beasts by the tail. I shall not tell Louis. The road climbs the steepest of hills through old Heidelberg, which is picturesque and ruinous to the last degree. All the inhabitants, save a few very bad children who try to frighten tourists' donkeys, are over eighty and wear ragged, dingy blue garments. At the castle gateway we dismounted and dismissed our donkeys. The gateway itself is a commonplace, modern structure, with an iron ring to let into the stone on one side. Ted explained that this was the celebrated wishing ring. One must knock three times with it, wishing the same thing each time. Then he must enter and make a circuit of the grounds in absolute silence, going out through the same gateway. If these directions are followed to the letter, whatever he has wished shall surely come to pass. Instantly out came Mamma's bay decker and glasses. Has anyone ever tried it? she asked eagerly. Hundreds, said Ted. Only ten have succeeded, though. One of these was a woman. Ach, so, said Undine, with the absurd German inflection. Actually, said Ted, I don't wonder you're surprised, but it really happened. She gagged herself with her handkerchief and had her husband tie her hands so she managed to walk all around and out safely. But the instant he took the handkerchief out, she gave a kind of gasping scream and fell down dead. What did she do that for? said Mamma, rather startled. Why, you see, she had so much to say that it killed her, trying to say it all at once. What are you going to do, Undine? 
Undine, who had laid her hand on the ring, said she was going to wish. What will you wish for, Riechben? said Ted, carelessly. What have you left to want? She lifted her eyes to his. Certainly they are most the beautiful eyes in the world. There was a little vibration in her sweet, slow voice. I don't know, Ted, she answered. Everything has come to me before I have time to want it. I can only wish to keep. At that moment it occurred to me that I had made little mistake about my Lorelei. Such a thought had no business to make me melancholy, but it did. I walked by Undine's side, almost as silent as she. For that matter, Ted was the only lively member of the party, since Mamma was absorbed in comparing the realities with the Baedeker's flights of fancy, naturally a serious occupation, and Undine never opened her lips. Finally, she walked out of the gate and came back smiling. It is a strain, Ted, she confessed. I hope I shall be immortalised in the castle's traditions. I feel very much exhausted. Would you mind going to the resaturation and having a cup of coffee, Mrs. Burt? Ted suggested champagne, but Undine asked him solemnly if he had ever tried the resaturation champagne, and when he admitted his ignorance, she said, The coffee is the worst of its kind, but the champagne is simply beyond words. I am bound to say, after taking both, I think she told the truth. The restaturation is a wooden building, glaringly modern and out of place so near the grand old ruin. Ugly wooden tables are scattered among the trees, and depressed-looking men in shabby dress coats bear trays in the usual precarious manner, to the people who are seated around the tables. We soon left this scene of festivity and repaired to the museum. There Mamma was in her glory. She put me to open shame, standing before some wooden-looking portraits, her bonnet perched disreputably on one side of her head, and audibly reading Baedeker's descriptions. We lost her three times in twenty minutes, and each time we found her thus. The weapons also seemed to exert an unaccountable fascination over her. She would take daggers down from the wall and run her fingers along the edge. Positively, it looked as though she meant to steal the things. Why, my dear, she said to my remonstrances, we are all alone in the room and nobody seems to take the least care of anything here. Nobody did seem to take any care, but nevertheless, I was relieved when we got her safely out of the museum. I hope we did by our duty of Heidelberg Castle. Ted took us everywhere. We saw the rent tower, the tons, the great chapel, and a darksome hole which Ted called the monk's chapel. But I think the monks had more sense. Finally, we came out of the terrace. The sun had sunk below the horizon, only a few crimson streaks like the careless strokes of an empty brush stained the yellow glow in the west. Far below us was spread the town, a huddle of pointed roofs and church spires directly beneath. The Neckar ran noiselessly over its rocks, to the right and to the left stretched the hills. The near hills were green and chequered with cornfields and vineyards. But in the distance, the dark purple outlines looked darker against the yellow sea of light. The shadows of the ruined towers lay long and heavy on the grass. Away to the right, a solitary nightingale was singing, and as we stood listening for a moment, vaguely awed by the beauty and the melancholy of the scene, some students, out of sight, began Heine's song. Du hast Diamanten und Perlen, hast alles was Menschen bärer, Und hast die schönsten Augen, mein Liebchen, was willst du mehr? In the friendly dimness I saw Ted's arm steal around his cousin's waist. He hummed the refrain. Und du hast die schönsten Augen, mein Liebchen, was willst du mehr? What I wished at the gate, said Undine. And what was that, said Ted, lowering his voice, a heart, by chance? No, said Undine quietly. I have more than I need now, but Ted, we really ought to go. Aunt Eliza will be worried. She has a wild notion that donkeys run away. She says there is a viciousness in their eyes. We rode home gaily enough, but that evening, passing Undine's door, it opened, and she came out by the lamplight. Her face looked pale. For the first time, she seemed to me not the beautiful, cold Lorelei about whom I was weaving a fanciful romance, 
but a girl who had no mother and who was too rich to have many friends. Almost involuntarily, I drew her to me and kissed her. The faintest flush chinged her cheek. I can't describe how oddly she looked at me, saying, Then I don't chill you, Constance? Not to mention, said I, laughing. Then I kissed her again. It is possible he was hurt at something. I half believe she is as puzzled over the pleasure or the pain as I am puzzled over that curious look in her eyes. July 18th. Louis has returned. July 21st. Yesterday, Louis said, Come, Ted will get himself into a row if he doesn't mind his pace better. I caught him walking on the Anlago with that Miss Wilmot this evening. It doesn't look well in an engaged man. Decidedly, it does not. Lately, Ted's devotion to that girl has been scandalous, even judged by American ideas. Where foreigners must place Miss Wilmot, I don't venture to imagine. July 26th. Yesterday, I was reading Undyne to Louis and von Reibnitz. Undyne's namesake and the Countess came in together during the reading and would not allow me to stop. The Countess, who had never read a Delamotte four case charming tale, quite flattered one by her excitement over its ending. Ah, <laughs> she exclaimed, but then Undyne was an idiot. Though art but small like her, my friend. She should have to order a man to take her away from that villain fool, muttered von Reibnitz. He looked at Undyne as he spoke. I believe I know now why he spent so much time in Heidelberg. Poor young man. Yesterday, after some imperious drill had torn him from us, the Countess burst into a kind of Greek chorus of praise. She grew so enthusiastic that she even abandoned her cherished English and recounted his virtues in French. Not the least of these seemed to be that his mother was the Countess's twelfth cousin. For a brief period, this brave, this noble young man, this best of sons, had slightly, but the most slightly, if you you, admired Milgras. But who could care for her long? If friends behold the true Bethulda, so weak, so selfish, bah, so pretty. She made such a crowning offence of the last adjective that I laughed outright. Nevertheless, the Countess is a very shrewd old woman. July 30th. For my sins, Bethulda has taken a fancy to me. She does not improve on acquaintance. August 2nd. Undyne bewilders me. Does she care for Ted? If she does, how can she watch Grace Wilmot's audacious flirtation with that odd air of amusement? She has a curious smile, appearing on singularly incongruous occasions. It is almost as if she were smiling at herself. Once I asked her about her name. My father gave it to me, she said. It is after an aunt of mine who had a family reputation for fortitude and my father called me after her because I never cried. You know my mother died when I was born, and there was only he to decide. He died when I was three. I don't even remember how he looked, but I have an idea. I should have liked him. Didn't you cry often when you were a child? No, somehow I never wanted to cry. I really don't remember crying hard but once. That was because I had no little sister. It was amusing. Doesn't strike me as amusing. You don't know the circumstances. I wasn't more than eight years old. There was a horrid little girl who lived near us, a dreadfully disagreeable little girl, who was always chewing gum, and when she tired of that, used to flatten the gum on my hair. It was her crude sense of humour, I suppose, but youth is not tolerant, and it was no end of trouble getting the gum out of my hair. Well, she, this unpleasant little girl, Maylie Hungerford, had the sweetest little baby sister in the world. I thought it a great shame that Maylie should have three sisters, while I had not even a brother. I was very fond of little Lulu, so I stole her. Stole her? Yes, stole her out of the cradle while the nurse was talking to her friend, the Iceman, and Maylie was chewing gum somewhere else. Stole her and carried her to an old woman who was to take care of her for me for a dollar a week, my Roman stash and my new wax doll. You can fancy the conclusion of the story, of course. The old woman was a cunning old woman. She carried the baby home, running all the way, 
An indignant delegation of Hungerford's waited on my aunt. Poor Aunt Eliza, she began to cry while I simply stared. Oh, Undine, how could you act so, she said, the Hungerfords all the time glaring at me solemnly. I wanted a little sister, said I. But my dear, said Mrs. Hungerford, she was a very large woman, Constance very tall and very stout, and she always grew red in the face when she became moral and instructive. My dear, said she, God gives little brothers and sisters. And he won't please give me one, I interrupted, not meaning to be rude, but only awfully in earnest. No, he won't, screamed Maylie, and you can't have any, never. But I didn't look at her. Can't I? I said to Mrs. Hungerford. Why, no, my dear, she said. You can't, but you may have dear little friends who will love you very much. And then I cried. Did you always want a sister? Not so much when I saw more of sisters, but I have times of wanting her still. Undine, said I, suppose you try me. I never had a sister either, and I love you. Do you? she said, looking at me with her lovely, unfathomable eyes. I am glad. You will make a nice sister. At least, dear, though I did not say it to you, I shall make a faithful one. August 6th. Louis again away. Constance a martyr to Bertilda. Hardly a day passes that she does not come into my room, clad in an untidy blue cashmere wrapper, fling herself upon my lounge and confide. The other day she told me how hard it is to earn her living as a companion. Mrs. Moore never denies her anything. How sad and lonely she felt, and how much she longed for sympathy. She wept a few tears on a torn handkerchief, which she deluged with my cologne. Then she took the cologne off with her to bathe her head. Of course, it has not returned. Farewell, a long farewell to all my sweetness, for she borrowed my other perfumery Thursday. Sometimes her feelings overcome her, as she cries on my handkerchiefs. That is why my stock is getting low. Grief always makes her hair come down, and she puts it up with my hairpins whenever she needs a pin, and carefully selects a black pin from the cushion. There are cords, and black pins in a foreign country touch one of mine. August 10th. Ted has taken Mrs Guernsey to Baden for a few days. August 15th. Yesterday we had a most disagreeable adventure. We were to drive to Neckar Steinock and take a dinner at a quaint little inn lauded by von Reibnitz. Mamma, the Countess and I, were to go in a carriage. Von Reibnitz and Undine were to ride. It was a lovely plan, but Bertulda spoiled it all. At the last moment she wheeled an invitation out of Mamma's soft heart. Poor motherless child, said Mamma, and you know, Connie, there is a vacant seat in the carriage. So she came. She looked as handsome as a snake in a blue chambray gauze and Paris-trimmed hat with roses. We took dinner in the garden of the inn. The garden slopes down into the river, and from where we sat we could see trimly checkered hills and vineyards, and, peeping through the trees, a ruined tower from which once a robber baron descended on peaceful travellers, but which now holds nothing more warlike than flocks of swallows. On the steepest hills a few wretched houses were clustered about a slender church spire, and a footpath crawled up to them through stunted vineyards. But von Reibnitz told us that a colony of cretins dwelt there. They support themselves chiefly by begging, and I should judge that the whole colony had turned out in our honour. Horrible-looking beings they were, dwarfed, maimed, deformed in strange and hideous fashions, scarred with loathsome diseases, living hints of the appalling possibilities of our race. One bolder than the others followed us to the carriage and clung to the door. He was a repulsively ugly man who limped and had somehow lost two fingers on his left hand. Bertulda was nearest to him. She shuddered and called out in her bad German, Garden schnell, ich habe nix. The creature only grinned and clutched her arm. She wrenched it away, screaming to the coachman to strike the man with his whip. The coachman gave a half-reckless stroke behind him, and the cretin, at that instant, swaying forward with the motion of the carriage and the lash, cut him full in the face. It was an ugly thing to see. 
uglier perhaps though to see his arms tossed up and his body curved backward as the sudden lurch of the carriage tumbled him to the road the frightened horses broke into a gallop while mamma shrieked the countess i fear swore and bertulda gazed piteously at her own arm i looked back the cretin was standing in the centre of the road covered with dust there was a wet red line across his cheek he wiped it with his ragged sleeve undine had thrown him a gold piece but it glittered unnoticed at his feet not so much as glancing down he looked from his stained sleeve to us muttering to himself then a cloud of dust made a dingy ghost of him and undine and von reibnitz clattered up to the drotschke they were assailed by a little storm of questions was the poor fellow hurt cried mamma what did he say said the countess did he pick up his money i asked oh no miss burt he wasn't hurt badly said undine he was saying he would murder miss wilmot madam no carney he didn't what is the matter miss wilmot bertulda was looking desperately frightened her nerves were so shaken in fact that we had to stop and avert the hysterics with champagne she had taken as much champagne as was good for her already and the consequent spectacle was not edifying i wish ted had seen her august sixteenth yesterday undine gave me an elegant dressing case i told her she gave me too many presents she opened her eyes are you not my sister she said i am out of all patience with ted how could a man fortunate enough to have won such an exquisite being as undine descend to grace wilmot's beauté de diable because he is a man i suppose yesterday night they went to the cemetery to hear the nightingales sing nice cheerful place for a romantic stroll as the countess says like september twelfth ted has a duel on his hands walk with miss wilmot rude student grace frightened student knocked down challenge the student says he knew grace before had walked with her himself grace says it is a wicked lie maybe it is and maybe it isn't all this with many unnecessary comments was confided to me last night it goes without saying that undine is not to know september thirteenth an awkward thing has just happened undine and i going into the reading room came suddenly upon grace wilmot sobbing on ted tresham's shoulder the devil said he upon my word i don't blame him bertulda sank into a chair and made a great fuss with her handkerchief undine quite silent stood in the doorway looking from one to the other she was dressed for dinner the sunlight burnished the dull olive tints of her dress there was a lace scarf flung around her shoulders and the opals at her white throat flickered like flame she had never looked more beautiful i wonder if ted didn't think so too anyhow he stared at her with all his eyes before he could speak she stepped between him and grace excuse me she said and there was not a quiver in her sweet voice i did not know any one was here before i go let me return something that belongs to mr tresham she slipped a ring from her finger laid it on the table near ted and turning passed out of the room there didn't seem anything for me to do save go so i went in another direction as for my cousin theodore tresham he has just been to see me i am happy to say he looked infinitely uncomfortable he burst out at once he knew he had been a cursed fool but it wasn't as bad as i thought he swore he did not know miss wilmot was in the room when he came into it she had heard of the duel and she felt sorry and so and so by jove i don't know how it did happen groaned ted i said i thought i did that was a nice girl to lose and blame for leave her out can't you he said gloomily you women are always so infernally hard on each other is undine hard on her ted stood up he looked more of a man than i had ever seen him constance he said i love undine and she knows it whatever follies and idiotic fancies for other women i may have i always come back to her i have to she knows that too tell her i am ashamed of myself and it's the last time she shall need to forgive me tell her i'll do anything she wants if she will only let me speak to her one single time 
Well, I promised. For who dares decide what will make a woman happy? Ted, as a husband, I should not fancy myself. But Undyne may. Later, I went downstairs to Undyne and conscientiously began Ted's apologies. She stopped the first of them with, Do you think, Connie, you can invent more excuses for Ted than I? She had been so composed, so free from any show of either anger or grief, that I had begun to hope, yes, to hope, though Ted is my cousin, that she did not really care for him. In my disappointment, I said the silliest thing possible. I told her she was far too good for him. She laughed, and she sighed. I had never heard her sigh before, and the soft little sound affected me strangely. I don't know about that, she said. And besides, Constance, we don't love people because they are good, but because we can't help it. Nothing appropriate to Carrington to say, I said nothing. But I felt, with a rush of thankfulness so intense that it was pain, how much I respected Louis. Just at this point in the conversation, it was ordained that Mrs Guernsey should come in and tell me most of the history of Heidelberg Castle. I have just escaped. Tomorrow, the Countess and her son are going to take Mama and me to Schweitzinger. The son is a mild-mannered young man, who is the best swordsman in Heidelberg. A wretched old German with a villainous voice promenades beneath my window, singing over and over again the first two lines of the Lorelei. Ich weiß nicht, was stolz es ben denten, dass ich so traurig bin. I am tired. I am out of spirits. I wish I could sleep a long, long time. Heidelberg, September 25th, 1879. How still the life stands in an old German town. I look from my window on the same shady streets. Poor students, yellow-brown dogs sniffing at their master's heels, English tourists in astonishing plaids and greys, American tourists in sombre, black, honest half-flowers knitting in the shade of the same. I might have left them yesterday, and it is yesterday five years. Five years ago I put this old journal in the pocket of my trunk, thinking then that I never should write in it again. I did not take it out again until yesterday. The trunk was too large for ordinary use, and it stood unmolested in the garret. At first I shrank from seeing the book, and yet at the same time shrank from destroying it. After a while I believe I forgot about it, but when I took the old trunk out for this journey, I remembered, and yesterday I read the journal through. Everything comes back so freshly here, where I knew Undyne, and I am glad at last that it should come. Perhaps some day I shall be glad that I have told the end of the story which I began in so unconscious and light-hearted a fashion five years ago. I might, for example, give this journal to Theodore Tresham. I have been trying to renew the old time in every way I know. This morning I climbed up to the castle. I wandered through the bare rooms and ruined arches, and I stood for a moment beneath the gateway where Undyne wished to keep. Nothing there has changed. The waiters at the restaturation seem to wear the self-same shabby dress coats. The very coffee was cold as it used to be. One thing I have not done. I have not gone to Schweitzingen. Although a very pleasant party went today and urged us to accompany them, but I did not go. I do not think I shall ever see Schweitzingen again. Yet it was a pleasant enough day which we spent there five years ago. I forget what we did. I only remember now the look of Louis's face as he walked into the little dining room of the Golden Stag, where we all were, and the sound of his voice saying, Con, you were always brave. There has been a bad accident to Miss Tresham, and she wants you. At least, I was brave enough not to make any trouble. While they were putting the horses into the lightest carriage they could find, von Reibnitz's dog cart, for there was no railroad then from Schweitzingen, Louis told me all he knew. Afterwards I heard the rest. It seems Undyne and Miss Guernsey had gone up to the castle and were out on the terrace when they heard wild screams, and almost instantly Grace Wilmot darted up to them, pursued by a horrible-looking man brandishing a dagger. Louis did not know then, but it was the cretin of the Neckar Steinock. For weeks he had been tracking Grace with the strange cunning of his distorted wits, 
and he found her alone among the ruins. The dagger belonged to the museum, and I suppose he stole it. Grace had fled the instant she saw him. She rushed at Undine, stumbled, and fell at her feet. The fall probably saved her, for the cretin had caught her dress and struck one furious blow. Before he could strike again, Undine had flung her arms about him. Slender as they were, they clung like steel. Though he shifted his dagger to his left hand and stabbed her, they never loosened their grasp. Run! she cried to the helpless, shrieking creature by her side. Run! I can't hold him long! Bertulda. Well, she was Bertulda. She saved herself. Mrs. Guernsey's scream brought a dozen people to the spot, Louis among them. He had returned unexpectedly from Frankfurt and still wore his travelling revolver. Drawing it, he pushed it under Undine's arm within an inch of the man's breast and fired. The cretin rolled over on the stones and was dead in five minutes. But his rusty dagger had done its work. They carried my poor girl to the hotel and Louis went for me. It was von Reibnitz who brought him the horse. Our drive home is like a nightmare to me. When we reached the hotel, a man ran out of the shadow of the blue and white awnings and held out his hand to help me from the carriage. Yes, he answered, answering the question I had not the courage to ask. I think she may live until the morning, but there is no, no hope. Then I saw it was Ted, for the first sun had shone on his face, and I was half dazed. Now I could see how white and haggard his gay, careless face was, with red circles about the eyes as if he had been crying. Oh, Constance, he cried, wringing my hand hard. For God's sake, get me a chance to see her. Mrs. Guernsey is angry and won't let me in. I suppose I must have promised. Somehow I got away, and hurrying down the dark hall, almost ran into Grace Wilmot. Her eyes were red and swollen. It was always such an easy thing for her to cry. She sobbed out an entreaty for me to stop. Oh, Mrs. Lind, is she really going to die? Indeed, it wasn't my fault, and everybody blames me. Oh, please stop. Oh, what shall I do? I did stop. It was dark in the hall, but there was some light, and I hoped she saw my face. I pointed over my shoulder. Mr. Tresham is there, I said, and I left her. It was our last conversation. Mrs. Guernsey was waiting. She led me into the room. There was a table covered with papers, drawn up to the bed, and beside it stood a tall man in black. Through the triangle made by his bent arm, I caught a glimpse of soft brown hair. He moved, and I saw Undine's face. I went up to her. But what does it matter how I felt? To think it was then Mrs. Guernsey, and the doctor went softly out the room. Undine feebly put her hand on mine. I knew you would come, Connie, she said. My dear love, how hard you must have driven. I tried to speak, to tell her it would hurt her to talk. She smiled and said, Nothing will hurt me now. Connie, I wanted to speak to you alone, on business. I have left half my property to Ted. Then I had left something to Aunt Eliza, all she would take. You know she is rich. And I have left some 50,000 in legacies to some poor people I have known. The rest I have given to you. You are my sister, Constance. You will take my money, won't you? It makes me happy to think of your having it. Oh, why did you save that girl? I cried. Oh, how can I bear it? Undine smiled again, the curious smile which used to puzzle me. Why? she repeated. I'm sure I don't know myself. Yet I suppose I would do it over again were it to do. It seems absurd rather, doesn't it? I could not speak. How still it is, said Undine. Is it really so still, or is it... Connie, do you mind going to the window to see? I went to the window. There was straw scattered over the street, and von Weibnitz stood like a sentinel at the corner. When I told Undine, she sighed. How good he is, she murmured. I wish... She did not finish the sentence, but a moment later she asked me to thank von Reibnitz and to give him a chain she had worn, which he had once admired. 
Some day, I hope, she said, he will give it to some pretty German girl who will love him as the Countess says the best of sons deserves. It was a little while after this she asked me if I had seen Ted. I told her what he had said. Did he think I could die without seeing him? She said, my poor boy. But for all that, he will marry Grace Wilmot. He can never look at her again, I cried. Heaven knows I believed it at the time. She leaned her head half wearily on my shoulder. I believe I could have kept him had I lived, she said. But a memory is so weak, Constance. Yes, dear? Do you believe spirits can see those they used to love? Oh, God knows, my darling, I cannot tell you. You will be happy, however it is. Do you think so? She answered dreamily. I have always been a kind of pagan, and I don't feel quite certain. What could I say to her? I sat silent with a heavy heart, while one by one the street lights sprang out of the darkness, and by their gleam I took the last look of my darling's face. They were singing over among the hills the same little love song of Heine's, which I had heard for the first time the day we visited the castle. Du hast Diamanten und Perlen, hast alles was Menschenberger, und hast die schönsten Augen, mein Liebchen was willst du mehr. She turned those loveliest eyes wistfully up to mine. You will always love me, Con, won't you? Now call Ted, and kiss me first. Even as I kissed her, I felt her lips stir with a smile. Connie, do you remember the day at the castle when I wished? Well, the ring is a true fairy, for I wished Ted might love me as long as I lived. And he will. I laid her gently back on the pillows, but I could not see her face through my tears. I did not need to call Ted, he was watching at the door. I could hear him rush past me and fling himself on his knees before Undyne, begging her in a broken voice to forgive him, only to forgive him. I never loved Grace, I never loved anyone but you. You said I always came back, oh my God. Constance, Constance, come here. Yes, he might kiss her hands and her hair, show his useless remorse in any frantic way he would, but it did not matter what he did any more, for Undyne lay there with her last smile forever fixed on her beautiful mouth. As if dead, she smiled at his pain, as living, she smiled at her own. All this is, all this is five years away. We left Undyne in the pretty little cemetery where Ted and Grace Wilmot went to hear the nightingales sing. Last night I heard them singing by her grave. Poor von Reibnitz was killed in the Franco-Prussian War. He left me a little pet dog, which, as I am not fond of dogs, has been something of a trial to me. The Countess is on her Polish estates with her son. She writes me occasionally and often alludes to her Heidelberg experience. I have no doubt she makes a capital tragic tale of it. She was always a fine talker in every language but English. Ted Tresham married Grace Wilmot within six months after his cousin's death. I hear queer stories of his wife's extravagance and flirtations, and I take a grim satisfaction in the hearing. Our own intercourse with Ted naturally ceased with his marriage, but business matters have made a few interviews necessary. He seems subdued and changed, and looks ten years older. He has never mentioned Undyne's name. As for me, Undyne's legacy has prospered with us. I am more in love with my husband than ever. My dear mother is still with us. On the whole, I am a very happy woman. But I have never made another friend. Octave Thanet End of section 21 My Lorelei, a Heidelberg Romance by Octave Thanet Section 22 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis. 
Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. My Aromatic Uncle. It is always with a feeling of personal tenderness and regret that I recall his story. Although it began long before I was born, and must have ended shortly after that important date, and although I myself never laid eyes on the personage of whom my wife and I always speak as the aromatic uncle. The story begins so long ago indeed that I can tell it only as a tradition of my wife's family. It goes back to the days when Boston was so frankly provincial a town that one of its leading citizens, a man of eminent position and ancient family, remarked to a young kingsman whom he was entertaining at his hospital board by way of pleasing and profitable discourse. Nephew, it may interest you to know that it is Mr. Everett who has the other hind quarter of this lamb. This simple tale I will vouch for, for I got it from the lips of the nephew, who has been my uncle for so many years that I know him to be a trustworthy authority. In those days which seem so far away, and yet the space between them and us is spanned by a lifetime of threescore years and ten. Life was simpler in all its details, yet such towns as Boston, already old, had well-established local customers which varied not at all from year to year, many of which lingered in later phases of urban growth. In Boston, or at least in that part of Boston where my wife's family dwelt, it was the invariable custom for the head of the family to go to the market in the early morning with his wife's list of the day's needs. When the list was filled, the articles were placed in a basket, and the baskets thus filled were symmetrically deposited by the market boys at the back door of the house to which they were consigned. Then, the housekeeper came to the back door at her convenience and took the basket in. Exposed as this position must have been, such a thing as theft of the day's edibles was unknown, and the first authentic account of any illegitimate handling of the baskets brings me to the introduction of my wife's uncle. It was on a summer morning, and as far as I can find out, that little butcher boy, a very little butcher boy to be driving so big a cart, stopped in the rear of two houses that stood close together in a suburban street. One of these houses belonged to my wife's father, who was, for all I can gather, a very pompous, severe, and generally objectionable old gentleman, a judge, and a very considerable dignitary, who apparently devoted all his leisure to making life miserable for his family. The other was owned by a comparatively poor and unimportant man who did a shipping business in a small way. He had bought it during a period of temporary affluence, and it hung on his hands like a white elephant. He could not sell it, and it was turning his hair gray to pay the taxes on it. On this particular morning, he had got up at four o'clock to go down to the wharves to see if a certain ship in which he was interested had arrived. It was due and overdue and its arrival would settle the question of his domestic comfort for the whole year, for if it failed to appear or came home with an empty bottom, his fate would be hard indeed. But if it brought him money or marketable goods from its long oriental trip, he might take heart of grace and look forward to better times. When the butcher's boy stopped at the house of my wife's father, he set down at the back door a basket containing fish, a big joint of roast beef, and a generous load of fruit and vegetables, including some fine fat oranges. At the other door, he left a rather unpromising-looking lump of steak and a half peck of potatoes, not of the first quality. When he had deposited these two burdens, he ran back and started his cart up the road. But he looked back as he did so, and he saw a sight familiar to him, and saw the commission of a deed entirely unfamiliar. A handsome young boy of about his own age stepped out of the back door of my wife's father's house and looked carelessly around him. He was one of the boys who compel the admiration of all other boys, strong, sturdy, and a trifle arrogant. He had long ago compelled the admiration of the little butcher boy. They had been playmates together at the public school, and although the judge's son looked down from an infinite height upon his poor little comrade, the butcher boy worshipped him with the deepest and most fervent adoration. He had for him the admiring reverence which the boy who can't lick anybody has for the boy who can lick everybody. He was a superior being, a pattern, a model, 
an ideal never to be achieved, but perhaps in a crude, humble way to be imitated. And there is no hero worship in the world like a boy's worship of a boy hero. The sight of this fortunate and adorable youth was familiar enough to the butcher boy, but the thing he did startled and shocked that poor little working man, almost as much as if his idol had committed a capital crime right before his very eyes. For the judge's son suddenly let a look into his face that meant mischief, glanced around him to see whether anybody was observing him or not, and, failing to notice the butcher boy, quickly and dexterously changed the two baskets. Then he went back into the house and shut the door on himself. The butcher boy reined up his horse and jumped from his cart. His first impulse, of course, was to undo the shocking iniquity which the object of his admiration had committed. But before he had walked back a dozen yards, it struck him that he was taking a great liberty in spoiling the other boy's joke. It was wrong, of course, he knew it. But was it for him to rebuke the wrongdoing of such an exalted personage? If the judge's son came out again, he would see that his joke had miscarried, and then he would be displeased. And to the butcher boy, it did not seem right in the nature of things that anything should displease the judge's son. Three times he went hesitatingly backward and forward, trying to make up his mind, and then he made it up. The king could do no wrong. Of course, he himself was doing wrong in not putting the baskets back where they belonged. But then he reflected. He took that sin on his own humble conscience, and in some measure took it off the conscience of the judge's son. If indeed it troubled that lightsome conscience at all. And of course, too, he knew that, being an apprentice, he would be whipped for it when the substitution was discovered. But he didn't mind being whipped for the boy he worshipped. So he drove out along the road, and the wife of the poor shipping merchant, coming to the back door and finding the basket full of good things, and noticing especially the beautiful china oranges, naturally concluded that her husband's ship had come in, and that he had provided his family with a rare treat. And the judge, when he came home to dinner, and Mrs. Judge introduced him to the rump steak and potatoes, but I do not wish to make this story any more pathetic than is necessary. A few months after this episode, perhaps indirectly in consequence of it, I have never been able to find out exactly, the judge's son, my wife's uncle, ran away to sea, and for many years his recklessness, his strength, and his good looks were only traditions in the family, but traditions which he himself kept alive by remembrances than which none could have been more effective. At first he wrote but seldom, later on more regularly, but his letters, I have seen many of them, were the most uncommunicative documents that I ever saw in my life. His wanderings took him to many strange places on the other side of the globe, but he never wrote of what he saw or did. His family gleaned from them that his health was good, that the weather was such and such, and that he wished to have his love, duty, and respects conveyed to his various relatives. In fact, the first positive bit of personal intelligence that they received from him was five years after his departure, when he wrote them from a Chinese port on letter paper whose heading showed that he was a member of a commercial firm. The letter itself made no mention of the fact. As the years passed on, however, The letters came more regularly as they told less about the weather, and were slightly, very slightly, more expressive of a kind regard for his relatives. But at the best, they were cramped by the formality of his day and generation, and we of today would have called them cold and perfunctory. But the practical assurances that he gave of his undiminished, nay, his steadily increasing, affection for the people at home were of a most satisfying character, for they were convincing proof not only of his love, but of his material prosperity. Almost from his first time of writing, he began to send gifts to all the members of the family. At first, these were mere trifles, little curios of travel, such as he was able to purchase out of a seaman's scanty wages. But as the years went on, they grew richer and richer, till the munificence of the runaway son became the pride of the whole family. The old house that had been in the suburbs of Boston was fairly in the heart of the city when I first made its acquaintance, and one of the famous houses of the town. And it was no wonder it was famous, 
for such a collection of oriental furniture, bric-a-brac, and objects of art never was seen outside of a museum. There were ebony cabinets, bookcases, tables, and couches wonderfully crafted and inlaid with mother-of-pearl. There were beautiful things in bronze and jade and ivory. There were all sorts of strange rugs and curtains and portieres. As to the chinaware and the vases, no house was ever so stocked. And as for such trifles and shawls and fans and silk handkerchiefs, why such things were sent not stingily but by dozens. No one could forget his first entrance into that house. The great drawing room was darkened by heavy curtains, and at first you had only a dim vision of the strange and graceful shapes of its curious furnishing. But you could not be but instantly conscious of the delicate perfume that pervaded the apartment, and for that matter, the whole house. It was a combination of all the delightful eastern smells, not sandalwood only, nor teak, nor couscous, but all these odors and a hundred others blent into one. Yet it was not heavy nor overpowering, but delightfully faint and sweet, diffused through those ample rooms. There was good reason, indeed, for the children of the generation to which my wife belonged to speak of the generous relative whom they had never seen as our aromatic uncle. There were other uncles, and I have no doubt they gave presents freely, for it was a wealthy and free-handed family. But there was no other uncle who sent such a delicate and delightful reminder with every gift, to breathe a soft memory of him by day and by night. I did my courting in the sweet atmosphere of that house, and although I had no earthly desire to live in Boston, I could not help missing that strangely blended odor when my wife and I moved into an old house in an old part of New York, whose former owners had no connections in the eastern trade. It was a charming and homelike old house, but at first, although my wife had brought some belongings from her father's house, we missed the pleasant flavor of our aromatic uncle, for he was now my uncle, as well as my wife's. I say at first, for we did not miss it long. Uncle David, that was his name, not only continued to send his fragrant gifts to my wife at Christmas and upon her birthday, but he actually adopted me too and sent me Chinese cabinets and Chinese gods in various minerals and metals, and many articles designed for a smoker's use, which no smoker would ever want to touch with a ten-foot pole. But I cared very little about the utility of these presents, for it was not many years before, among them all, they set up that exquisite perfume in the house which we had learned to associate with our aromatic uncle. Fu Chu Li, China, January 18 Dear Nephew and Niece, The present is to inform you that I have this day shipped to your address per steamer Ocean Queen, one marble and ebony table, six assorted gods, and a blue dinner set, also that I propose leaving this country for a visit to the land of my nativity on the 6th of March next, and will, if same is satisfactory to you, take up my abode temporarily in your household. Should same not be satisfactory, please cable at my charge. Messrs. Smithson and Smithson, my custom brokers, will attend to all charges on the goods, and will deliver them at your readiness. The health of this place is better than customary by reason of the cold weather, which health I am as usual enjoying. Trusting that you both are at present in possession of the same blessing, and will continue I remain, dear nephew and niece, your affectionate uncle. This was, I believe, by four dozen words, those which he used to inform us of his intention of visiting America the longest letter that Uncle David had ever written to any member of his family. It also conveyed more information about himself than he had ever given since the day he ran away to sea. Of course, we cabled the old gentleman that we should be delighted to see him. And, late that spring, at some date at which he could not possibly have been expected to arrive, he turned up at our house. Of course, we had talked a great deal about him and wondered what manner of a man we should find him. Between us, my wife and I had got an idea of his personal appearance, which I despair of conveying in words. Vaguely, I should say that we had pictured him as something midway between an abnormally tall Chinese Mandarin and a benevolent Quaker. 
What we found when we got home and were told that our uncle from India was awaiting us was a shrunken and bent old gentleman, dressed very cleanly and neatly in a black broadcloth, with a limp, many pleated shirt front of old fashioned style, and a plain black caravat. If he had worn an old time stock, we could have forgiven him the rest of the disappointment he cost us, but we had to admit to ourselves that he had the most absolutely commonplace appearance of all our acquaintance. In fact, we soon discovered that, except for a taciturnity the like of which we had never encountered, our aromatic uncle had positively not one picturesque characteristic about him. Even his aroma was a disappointment. He had it, but it was patchouli or some other cheap perfume of the sort wherewith he scented his handkerchief which was not even a bandana, but a plain, decent white one of the unnecessarily large sort which clergymen and old gentlemen affect. But even if we could not get one single romantic association to cluster about him, we very soon got to like the old gentleman. It is true that at our first meeting, after saying, how do you do, to me, and receiving in impassive placidity the kiss which my wife gave him, he relapsed into dead silence and continued to smoke a clay pipe with a long stem and a short bowl. This instrument he filled and refilled every few minutes, and seemed to be his only employment. We plied him with questions, of course, but to these he responded with a wonderful brevity. In the course of an hour's conversation, we got from him that he had had a pleasant voyage, that it was not a long voyage, that it was not a short voyage, and it was about the usual voyage and he had not been seasick, that he was glad to be back, and that he was not surprised to find the country very much changed. This last piece of information was repeated in the form of a simple no, given in reply to the direct question, and although it was given politely and evidently without the least unamiable intent, it made us both feel very cheap. After all, it was absurd to ask a man if he were surprised to find the country changed after fifty or sixty years of absence. Unless he was an idiot and unable to read at that, he must have expected something of the sort. But we grew to like him. He was thoroughly kind and inoffensive in every way. He was entirely willing to be talked to, but he did not care to talk. If it was absolutely necessary, he could talk. And when he did talk, he always made me think of the French-English Dictionary for the Pocket, compiled by the ingenious Mr. John Bellows. For nobody except that extraordinary Englishman could condense a greater amount of information into a smaller number of words. During the time of his stay with us, I think I learned more about China than any other man in the United States knew, and I do not believe that the aggregate of his utterances in the course of that six months could have amounted to one hour's continuous talk. Don't ask me for the information. I had no sort of use for it, and I forgot it as soon as I could. I like Chinese bric-a-brac, but my interest in China ends there. Yet it was not long before Uncle David slid into his own place in the family circle. We soon found that he did not expect us to entertain him. He wanted only to sit quietly and smoke his pipe, to take his two daily walks by himself, and to read the daily paper one afternoon, and Macaulay's History of England the next. He was never tired of sitting and gazing amiably but silently at my wife, and, to head the list of his good points, he would hold the baby by the hour, and for some mysterious reason that baby, who required the exhibition of seventeen toys in a minute to be reasonably quiet in the arms of anybody else, would sit placidly in Uncle David's lap, teething away steadily on the old gentleman's watch chain, as quiet and as solemn and as aged in appearance as any one of the assorted gods of porcelain and jade and ivory which our aromatic uncle had sent us. The old house in Boston was a thing of the past. My wife's parents had been dead for some years, and no one remained of her immediate family, except a certain Aunt Lucretia, who had lived with them until shortly before our marriage when the breaking up of the family sent her west to find a home with a distant relative in California. We asked Uncle Davy if he had stopped to see Aunt Lucretia as he came through California. He said he had not. We asked him if he wanted to have Aunt Lucretia invited on to pass a visit during his stay with us. He answered that he did not. 
This did not surprise us at all. You might think that a brother might long to see a sister from whom he had been separated nearly all of a long lifetime, but then you might never have met Aunt Lucretia. My wife made the offer only from a sense of duty, and only after a contest with me which lasted three days and nights. Nothing but loss of sleep during an exceptionally busy time at my office induced me to consent to her project of inviting Aunt Lucretia. When Uncle David put his veto upon the proposition, I felt that he might have taken back all his rare and costly gifts, and I could still have loved him. But Aunt Lucretia came all the same. My wife is afflicted with a New England conscience, originally of a most uncomfortable character. It has been much modified and ameliorated, until it is now considerably less like a case of moral hives, but some wretched lingering remnant of the original article induced her to write to Aunt Lucretia that Uncle David was staying with us. And of course Aunt Lucretia came without invitation and without warning, dropping in on us with ruthless unexpectedness. You may not think, from what I have said, that Aunt Lucretia's visit was a pleasant event, but it was in some respects, for it was not only the shortest visit she ever paid us, but it was the last with which she ever honored us. She arrived one morning shortly after breakfast, just as we were preparing to go out for a drive. She would not have been Aunt Lucretia if she had not upset somebody's calculations at every turn of her existence. We welcomed her with as much hypocrisy as we could summon to our aid on short notice. And she was not more than usually offensive, although she certainly did herself full justice in telling us what she thought of us for not having invited her as soon as we even heard of Uncle David's intention to return to his native land. She said she ought to have been the first to embrace her beloved brother, to whom I don't believe she had given one thought in more years than I have yet seen. Uncle David was dressing for his drive. His long residence in tropical countries had rendered him sensitive to the cold, and although it was a fine, clear September day, with the thermometer at about 60, he was industriously building himself up with a series of overcoats. On a really snappy day, I have known him to get into six of these garments, and when he entered the room on this occasion, I think he had on five at least. My wife had heard his familiar foot on the stairs, and Aunt Lucretia had risen up and braced herself for an outburst of emotional affection. I could see that it was going to be such a greeting as is given only once or two or three centuries, and then on the stage. I felt sure it would end in a swoon, and I was looking around for a sofa pillow for the old lady to fall upon, for from what I knew of Aunt Lucretia, I did not believe she had ever swooned enough to be able to go through the performance without danger to her aged person. But I need not have troubled myself. Uncle David toddled into the room, gazed at Aunt Lucretia without a sign of recognition in his features, and toddled out into the hall, where he got his hat and gloves and went out to the front lawn, where he always paced up and down for a few minutes before taking a drive, in order to stimulate his circulation. This was a surprise, but Aunt Lucretia's behavior was a greater surprise. The moment she set eyes on Uncle David, the theatrical fervor went out of her entire system, literally in one instant, and an absolutely natural, unaffected astonishment displayed itself in her expressive and strongly marked features. For almost a minute, until the sound of Uncle David's footsteps had died away, she stood absolutely rigid, while my wife and I gazed at her spellbound. Then Aunt Lucretia pointed one long, bony finger at me, and hissed out with a true feminine disregard of grammar, "'That ain't him!' "'David,' said Aunt Lucretia, impressively, had only one arm. He lost the other in Madagascar. I was too dumbfounded to take in the situation. I remember thinking, in a vague sort of way, that Madagascar was a curious sort of place to go for the purpose of losing an arm. But I did not apprehend the full significance of this disclosure until I heard my wife's distressed protestations that Aunt Lucretia must be mistaken. There must be some horrible mistake somewhere. But Aunt Lucretia was not mistaken, and there was no mistake anywhere. The arm had been lost, and lost in Madagascar, and she could give the date of the occurrence, 
and the circumstances attendant. Moreover, she produced her evidence on the spot. It was an old daguerreotype, taken in Calcutta a year or two after the Madagascar episode. She had it in her handbag, and she opened it with fingers trembling with rage and excitement. It showed two men standing side by side near one of those three-foot iconic pillars that were an indispensable adjunct of photography in its early stages. One of the men was large, broad-shouldered, and handsome, unmistakably a handsome edition of Aunt Lucretia. His empty left sleeve was pinned across his breast. The other man was, making allowance for the difference in years, no less unmistakably the Uncle David, who was at the moment walking to and fro under our windows. For one instant, my wife's face lighted up. Why, Aunt Lucretia, she cried, there he is. That's Uncle David, dear Uncle David. There he is not. That's his business partner, some common person that he picked up on the ship he first sailed in. And upon my word, I do believe it's that wretched creature outside, and I'll Uncle David him. She marched out like a grenader going to battle, and we followed her meekly. There was, unfortunately, no room for doubt in the case. It only needed a glance to see that the man with one arm was a member of my wife's family, and that the man by his side, our Uncle David, bore no resemblance to him in stature or features. Out on the lawn, Aunt Lucretia sailed into the dear old gentleman in the five overcoats, with a volley of adoperation. He did not interrupt her, but stood patiently to the end, listening, with his hands behind his back. And when, with her last gasp of available breath, Aunt Lucretia demanded, Who, who, who are you, you wretch? He responded calmly and respectfully, I'm Tommy Briggs, Miss Lucretta. But just here, my wife threw herself on his neck and hugged him and cried, You're my own dear Uncle David anyway. It was a fortunate, a gloriously fortunate inspiration. Aunt Lucretia drew herself up in speechless scorn, stretched forth her bony finger, tried to say something and failed. And then she and her handbag went out of my gates, never to come again. When she had gone, our aromatic uncle, for we shall always continue to think of him in that light, or rather in that odor, looked thoughtfully after her until she disappeared, and then made one of the few remarks I ever knew him to volunteer. Ain't changed a mite in forty-seven years. Up to this time, I had been in a dazed condition of mind. As I have said, my wife's family was extinct save for herself and Aunt Lucretia, and she remembered so little of her parents, and she looked herself so little like Aunt Lucretia, that it was small wonder that neither of us remarked Uncle David's unlikeness to the family type. We knew that he did not resemble the ideal we had formed of him, and that had been the only consideration we had given to his looks. Now, it took only a moment of reflection to recall the fact that all the members of the family had been tall and shapely, and that even between the ugly ones like Aunt Lucretia and the pretty ones like my wife, there was a certain resemblance. Perhaps it was only the nose. The nose is the brand in most families, I believe, but whatever it was, I had only to see my wife and Aunt Lucretia together to realize that the man who had passed himself off as our Uncle David had not one feature in common with either of them, nor with the one-armed man in the daguerreotype. I was thinking of this, and looking at my wife's troubled face when our aromatic uncle touched me on the arm. I'll explain, he said, to you. You tell her. We dismissed the carriage, went into the house, and sat down. The old gentleman was perfectly cool and collected, but he lit his clay pipe and reflected for a good five minutes before he opened his mouth. Then he began. Finest man in the world, sir. Finest boy in the world. Never anything like him. But peculiarities. Adam. Peculiarities. Wouldn't write home. Wouldn't. Here he hesitated. Sending things home. I had to do it. Did it for him. Didn't want his folks to know. Other peculiarities. Never had any money. Other peculiarities. Drank. Other peculiarities. Ladies. Finest man in the world all the same. Nobody like him. 
kept him right with his folks for thirty-one years, then died, fever, Canton. Never been myself since. Kept right on writing, all the same. Also, here he hesitated again, sending things. Why? Don't know. Been a fool all my life. Never could do anything but make money. No family, no friends. Only him. Ran away to sea to look after him. Did look after him. Thought maybe your wife would be some like him. Barring peculiarities, she is. Getting old. Came here for company. Meant no harm. Didn't calculate on Miss Lucretia. Here he paused and smoked reflectively for a minute or two. Hot in the collar, Miss Lucretia. Haughty. Like him some. Just like she was forty-seven years ago. Slapped my face one day when I was delivering meat because my jumper wasn't clean. Ain't changed a mite. This was the first condensed statement of the case of our aromatic uncle. It was only in reply to patient and, I hope, loving, gentle, and considerate questioning that the whole story came out, at once pitiful and noble, of the poor little butcher boy who ran away to sea to be bodyguard, servant, and friend to the splendid, showy, selfish youth whom he worshipped, whose heartlessness he cloaked for many a long year, who lived upon his bounty and who died in his arms, nursed with a tenderness surpassing that of a brother. And as far as I could find out, ingratitude and contempt had been his only reward. I need not tell you that when I repeated all this to my wife, she ran to the old gentleman's room and told him all the things that I should not have known how to say, that we cared for him, that we wanted him to stay with us, that he was far, far more our uncle than the brilliant, unprincipled scapegrace who had died years before, dead for almost a lifetime to the family who idolized him, and that we wanted him to stay with us as long as kind heaven would let him. But it was of no use. A change had come over our aromatic uncle, which we could both of us see, but could not understand. The duplicity of which he had been guilty weighed on his spirit. The next day he went out for his usual walk, and he never came back. We used every means of search and inquiry, but we never heard back from him until we got this letter from Fu Chi Li. Dear nephew and niece, the present is to inform you that I am enjoying the health that might be expected at my age, and in my condition of body, which is to say bad, I ship you by today's steamer, Pacific Monarch, four dozen jars of ginger, and two dozen ditto preserved oranges, to which I would have added some other comfits, which I proposed offering for your acceptance, if it were not that my physician has forbid me to leave my bed. In case of fatal results from this trying condition, my will, duly attested and made in your favor, will be placed in your hands by Messrs. Smithson and Smithson, my custom brokers, who will also pay all charges on good scent. The health of this place being unfavorably affected by the weather, you are unlikely to hear more from. Dear nephew and niece, your affectionate uncle. And we never did hear more, except for his will, from our aromatic uncle, but our whole house still smells of his love. End of My Aromatic Uncle Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis Section 23 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. The True Story of a Vampire by Eric Stenbock. Vampire stories are generally located in Styria. Mine is also. Styria is by no means a romantic kind of place described by those who have certainly never been there. It is a flat, uninteresting country, 
only celebrated for its turkeys, its capons, and the stupidity of its inhabitants. Vampires generally arrive at night, in carriages drawn by two black horses. Our vampire arrived by the commonplace means of the railway train, and in the afternoon. You must think I am joking, or perhaps that by the word vampire I mean a financial vampire. No, I am quite serious. The vampire of whom I am speaking, who laid waste her hearth and home, was a real vampire. Vampires are generally described as dark, sinister-looking, and singularly handsome. Our vampire was, on the contrary, rather fair, and certainly was not at first sight sinister-looking, and though decidedly attractive in appearance, not what one would call singularly handsome. Yes, he desolated our home, killed my brother, the one object of my adoration, also my dear father. Yet at the same time, I must say that I myself came under the spell of his fascination, and in spite of all, have no ill will towards him now. Doubtless you have read in the papers past some of the Baroness and her beasts. It is to tell how I came to spend most of my useless wealth on an asylum for stray animals that I am writing this. I am old now. What happened then was when I was a little girl of about thirteen. I will begin by describing our household. We were Poles. Our name was Vronsky. We lived in Styria, where we had a castle. Our household was very limited. It consisted, with the exclusion of domestics, of only my father, our governess, a worthy Belgian named Mademoiselle Vonair, my brother and myself. Let me begin with my father. He was old, and both my brother and I were children of his old age. Of my mother I remember nothing. She died in giving birth to my brother, who was only one year, or not as much, younger than himself. Our father was studious, continually occupied in reading books, chiefly on recondite subjects and in all kinds of unknown languages. He had a long white beard, and wore habitually a black velvet skullcap. How kind he was to us! It was more than I could tell. Still, it was not I who was the favorite. His whole heart went out to Gabriel. Gabriel, as we spelt it in Polish. He was always called by the Russian abbreviation Gavril. I mean, of course, my brother, who had a resemblance to the only portrait of my mother, a slight chalk sketch which hung in my father's study. But I was by no means jealous. My brother was and has been the only love of my life. It is for his sake that I am now keeping in Westbourne Park a home for stray cats and dogs. I was at that time, as I said before, a little girl. My name was Carmela. My long, tangled hair was always all over the place and never would comb straight. I was not pretty, at least looking at a photograph of me at that time. I do not think I could describe myself as such. Yet at the same time, when I look at the photograph, I think my expression may have been pleasing to some people. Irregular features, large mouth, and large, wild eyes. I was, by way of being naughty, not so naughty as Gabriel in the opinion of Mademoiselle Vonaire. Mademoiselle Vonaire, I may intercalate, was a wholly excellent person, middle-aged, who really did speak good French, although she was a Belgian, and could also make herself understood in German, which, as you may or may not know, is the current language of Styria. I find it difficult to describe my brother Gabriel. There was something about him strange and superhuman, or perhaps I should rather say praetor-human, something between the animal and the divine. Perhaps the Greek idea of the fawn might illustrate what I mean, but that will not do either. He had large, wild, gazelle-like eyes. His hair, like mine, was in a perpetual tangle. That point he had in common with me, and indeed, as I afterwards heard, our mother having been of gypsy race, it will account for much of the innate wildness there was in our natures. I was wild enough, but Gabriel was much wilder. Nothing would induce him to put on shoes and stockings except on Sundays, when he also allowed his hair to be combed, but only by me. How shall I describe the grace of that lovely mouth, shaped verily en arc d'amour? I always think of the text in the psalm, 
Grace is shed forth on thy lips, therefore has God blessed thee eternally. Lips that seem to exhale the very breath of life. Then that beautiful, lithe, living, elastic form. He could run faster than any deer, spring like a squirrel to the topmost branch of a tree. He might have stood for the sign and symbol of vitality itself. But seldom could he be induced by Mademoiselle Vonaire to learn lessons. But when he did so, he learned with extraordinary quickness. He would play upon every conceivable instrument, holding a violin here, there, and everywhere except the right place, manufacturing instruments for himself out of reeds, even sticks. Mademoiselle Vonaire made futile efforts to induce him to learn to play the piano. I suppose he was what was called spoilt, though merely in the superficial sense of the word. Our father allowed him to indulge in every caprice. One of his peculiarities, when quite a little child, was horror at the sight of meat. Nothing on earth would induce him to taste it. Another thing which was particularly remarkable about him was his extraordinary power over animals. Everything seemed to come tame to his hand. Birds would sit on his shoulder. Then sometimes Mademoiselle Vonaire and I would lose him in the woods. He would suddenly dart away. Then we would find him singing softly or whistling to himself with all manner of woodland creatures around him, hedgehogs, little foxes, wild rabbits, marmots, squirrels, and such like. He would frequently bring these things home with him and insist on keeping them. This strange menagerie was a terror of poor Mademoiselle Vonaire's heart. He chose to live in a little room at the top of a turret, but which, instead of going upstairs, he chose to reach by means of a very tall chestnut tree through the window. But in contradiction of all this, it was his custom to serve every Sunday Mass in the parish church, with hair nicely combed and with white surplice and red cassock. He looked as demure and tamed as possible. Then came the element of the divine. What an expression of ecstasy there was in those glorious eyes. Thus far I have not been speaking about the vampire. However, let me begin with my narrative at last. One day my father had to go to the neighbouring town, as he frequently had. This time he returned accompanied by a guest. The gentleman, he said, had missed his train, through the late arrival of another at our station, which was a junction, and he would therefore, as trains were not frequent in our parts, have had to wait there all night. He had joined in conversation with my father in the too late arriving train from the town, and had consequently accepted my father's invitation to stay the night at our house. But of course, you know, in those out-of-the-way parts, we are almost patriarchal in our hospitality. He was announced into the name of Count Vardalek, the name being Hungarian. But he spoke German well enough, not with the monotonous accentuation of Hungarians, but rather, if anything, with a slight Slavonic intonation. His voice was peculiarly soft and insinuating. We soon afterwards found that he could talk Polish, and Mademoiselle Vonaire vouched for his good French. Indeed, he seemed to know all languages. But let me give my first impressions. He was rather tall, with fair wavy hair, rather long, which accentuated a certain effeminacy about his smooth face. His figure had something, I cannot say what, serpentine about it. The features were refined, and he had long, slender, subtle, magnetic-looking hands, a somewhat long, sinuous nose, a graceful mouth, and an attractive smile, which belied the intense sadness of the expression of the eyes. When he arrived, his eyes were half-closed, indeed they were habitually so, so that I could not decide their colour. He looked worn and wearied. I could not possibly guess his age. Suddenly Gabriel burst into the room. A yellow butterfly was clinging to his hair. He was carrying in his arms a little squirrel. Of course, he was bare-legged as usual. The stranger looked up at his approach. Then I noticed his eyes. They were green. They seemed to dilate and grow larger. Gabriel stood stock still, with a startled look, like that of a bird fascinated by a serpent. But nevertheless, he held out his hand to the newcomer Vardalek, taking his hand. I don't know why I noticed this trivial thing. Pressed the pulse with his forefinger. Suddenly Gabriel darted from the room and rushed upstairs, going to his turret room this time by the staircase instead of the tree. I was in terror of what the Count might think of him. 
Great was my relief when he came down in his velvet Sunday suit and shoes and stockings. I combed his hair and set him generally right. When the stranger came down to dinner, his appearance had somewhat altered. He looked much younger. There was an elasticity of the skin, combined with a delicate complexion rarely to be found in a man. Before, he had struck me as being very pale. Well, at dinner we were all charmed with him, especially my father. He seemed to be thoroughly acquainted with all my father's particular hobbies. Once, when my father was relating some of his military experiences, he said something about a drummer boy who was wounded in battle. His eyes opened completely again and dilated, this time with a particularly disagreeable expression, dull and dead, yet at the same time animated by some horrible excitement. But this was only momentary. The chief subject of his conversation with my father was about certain curious mystical books which my father had just lately picked up, and which he could not make out, but Vardalek seemed completely to understand. At dessert time my father asked him if he were in a great hurry to reach his destination. If not, would he not stay with us a little while? Though our place was out of the way, he would find much that would interest him in his library. He answered, "'I am no hurry.' I have no particular reason for going to that place at all, and if I can be of service to you in deciphering these books, I shall be only too glad. He added with a smile which was very bitter, very, very bitter. You see, I am a cosmopolitan, a wanderer on the face of the earth. After dinner, my father asked him if he played the piano. He said, Yes, I can a little, and he sat down at the piano. Then he played a Hungarian sardas, wild, rhapsodic, wonderful. That is the music which makes men mad. He went on in the same strain. Gabriel stood stock still by the piano, his eyes dilated and fixed, his form quivering. At last he said very slowly, at one particular motive, for want of a better word, you may call it the Relash of a sardis, by which I mean that point where the original quasi-slow movement begins again. Yes, I think I could play that. Then he quickly fetched his fiddle and self-made xylophone, and did, actually alternating the instruments, render the same very well indeed. Vardalik looked at him, and said in a very sad voice, Poor child, you have the soul of music within you. I could not understand why you should seem to commiserate instead of congratulate Gabriel on what certainly showed an extraordinary talent. Gabriel was shy even as the wild animals who had tamed him. Never before had he taken to a stranger. Indeed, as a rule, if any stranger came to the house by any chance, he would hide himself, and I had to bring him up his food to the turret chamber. You may imagine what was my surprise when I saw him walking about hand in hand with Vardalek the next morning, in the garden, talking lively with him, and showing his collection of pet animals, which he had gathered from the woods, and for which we had had to fit up a regular zoological gardens. He seemed utterly under the domination of Vardalek. What surprised us was, for otherwise we liked the stranger, especially for being kind to him, that he seemed, though not noticeably at first, except perhaps to me, who noticed everything with regard to him, to be gradually losing his general health and vitality. He did not become pale as yet, but there was a certain languor about his movements which certainly there was by no means before. My father got more and more devoted to Count Vardalek. He helped him in his studies, and my father would hardly allow him to go away, which he did sometimes. To Trieste, he said. He always came back, bringing us presents of strange oriental jewellery or textures. I knew all kinds of people came to Trieste, orientals included. Still there was a strangeness and magnificence about these things, which I was sure even then could not possibly have come from such a place as Trieste, memorable to me chiefly for its necktie shops. When Vardalek was away, Gabriel was continually asking for him and talking about him. Then at the same time he seemed to regain his old vitality and spirits. Vardalek always returned looking much older, wan and weary. Gabriel would rush to meet him and kiss him on the mouth. Then he gave a slight shiver, and after a little while began to look quite young again. 
Things continued like this for some time. My father would not hear of Vardalex going away permanently. He came to be an intimate of our house. I, indeed, and Mademoiselle Vonaire also, could not help noticing what a difference there was altogether about Gabriel. But my father seemed totally blind to it. One night I had gone downstairs to fetch something which I had left in the drawing-room. As I was going up again I passed Vardalek's room. He was playing on a piano, which had been specially put there for him, one of Chopin's nocturnes, very beautifully. I stopped, leaning on the banisters to listen. Something white appeared on the dark staircase. We believed in ghosts on our part. I was transfixed with terror and clung to the balusters. What was my astonishment to see Gabriel walking slowly down the staircase, his eyes fixed as though in a trance. This terrified me even more than a ghost would. Could I believe my senses? Could that be Gabriel? I simply could not move. Gabriel, clad in his long white nightshirt, came downstairs and opened the door. He left it open. Vardalek still continued playing, but talked as he played. He said, this time speaking in Polish, My darling, I fain would spare thee, for thy life is my life, and I must live. I who would rather die, will God not have any mercy on me? Oh, oh, life, oh, the torture of life. Here he struck one agonized and strange chord, then continued playing softly. Oh, Gabriel, my beloved, my life, yes, life, oh, why life? I am sure this is but a little that I demand of thee. Surely thy superabundance of life can spare little to one who is already dead. No, stay, he said now almost harshly. What must be, must be. Gabriel stood there quite still, with the same fixed, vacant expression in the room. He was evidently walking in his sleep. Vardalek played on, then said, Ah! with a sign of terrible agony. Then very gently, Go now, Gabriel, it is enough. And Gabriel went out of the room and ascended the staircase at the same slow pace, with the same unconscious stare. Vardalek struck the piano, and although he did not play loudly, it seemed as though the strings would break. You never heard music so strange and so heart-rending. I only know I was found by Mademoiselle Vonaire in the morning, in an unconscious state at the foot of the stairs. Was it a dream after all? I am sure now that it was not. I thought then it might be, and said nothing to anyone about it. Indeed, what could I say? Well, to let me cut a long story short, Gabriel, who had never known a moment's sickness in his life, grew ill, and we had to send to Graz for a doctor who could give no explanation of Gabriel's strange illness. Gradual wasting away, he said, absolutely no organic complaint. What could this mean? My father at last became conscious of the fact that Gabriel was ill. His anxiety was fearful. The last trace of grey faded from his hair, and it became quite white. We sent to Vienna for doctors. But all with the same result. Gabriel was generally unconscious, and when conscious only seemed to recognise Vardalek, who sat continually by his bedside, nursing him with the utmost tenderness. One day I was alone in the room, and Vardalek cried suddenly almost fiercely, "'Send for a priest at once, at once!' he repeated. "'It is now almost too late!' Gabriel stretched out his arms spasmodically and put them round Vardalek's neck. This was the only movement he had made for some time. Vardalek bent down and kissed him on the lips. I rushed downstairs, and the priest was sent for. When I came back, Vardalek was not there. The priest administered extreme unction. I think Gabriel was already dead, although we did not think so at the time. Vardalek had utterly disappeared, and when we looked for him he was nowhere to be found, nor have I seen or heard of him since. 
My father died very soon afterwards, suddenly aged and bent down with grief. And so the whole of the Ronsky property came into my sole possession. And here I am, an old woman, generally laughed at for keeping, in memory of Gabriel, an asylum for stray animals. And people do not, as a rule, believe in vampires. End of section 23section twenty four of out of the closet a collection of early lgbtq plus fiction this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by tasha mapes out of the closet a collection of early lgbtq plus fiction the heart's desire by sui sin far she was dainty slender and of waxen pallor her eyes were long and drooping her eyebrows finely arched she had the tiniest golden lily feet and the glossiest black hair her name was li chung o yam and she lived in a sad beautiful old palace surrounded by a sad beautiful old garden situated on a charming island in the middle of a lake this lake was spanned by marble bridges entwined with green creepers, reaching to the mainland. No boats were ever seen on its waters, but the pink lotus lily floated thereon, and swans of marvellous whiteness. Li Chung O Yam wore priceless silks and radiant jewels. The rarest flowers bloomed for her alone. Her food and drink were of the finest flavours, and served in the purest gold and silver plates and goblets. The sweetest music lulled her to sleep. Yet Li Chang Yam was not happy. In the midst of the grandeur of her enchanted palace, she sighed for she knew not what. She is weary of being alone, said one of the attendants. And he who ruled all within the palace save Li Chang Yam said, Bring her a father. A portly old mandarin was brought to Yam. She made humble obeisance, and her august father inquired ceremoniously as to the state of her health but she sighed and was still weary. "'We have made a mistake. It is a mother she needs,' said they. A comely matron, robed in rich silks and waving a beautiful peacock feather fan, was presented to Oyam as her mother. The lady delivered herself of much good advice and wise instruction as to deportment and speech, but Oyam turned herself on her silken cushions and wished to say good-bye to her mother." Then they led O Yam into a courtyard, which was profusely illuminated with brilliant lanterns and flaring torches. There were a number of little boys of about her own age dancing on stilts. One little fellow, dressed all in scarlet and flourishing a small sword, was pointed out to her as her brother. O Yam was amused for a few moments, but in a little while she was tired of the noise and confusion. In despair, they who lived but to please her consulted amongst themselves. Oyam, overhearing them, said, "'Trouble not your minds. I will find my own heart's ease.' Then she called for her carrier dove, and had an attendant bind under its wing a note which she had written. The dove went forth and flew with the note to where a little girl named Ku Yum, with a face as round as a harvest moon and a mouth like a red vine leaf, was hugging a cat to keep her warm, and sucking her finger to prevent her from being hungry.' To this little girl the dove delivered Oyam's message, then returned to its mistress. "'Bring me my dolls and my cats, and attire me in my brightest and best,' cried Oyam. When Ku Yum came slowly over one of the marble bridges towards the palace wherein dwelt Li Chang Oyam, she wore a blue cotton blouse, carried a peg doll in one hand, and her cat in another. Oyam ran to greet her and brought her into the castle hall. Kuyam looked at Oyam, at her radiant apparel, at her cats and her dolls. Ah, she exclaimed, how beautifully you are robed, in the same colors as I. And behold, your dolls and your cats, are they not much like mine? Indeed they are, replied Oyam, lifting carefully the peg doll and patting the rough fur of Kuyam's cat. Then she called her people together and said to them, Behold, I have found my heart's desire. 
a little sister. And forever after, Oyam and Kuyam lived happily together in a glad, beautiful old palace, surrounded by a glad, beautiful old garden on a charming little island in the middle of a lake. End of chapter 24「Section 25 of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Two Gentlemen of Kentucky, Part One by James Lane Allen. The woods are hushed, their music is no more. The leaf is dead, the yearning passed away. New leaf, new life, the days of frost are o'er. New life, new love, to suit the newer day. The woods are hushed. It was near the middle of the afternoon of an autumnal day on the wide grassy plateau of central Kentucky. The eternal power seemed to have quitted the universe and left all nature folded in the calm of the eternal peace. Around the pale blue dome of the heavens a few pearl-colored clouds hung motionless, as though the wind had been withdrawn to other skies. Not a crimson leaf floated downward through the soft, silvery light that filled the atmosphere and created the sense of lonely, unimaginable spaces. This light overhung the far-rolling landscape of field and meadow and wood, crowning with faint radiance the remoter, low-swelling hilltops, and deepening into dreamy half-shadows on their eastern slopes. Nearer, it fell in a white flake on an unstirred sheet of water which lay along the edge of a mass of somber-hued woodland. And nearer still, it touched to spring-like brilliancy a level green meadow on the hither edge of the water, where a group of Durham cattle stood with reversed flanks near the gleaming trunks of some leafless sycamores. Still nearer, it caught the top of the brown foliage of a little bent oak tree, and burned it into a silvery flame. It lit on the back and the wings of a crow, flying heavily in the path of its rays, and made his blackness as white as the breast of a swan. In the immediate foreground, it sparkled in minute gleams along the stalks of the coarse dead weeds that fell away from the legs and the flanks of a white horse, and slanted across the face of the rider and through the ends of his gray hair, which straggled from beneath his soft black hat. The horse, old and patient and gentle, stood with low-stretched neck and closed eyes half asleep in the faint glow of the waning heat, and the rider, the sole human presence in all the field, sat looking across the silent autumnal landscape, sunk in reverie. Both horse and rider seemed but harmonious elements in the panorama of still life, and completed the picture of a closing scene. To the man it was a closing scene. From the rank, fallow field the which he had been riding, he was now surveying, for the last time, the many features of a landscape that had been familiar to him from the beginning of memory. In the afternoon and the autumn of his age, he was about to rend the last ties that bound him to his former life, and, like one who had survived his own destiny, turned his face towards a future that was void of everything he held significant or dear. The Civil War had only the year before reached its ever-memorable close. From where he sat there was not a home in sight, as there was not one beyond the reach of his vision, but had felt its influence. Some of his neighbors had come home from its camps and prisons, aged or altered as though by half a lifetime of years. The bones of some lay whitening on its battlefields. Families reassembled around their hearthstones, spoke in low tones unceasingly of defeat and victory, heroism and death. Suspicion and distrust and estrangement prevailed. Former friends met each other on the turnpikes without speaking. Brothers avoided each other in the streets of the neighboring town. The rich had grown poor. The poor had become rich. 
Many of the latter were preparing to move west. The negroes were drifting blindly hither and thither, deserting the country and flocking to the towns. Even the once united church of his neighborhood was jarred by the unstrung and discordant spirit of the times. At affecting passages in the sermons, men grew pale and set their teeth fiercely. Women suddenly lowered their black veils and rocked to and fro in their pews. For it is always at the bar of conscience, and before the very altar of God, that the human heart is most wrung by a sense of its losses and the memory of its wrongs. The war had divided the people of Kentucky as the false mother would have severed the child. It had not left the old man unscathed. His younger brother had fallen early in the conflict, born to the end of his brief warfare by his impetuous valor. His aged mother had sunk under the tidings of the death of her latest born. His sister was estranged from him by his political differences with her husband. His old family servants, men and women, had left him, and grass and weeds had already grown over the doorsteps of the shut, noiseless cabins. Nay, the whole vast social system of the old regime had fallen, and he was henceforth but a useless fragment of the ruins. All at once his mind turned from the cracked and smoky mirror of the times and dwelt fondly upon the scenes of the past. The silent fields around him seemed again alive with the negroes, singing as they followed the ploughs down the cornrows or swung the cradles through the bearded wheat. Again, in a frenzy of merriment, the strains of the old fiddles issued from the crevices of cabin doors to the rhythmic beat of hands and feet that shook the rafters and the roof. Now he was sitting on his porch, and one little negro was blacking his shoes, another leading a saddle-horse to the stiles, a third bringing his hat, and a fourth handing him a glass of ice-cold sangaree. Or now he lay under the locust-trees in his yard, falling asleep in the drowsy heat of the summer afternoon, while one waved over him a bough of pungent walnut leaves, until he lost consciousness and by and by awoke to find that they both had fallen asleep side by side on the grass, and that the abandoned fly-brush lay full across his face. From where he sat also were seen slopes on which picnics were danced, under the broad shade of maples and elms in June, by those whom death and war had scattered like the transitory leaves that once had sheltered them. In this direction lay the district schoolhouse, where on Friday evenings there were wont to be speeches and debates. In that lay the blacksmith's shop, where of old he and his neighbors had met on horseback of Saturday afternoons, to hear the news, get the mails, discuss elections, and pitch quoits. In the valley beyond stood the church, at which all had assembled on calm Sunday mornings, like the members of one united family. Along with these scenes went many a chastened reminiscence of bridal and funeral and simpler events that had made up the annals of his country life. The reader will have a clearer insight into the character and past career of Colonel Romulus Fields by remembering that he represented a fair type of that social order which had existed in rank perfection over the blue-grass plains of Kentucky during the final decades of the old regime. Perhaps of all agriculturists in the United States, the inhabitants of that region had spent the most nearly idyllic life, on account of the beauty of the climate, the richness of the land, the spacious comfort of their homes, the efficiency of their negroes, and the characteristic contentedness of their dispositions. Thus nature and history combine to make them a peculiar class, a cross between the aristocratic and the bucolic being as simple as shepherds and as proud as kings, and not seldom exhibiting among both men and women types of character which are as remarkable for pure, tender, noble states of feeling as they were commonplace in powers and cultivation of mind. It was upon this luxurious social growth that the war naturally fell as a killing frost, and upon no single specimen with more blighting power than upon Colonel Fields for destiny had quarried and chiseled him, to serve as an ornament in the barbaric temple of human bondage. There were ornaments in that temple, and he was one. 
a slaveholder with southern sympathies, a man educated, not beyond the ideas of his generation, convinced that slavery was an evil, yet seeing no present way of removing it, he had of all things been a model master. As such he had gone on record in Kentucky, and no doubt in a higher court. And as such his efforts had been put forth to secure the passage of many of those milder laws for which his state was distinguished. Often, in those dark days, his face, anxious and sad, was to be seen amid the throng that surrounded the blocks on which slaves were sold at auction, and more than one poor wretch he had bought to save him from separation from his family, or from being sold into southern plantations afterwards riding far and near to find him a home on one of the neighboring farms. But all those days were over. He had but to place the whole picture of the present beside the whole picture of the past to realize what the contrast meant for him. At length he gathered the bridle reins from the neck of his old horse and turned his head homeward. As he rode slowly on, every spot gave up its memories. He dismounted when he came to the cattle and walked among them, stroking their soft flanks and feeling in the palm of his hand the rasp of their salt-loving tongues. On his sideboard at home was many a silver cup which told of premiums on cattle at the great fairs. It was in this very pond that, as a boy, he had learned to swim on a cherry rail. When he entered the woods, the sight of the walnut trees and the hickory nut trees loaded on the topmost branches, gave him a sudden pang. Beyond the woods he came upon the garden, which he had kept as his mother had left it, an old-fashioned garden with an arbor in the center, covered with Isabella grapevines on one side and Catawba on the other, with walks branching thence in four directions, and along them beds of jump-up johnnies, sweet williams, daffodils, sweet peas, larkspur, and thyme, flags and the sensitive plant, celestial and maid's blush roses. He stopped and looked over the fence at the very spot where he had found his mother on the day when the news of the battle came. She had been kneeling, trowel in hand, driving away vigorously at the loamy earth. And, as she saw him coming, had risen and turned towards him her face, with the ancient pink bloom on her clear cheeks and the light of a pure, strong soul in her gentle eyes. Overcome by his emotions, he had blindly faltered out the words, "'Mother! John was among the killed!' For a moment she had looked at him as though stunned by a blow. Then a violent flush had overspread her features, and then an ashen pallor, after which, with a sudden proud dilation of her form as though with joy, she had sunk down like the tenderest of her lily-stalks cut from its root. Beyond the garden he came to the empty cabin and the great woodpile. At this hour it used to be a scene of hilarious activity. The little negroes sitting perched in chattering groups on the topmost logs, or playing leapfrog in the dust, while some picked up baskets of chips or dragged a backlog into the cabins. At last he drew near the wooden stiles and saw the large house of which he was the solitary occupant. What darkened rooms and noiseless halls! What beds, all ready, that nobody now came to sleep in, and cushioned old chairs that nobody rocked! The house and the contents of its attic, presses and drawers could have told much of the history of Kentucky from almost its beginning. For its foundations had been laid by his father near the beginning of the century, and through its doors had passed a long train of forms from the veterans of the Revolution to the soldiers of the Civil War. Old coats hung up in closets, old dresses folded away in drawers, saddle-bags and buckskin leggings, hunting-jackets, powder-horns, and militiamen hats, looms and knitting-needles, snuff-boxes and reticules. What a treasure-house of the past it was! And now the only thing that had the springs of life within its bosom was the great, sweet-voiced clock, whose faithful face had kept unchanged amid all the swift pageantry of changes. 
he dismounted at the stiles and handed the reins to a gray-haired negro, who had hobbled up to receive them with a smile and a gesture of the deepest respect. Peter, he said very simply, I am going to sell the place and move to town. I can't live here any longer. With these words he passed through the yard gate, walked slowly up the broad pavement, and entered the house. Music No More On the disappearing form of the colonel was fixed an ancient pair of eyes, that looked out at him from behind a still more ancient pair of silver-rimmed spectacles, with an expression of indescribable solicitude and love. These eyes were set in the head of an old gentleman, for such he was, named Peter Cotton, who was the only one of the colonel's former slaves that had remained inseparable from his person and his altered fortunes. In early manhood Peter had been a woodchopper, but he had one day had his leg broken by the limb of a falling tree, and afterwards, out of consideration for his limp, had been made supervisor of the woodpile, gardener, and a sort of nondescript servitor of his master's luxurious needs. Nay, in larger and deeper characters must his history be writ, he having been, in days gone by, one of those ministers of the gospel whom conscientious Kentucky masters often urged to the exercise of spiritual functions in behalf of their benighted people. In course of preparation for this august work, Peter had learned to read, and had come to possess a well-chosen library of three several volumes, Webster's Spelling Book, The Pilgrim's Progress, and The Bible. But even these unusual acquisitions he deemed not enough for, being touched with a spark of poetic fire from heaven, and fired by the African's fondness for all that is conspicuous in dress, he had conceived for himself the creation of a unique garment, which should symbolize in perfection the claims and consolations of his apostolic office. This was nothing less than a sacred blue-jeans coat that he had had his old mistress make him, with very long and spacious tails, whereon, at his further direction, she embroidered sundry texts of Scripture which it pleased him to regard as the fit visible enunciations of his holy calling. And inasmuch as his mistress, who had had the coat woven on her own looms from the wool of her finest sheep, was, like other gentlewomen of her time, rarely skilled in the accomplishments of the needle, and was, moreover, in full sympathy with the piety of his intent, she wrought of these passages a border enriched with such intricate curves, marvellous flourishes, and harmonious letterings, that Solomon never reflected the glory in which Peter was arrayed whenever he put it on. For after much prayer that the Almighty Wisdom would aid his reason in the difficult task of selecting the most appropriate texts, Peter had chosen seven, one for each day in the week with such tact, and no doubt heavenly guidance, that when braided together they did truly constitute an eloquent epitome of Christian duty, hope, and pleading. From the first to last they were as follows. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they toil not, neither do they spin. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This concatenation of texts Peter wished to have duly solemnized, and therefore, when the work was finished, he further requested his mistress to close the entire chain with the word Amen, introduced in some suitable place. But the only spot now left vacant was one of a few square inches, located just where the coat-tails hung over the end of Peter's spine, so that when anyone stood full in Peter's rear, he could but marvel at the sight of so solemn a word emblazoned in so unusual a locality. Panoplied in this robe of righteousness, 
and with a worn leathern Bible in his hand, Peter used to go around of Sundays, and during the week by night, preaching from cabin to cabin the gospel of his heavenly master. The angriest lightnings of the sultriest skies often played amid the darkness upon those sacred coattails and around that girdle of everlasting texts, as though the evil spirits of the air would fain have burned them and scattered their ashes on the roaring winds. The slowly sifting snows of winter whitened them as though to chill their spiritual fires. But winter and summer, year after year, in weariness of body, often in sore distress of mind, for miles along this lonely road and for miles across that rugged way, Peter trudged on and on, withal perhaps as meek a spirit as ever grew footsore in the paths of its master. Many a poor overburdened slave took fresh heart and strength from the sight of that celestial raiment. Many a stubborn, rebellious spirit, whose flesh but lately quivered under the lash, was brought low by its humble teaching. Many a worn-out old frame, racked with pain in its last illness, pressed a fevered lip to its hopeful hem, and many a dying eye closed in death peacefully fixed on its immortal pledges. When Peter started abroad, if a storm threatened, he carried an old cotton umbrella of immense size, and as the storm burst, he gathered the tails of his coat carefully up under his armpits that they might be kept dry or if caught by a tempest without his umbrella, he would take his coat off and roll it up inside out, leaving his body exposed to the fury of the elements. No care, however, could keep it from growing old and worn and faded. And when the slaves were set free, and he was called upon by the interposition of Providence to lay it finally aside, it was covered by many a patch and stain as proofs of its devoted usage. One after another, the colonel's old servants, gathering their children about them, had left him, to begin their new life. He bade them all a kind good-bye, and into the palm of each silently pressed some gift that he knew would soon be needed. But no inducement could make Peter or Phyllis, his wife, budge from their cabin. "'Go, Peter, go, Phyllis,' the colonel had said time and again. No one is happier that you are free than I am, and you can call on me for what you need to set you up in business." But Peter and Phyllis asked to stay with him. Then, suddenly, several months before the time at which this sketch opens, Phyllis had died, leaving the Colonel and Peter as the only relics of that populous life which once had filled the house and the cabins. The Colonel had succeeded in hiring a woman to do Phyllis's work but her presence was a strange note of discord in the old domestic harmony, and only saddened the recollections of its vanished peace. Peter had a short, stout figure, dark brown skin, smooth-shaven face, eyes round, deep-set, and wide apart, and a short stub nose which dipped suddenly into his head, making it easy for him to wear the silver-rimmed spectacles left him by his old mistress. A peculiar conformation of the muscles between the eyes and the nose gave him the quizzical expression of one who is about to sneeze, and this was heightened by a twinkle in the eyes which seemed caught from the shining of an inner sun upon his tranquil heart. Sometimes, however, his face grew sad enough. It was sad on this afternoon while he watched the colonel walk slowly up the pavement, well overgrown with weeds, and enter the house which the setting sun touched with the last radiance of the finished day. NEW LIFE About two years after the close of the war, therefore, the Colonel and Peter were to be found in Lexington, ready to turn over a new leaf in the volumes of their lives, which already had an old-fashioned binding, a somewhat musty odor, and but few unwritten leaves remaining. After a long dry summer you may have seen two gnarled old apple-trees that stood with interlocked arms on the western slope of some quiet hillside, make a melancholy show of blooming out again in the autumn of the year and dallying with the idle buds that mock their sapless branches. Much the same was the belated fruitless efflorescence of the Colonel and Peter. 
the Colonel had no business habits, no political ambition, no wish to grow richer. He was too old for society and without near family ties. For some time he wandered through the streets like one lost, sick with yearning for the fields and woods, for his cattle, for familiar faces. He haunted Cheapside and the courthouse square, where the farmers always assembled when they came to town. And if his eye lighted on one, he would buttonhole him on the street corner and lead him into a grocery and sit down for a quiet chat. Sometimes he would meet an aimless, melancholy wanderer like himself, and the two would go off and discuss over and over again their departed days, and several times he came unexpectedly upon some of his old servants who had fallen into bitter want, and who more than repaid him for the help he gave by contrasting the hardships of a life of freedom with the ease of their shackled years. In the course of time he could but observe that human life in the town was reshaping itself slowly and painfully, but with resolute energy. The colossal structure of slavery had fallen, scattering its ruins far and wide over the state. But out of the very debris was being taken the material to lay the deeper foundations of the new social edifice. Men and women as old as he were beginning life over and trying to fit themselves for it by changing the whole attitude and habit of their minds, by taking on a new heart and spirit. But when a great building falls there is always some rubbish and the colonel and others like him were part of this. Henceforth they possessed only an antiquarian sort of interest, like the stamped bricks of Nebuchadnezzar. Nevertheless he made a show of doing something, and in a year or two opened on Cheapside a store for the sale of hardware and agricultural implements. He knew more about the latter than anything else, and furthermore he secretly felt that a business of this kind would enable him to establish in town a kind of headquarters for the farmers. His account books were to be kept on a system of twelve months' credit, and he resolved that if one of his customers couldn't pay then it would make no difference. Business began slowly. The farmers dropped in and found a good lounging place. On county court days, which were great market days for the sale of sheep, horses, mules and cattle in front of the colonel's door, they swarmed in from the hot sun, and sat around on the counter and the plows and machines till the entrance was blocked to other customers. When a customer did come in, the colonel, who was probably talking with some old acquaintance, would tell him just to look around and pick out what he wanted and the price would be all right. If one of those acquaintances asked for a pound of nails, the colonel would scoop up some ten pounds and say, "'I reckon that's about a pound, Tom.' He had never seen a pound of nails in his life, and if one had been weighed on his scales he would have said the scales were wrong. He had no great idea of commercial dispatch. One morning a lady came in for some carpet tacks, an article that he had forgotten to lay in but he at once set off an order for enough to have tacked a carpet pretty well all over Kentucky. And when they came, two weeks later, he told Peter to take her up a dozen papers with his compliments. He had laid in, however, an ample and especially fine assortment of pocket-knives, for that instrument had always been to him one of the gracious and very winning qualities. Then when a friend dropped in he would say, "'General, don't you need a new pocket-knife?' and taking one out, would open all the blades and commend the metal and the handle. The general would inquire the price, and the colonel, having shut the blades, would hand it to him, saying in a careless, fond way, "'I reckon I won't charge you anything for that.' His mind could not come down to the low level of such ignoble barter, and he gave away the whole case of knives. These were the pleasanter aspects of his business life, which did not lack as well its tedium and crosses. Thus there were many dark stormy days when no one he cared to see came in. And he then became rather a pathetic figure, wandering absently around amid the symbols of his past activity, and stroking the plows like dumb companions. Or he would stand at the door and look across at the old courthouse, where he had seen many a slave sold and had listened to the great Kentucky orators. But what hurt him most 
was the talk of the new farming and the abuse of the old, which he was forced to hear. And he generally refused to handle the improved implements and mechanical devices by which labor and waste were to be saved. Altogether, he grew tired of the thing and sold out at the end of the year, with a loss of over a thousand dollars, though he insisted he had done a good business. As he was then seen much on the streets again and several times heard to make remarks in regard to the sidewalks, gutters and crossings, when they happened to be in bad condition, the daily press one morning published a card stating that if Colonel Romulus Fields would consent to make the race for mayor, he would receive the support of many Democrats, adding a tribute to his virtues and his influential past. It touched the Colonel, and he walked downtown with a rather commanding figure the next morning. But it pained him to see how many of his acquaintances returned his salutations very coldly, and just as he was passing the northern bank he met the young opposition candidate, a little red-haired fellow, walking between two ladies, with a rosebud in his buttonhole, who refused to speak at all but made the ladies laugh by some remark he uttered as the colonel passed. The card had been inserted humorously, but he took it seriously, and when his friends found this out they rallied round him. The day of election drew near. They told him he must buy votes. He said he wouldn't buy a vote to be mayor of the New Jerusalem. They told him he must mix and treat. He refused. Foreseeing he had no chance, they besought him to withdraw. He said he would not. They told him he wouldn't poll twenty votes. He replied that one would satisfy him, provided it was neither begged nor bought. When his defeat was announced, he accepted it as another evidence that he had no part in the present, no chance of redeeming his idleness. A sense of this weighed heavily on him at times but it is not likely that he realized how pitifully he was undergoing a moral shrinkage in consequence of mere disuse. Actually, extinction had set in with him long prior to dissolution, and he was dead years before his heart ceased beating. The very basic virtues on which had rested his once spacious and stately character were now but the moldy cornerstones of a crumbling ruin. It was a subtle evidence of deterioration in manliness that he had taken to dress. When he had lived in the country, he had never dressed up unless he came to town. When he had moved to town, he thought he must remain dressed up all the time. And this fact first fixed his attention on a matter which afterwards began to be loved for its own sake. Usually he wore a derby hat, a black diagonal coat, gray trousers, and a white necktie but the article of attire in which he took chief pleasure was hose, and the better to show the gay colors of these he wore low-cut shoes of the finest calfskin, turned up at the toes. Thus his feet kept pace with the present, however far his head may have lagged in the past. And it may be that this stream of fresh fashions, flowing perennially over his lower extremities like water about the roots of a tree, kept him from drying up altogether. Peter always polished his shoes with too much blacking, perhaps thinking that the more the blacking the greater the proof of love. He wore his clothes about a season and a half, having several suits, and then passed them on to Peter, who, foreseeing the joy of such an inheritance, bought no new ones. In the act of transferring them, the colonel made no comment until he came to the hose, from which he seemed unable to part without a final tribute of esteem, as these are fine, Peter, or, Peter, these are nearly as good as new." Thus Peter too was dragged through the whims of fashion. To have seen the colonel walking about his grounds and garden followed by Peter, just a year and a half behind in dress and a yard and a half behind in space, one might well have taken the rear figure for the colonel's double, slightly the worse for wear, somewhat shrunken and cast into a heavy shadow. Time hung so heavily on his hands at night that, with a happy inspiration, he added a dress suit to his wardrobe, and accepted the first invitation to an evening party. He grew excited as the hour approached, and dressed in a great fidget for fear he should be too late. "'How do I look, Peter?' he inquired at length, surprised at his own appearance. 
"'Splendid, Marcerom,' replied Peter, bringing in the shoes with more blacking on them than ever before. "'I think,' said the Colonel, apologetically, "'I think I'd look better if I put a little powder on. I don't know what makes me so red in the face.' But his heart began to sink before he reached his hostesses, and he had a fearful sense of being the observed of all observers as he slipped through the hall and passed rapidly up to the gentlemen's room. He stayed there after the others had gone down, bewildered and lonely, dreading to go down himself. By and by the musician struck up a waltz, and with a little cracked laugh at his own performance he cut a few shines of an unremembered pattern but his ankle snapped audibly, and he suddenly stopped with a thought of what Peter would say if he should catch him at these antics. Then he boldly went downstairs. He had touched the new human life around him at various points. As he now stretched out his arms toward its society, for the first time he completely realized how far removed it was from him. Here he saw a younger generation, the flowers of the new social order, sprung from the very soil of fraternal battlefields, but blooming together as the emblems of oblivious peace. He saw fathers, who had fought madly on opposite sides, talking quietly in corners as they watched their children dancing, or heard them toasting their old generals and their campaigns over their champagne in the supper-room. He was glad of it. But it made him feel, at the same time, that instead of treading the velvety floors, he ought to step up and take his place among the canvases of old-time portraits that looked down from the walls. The dancing he had done had been not under the blinding glare of gaslight, but by the glimmer of tallow-dips and star-candles and the ruddy glow of cavernous firesides, not to the accompaniment of an orchestra of wind instruments and strings, but to a chorus of girls' sweet voices, as they trod simpler measures, or to the maddening sway of a grey-haired negro fiddler standing on a chair in the chimney-corner. Still, it is significant to note that his saddest thought, long after leaving, was that his shirt-bosom had not lain down smooth, but stuck out like a huge cracked eggshell, and that, when in imitation of the others, he had laid his white silk handkerchief across his bosom inside his vest, it had slipped out during the evening and had been found by him on confronting a mirror, flapping over his stomach like a little white masonic apron. "'Did you have a nice time, Marzeron?' inquired Peter, as they drove home through the darkness. "'Splendid time, Peter, splendid time,' replied the Colonel nervously. "'Did you dance any, Marzeron?' "'I didn't dance. Oh, I could have danced if I'd wanted to, but I didn't. Peter helped the colonel out of the carriage with pitying gentleness when they reached home. It was the first and only party. Peter also had been finding out that his occupation was gone. Soon after moving to town he had tendered his pastoral services to one of the fashionable churches of the city, not because it was fashionable, but because it was made up of his brethren. In reply he was invited to preach a trial sermon which he did with gracious unction. It was a strange scene, as one calm Sunday morning he stood on the edge of the pulpit, dressed in a suit of the colonel's old clothes, with one hand in his trousers pocket, and his lame leg set a little forward at an angle, familiar to those who know the statues of Henry Clay. How self-possessed he seemed, yet with what a rush of memories did he pass his eyes slowly over that vast assemblage of his emancipated people! With what feelings must he have contrasted those silk hats and walking-canes and broadcloths, those gloves and satins, laces and feathers, jewelry and fans, that whole many-colored panorama of life, with the weary, sad and sullen audiences, that had often heard him of old under the forest trees or by the banks of some turbulent stream! In a voice husky, but heard beyond the flirtation of the uttermost pew, he took his text. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. From this he tried to preach a new sermon, suited to the newer day. But several times the thoughts of the past were too much for him, and he broke down with emotion. 
The next day a grave committee waited on him and reported that the sense of the congregation was to call a colored gentleman from Louisville. Private objections to Peter were that he had a broken leg, wore Colonel Fields's second-hand clothes, which were too big for him, preached in the old-fashioned way, and lacked self-control and repose of manner. Peter accepted his rebuff as sweetly as Socrates might have done. Humming the burden of an old hymn, he took his righteous coat from a nail in the wall and folded it away in a little brass-nailed deerskin trunk, laying over it the spell-book and the Pilgrim's Progress, which he had ceased to read. Thenceforth his relations to his people were never intimate, and even from the other servants of the Colonel's household he stood apart. But the Colonel took Peter's rejection greatly to heart, and the next morning gave him the new silk socks he had worn at the party. In paying his servants the Colonel would sometimes say, Peter, I reckon I better begin to pay you a salary. That's the style now. But Peter would turn off, saying he didn't have no use for no salary. Thus both of them dropped more and more out of life, but as they did so, drew more and more closely to each other. The Colonel had bought a home on the edge of town, with some ten acres of beautiful ground surrounding. A high Osage orange hedge shut it in and forest trees, chiefly maples and elms, gave to the lawn and house abundant shade. Wild grapevines, the Virginia creeper, and the climbing oak swung their long festoons from summit to summit, while honeysuckles, clematis, and the Mexican vine clambered over arbors and trellises, or along the chipped stone of the low, old-fashioned house. Just outside the door of the colonel's bedroom slept an ancient, broken sundial. The place seemed always in half-shadow, with hedgerows of box, clumps of dark holly, darker firs half a century old, and aged, crepe-like cedars. It was in the seclusion of this retreat, which looked almost like a wild bit of country set down on the edge of town, that the Colonel and Peter spent more of their time as they fell farther in the rear of onward events. There were no such flower-gardens in the city and pretty much the whole town went thither for its flowers, preferring them to those that were to be had for a price at the nurseries. There was, perhaps, a suggestion of pathetic humor in the fact that it should have called on the Colonel and Peter, themselves so nearly defunct, to furnish the flowers for so many funerals. But it is certain, almost weakly, the two old gentlemen received this chastening admonition of their all but spent mortality. The colonel cultivated the rarest fruits also, and had under glass varieties that were not friendly to the climate, so that by means of the fruits and flowers there was established a pleasant social bond with many who otherwise would never have sought them out. But others came for better reasons. To a few deep-seeing eyes the colonel and Peter were ruined landmarks on a fading historic landscape and their devoted friendship was the last steady burning down of that pure flame of love which can never again shine out in the future of the two races. Hence a softened charm invested the drowsy quietude of that shadowy paradise in which the old master without a slave and the old slave without a master still kept up a brave pantomime of their obsolete relations. No one ever saw in their intercourse aught but the finest courtesy, the most delicate consideration. The very tones of their voices in addressing each other were as good as sermons on gentleness, their antiquated playfulness as melodious as the babble of distant water. To be near them was to be exercised of evil passions. The sun of their day had indeed long since set. But like twin clouds lifted high and motionless into some far quarter of the gray twilight skies, they were still radiant with the glow of the invisible orb. Henceforth the colonel's appearances in public were few and regular. He went to church on Sundays, where he sat on the edge of the choir in the center of the building, and sang an ancient bass of his own improvisation to the older hymns, and glanced furtively around to see whether anyone noticed that he could not sing the new ones. At the Sunday school picnics, the committee of arrangements allowed him to carve the mutton, 
and after dinner to swing the smallest children gently beneath the trees. He was seen on commencement day at Morrison Chapel, where he always gave his bouquet to the valedictorian. It was the speech of that young gentleman that always touched him, consisting as it did of farewells. In the autumn he might sometimes be noticed sitting high up in the amphitheater at the fair, a little blue around the nose, and looking absently over into the ring where the judges were grouped around the music-stand. Once he had strutted around as a judge himself, with a blue ribbon in his buttonhole while the band played Sweet Alice, Ben Bolt, and Gentle Annie. The ring seemed full of young men now, and no one even thought of offering him the privileges of the grounds. In his day the great feature of the exhibition had been the cattle. Now everything was turned into a horse-show. He was always glad to get home again to Peter, his true yoke-fellow. For just as two old oxen, one white and one black, that have long toiled under the same yoke, will, when turned out to graze at last in the widest pasture, come and put themselves horn to horn and flank to flank, so the colonel and Peter were never so happy as when ruminating side by side. End of section 25「Of Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Two Gentlemen of Kentucky, Part Two, by James Lane Allen. New Love in their eventless life the slightest incident acquired the importance of a history. Thus, one day in June, Peter discovered a young couple love-making in the shrubbery, and with the deepest agitation reported the fact to the colonel. Never before, probably, had the fluttering of the dear god's wings brought more dismay than to these ancient involuntary guardsmen of his hiding-place. The colonel was at first for breaking up what he considered a piece of underhand proceedings, but Peter reasoned stoutly that, if the pair were driven out, they would simply go to some other retreat. And without getting the approval of his conscience to this view, the colonel contented himself with merely repeating that they ought to go straight and tell the girl's parents. Those parents lived just across the street outside his grounds. The young lady he knew very well himself having, a few years before, given her the privilege of making herself at home among his flowers. It certainly looked hard to drive her out now, just when she was making the best possible use of his kindness and her opportunity. Moreover, Peter walked down the street and ascertained that the young fellow was an energetic farmer living a few miles from town, and son of one of the colonel's former friends, on both of which accounts the latter's heart went out to him. So when, a few days later, the colonel, followed by Peter, crept up breathlessly and peeped through the bushes at the pair strolling along the shady perfumed walks, and so plainly happy that happiness which comes but once in a lifetime, they not only abandoned the idea of betraying the secret, but afterwards kept away from that part of the grounds, lest they should be an interruption. Peter, stammered the colonel, who had been trying to get the words out for three days, do you suppose he has already asked her? Some's powerful quick on the trigger, and some's mighty slow, replied Peter neutrally. And some, he added exhaustively, don't use the trigger at all. I always thought there had to be asking done by somebody, remarked the colonel a little vaguely. I never asked Phyllis, exclaimed Peter with a certain air of triumph. Did Phyllis ask you, Peter? inquired the colonel, blushing and confidential. No, no, Marse Rome. I couldn't er stand that from no woman, replied Peter, laughing and shaking his head. The colonel was sitting on the stone steps in front of the house, and Peter stood below, leaning against a Corinthian column, hat in hand, as he went on to tell his love story. It all happened this way, Marse Rome. We was gwine to have prayer meetin' and I allowed to walk home with Phyllis and axed her on the road. 
I been lowin' to ask her heaps of times before, but I ain't just never done so. So, I says to myself, says I, I just make my sermon tonight kind of lead her up to what I gwine to tell Phyllis on the road home. So I took my text from the left tail of my coat. The greatest of these is charity, cause I know charity was same as love. And all the time I was preaching and glorifying charity and identifying charity with love, I couldn't help thinking about what I gwine say to Phyllis on the road home. That make me feel better and the better I feel, the better I preach. So I hit bound to make my hearers feel better likewise, Phyllis mung em. So Phyllis she just sat there listening and listening and looking like we was already on the road home, till I got so worked up in my feelings I just knowed the time was come. By and by I had no more than done preaching and was looking round to get my Bible and my hat, for up popped that big charity green, who been sitting alongside of Phyllis on taking every last thing I said to herself. And she took hold of my hand and squeezed it, and said she felt most like shouting. And fo I knowed it, I just see Phyllis wrap her shawl round her head and turn up her nose at me right quick and flip out the dough. The dogs how mighty moanful when I walk home by myself that night, added Peter, laughing to himself. Then I ain't preached that sermon no more till Adam me and Phyllis was married. It was a long time, he continued, for Phyllis come to hear me preach any more. But long bout the next fall we had big meetin', and heap more em joined. But Phyllis, she ain't never joined yet. I preach mighty now all round my coat tails till I say to myself, there ain't but one text left, and I just got to fetch her with that. The text was on the right tail of my coat. Come unto me, all ye that labor in is heavy laden. It was a very momentous sermon, and all long I just see Phyllis wrestling with herself, and I say, She got to come this night, the Lord he pine me. And I had no more than said the word, for she just walked down and give me her hand. Then we have had the baptizing in Elkhorn Creek and the water was deep and the current tolerable swift. It looked to me like there was five hundred of them on the creek side. By and by I stood on the edge of the water, and Phyllis she come down to let me baptize her. And me and her and giant hands and waded out in the creek, mighty slow, cause Phyllis she didn't have no shot round the bottom of her dress, and it kept bobbing on top the water till I push it down. But by and by we got way out in the creek, and both of us was trembling. And I says to her very kindly, When I put you under the water, Phyllis, you must try and hold yourself stiff so I can lift you up easy. But I had more than just laid her back over the water, ready to souse her under, when her feet flew up off the bottom of the creek, and when I retched out to fetch her up, I stepped in a hole. And fo I knowed it, we was floundering round in the water and the hymn they were singing on the bank sounded mighty confused like. And Phyllis, she swallowed some water, and all twanced, she just grabbed me right tight round the neck, and say mighty quick, say she, I gwan marry whoever gets me out in this here water. And by and by, when me and her was walking up the bank of the creek, dripping all over, I says to her, says I, does you remember what you said back yonder in the water, Phyllis? I ain't out in no water yet, says she, very contemptuous. When does you consider yourself out in the water, says I, very humble. When I get these soaking clothes off in my back, says she. It was good dark when we got home, and after a while I crope up to the door of Phyllis's cabin and put my eye down to the keyhole, and see Phyllis just sitting fold them blazing walnut logs dressed up in her new red linsey dress and her eyes shining. And I shuck so, I am most faint. Then I tap easy on the door, and say in a mighty trembling tone, says I, Is you out in the water yet, Phyllis? I got on dry dress, says she. Does you remember what you said back yonder in the water, Phyllis? says I. The latch string on the outside the door, says she, mighty soft. And... I walked in. 
As Peter drew near the end of this reminiscence, his voice sank to a key of inimitable tenderness. And when it was ended, he stood a few minutes, scraping the gravel with the toe of his boot, his head dropped forward. Then he added huskily, Phyllis been dead heap o' years now, and turned away. This recalling of the scenes of a time long gone by may have awakened in the breast of the colonel some gentle memory, for after Peter was gone he continued to sit a while in silent musing. Then, getting up, he walked in the falling twilight across the yard and through the gardens until he came to a secluded spot in the most distant corner. There he stooped, or rather knelt down, and passed his hands, as though with mute benediction, over a little bed of old-fashioned china pinks. When he had moved in from the country, he had brought nothing away from his mother's garden but these, and in all the years since no one had ever pulled them, as Peter well knew. For one day the colonel had said, with his face turned away, Let them have all the flowers they want, but leave the pinks. He continued kneeling over them now, touching them softly with his fingers, as though they were the fragrant, never-changing symbols of voiceless communion with his past. Still, it may have been only the early dew of the evening that glistened on them when he rose and slowly walked away, leaving the pale moonbeams to haunt the spot. Certainly, after this day, he showed increasing concern in the young lovers, who were holding clandestine meetings in his grounds. Peter, he would say, why, if they love each other, don't they get married? Something may happen. I've been spectin' something to happen for some time, as they've been quarrelin' right smart lately, replied Peter, laughing. Whether or not he was justified in this prediction, before the end of another week the colonel read a notice of their elopement and marriage and several days later he came up from downtown and told Peter that everything had been forgiven the younger pair, who had gone to housekeeping in the country. It gave him pleasure to think he had helped to perpetuate the race of bluegrass farmers. The yearning passed away. It was in the twilight of a late autumn day in the same year that nature gave the colonel the first direct intimation to prepare for the last summons. They had been passing along the garden walks, where a few pale flowers were trying to flourish up to the very winter's edge, and where the dry leaves had gathered unswept and rustled beneath their feet. All at once the colonel turned to Peter, who was a yard and a half behind as usual, and said, "'Give me your arm, Peter.' I feel tired." And thus the two, for the first time in all their lifetime walking abreast, passed slowly on. "'Peter,' said the colonel gravely, a minute or two later, "'we are like two dried-up stalks of fodder. I wonder the Lord lets us live any longer. I reckon he's managing to use us some way, or we wouldn't be here,' said Peter. Well, all I have to say is that if he's using me, he can't be in much of a hurry for his work," replied the colonel. He uses snails, and I know we ain't as slow as them," argued Peter composedly. I don't know. I think a snail must have made more progress since the war than I have. The idea of his uselessness seemed to weigh on him. For a little later he remarked, with a sort of mortified smile, "'Do you think, Peter, that we would pass for what they call representative men of the New South?' "'We done had our day, Marsa Rom,' replied Peter. "'We got to pass for what we was. Maybe the Lord's got no more use for us yet than people has,' he added after a pause. From this time on the colonel's strength gradually failed him, but it was not until the following spring that the end came. A night or two before his death his mind wandered backward, after the familiar manner of the dying, and his delirious dream showed the shifting, faded pictures that renewed themselves for the last time on his lasting memory. 
It must have been that he was once more amid the scenes of his active farm life, for his broken snatches of talk ran thus. "'Come, boys, get your cradles. Look where the sun is. You are late getting to work this morning. That is the finest field of wheat in the county. Be careful about the bundles. Make them the same size and tie them tight. That swath is too wide, and you don't hold your cradle right, Tom. Sell Peter? Sell Peter cotton? No, sir. You might buy me some day and work me in your cotton field, but as long as he's mine, you can't buy Peter, and you can't buy any of my negroes. Boys, boys, if you don't work faster, you won't finish this field today. You better go in the shade and rest now. The sun's very hot. Don't drink too much ice water. There's a jug of whiskey in the fence corner. Give them a good dram around, and tell them to work slow till the sun gets lower." Once during the night a sweet smile played over his features as he repeated a few words that were part of an old rustic song and dance. Arranged, not as they came broken and incoherent from his lips, but as he once had sung them, they were as follows. O oh, Sister Phoebe, how merry were we when we sat under the juniper tree, the juniper tree, hi-ho! Put this hat on your head, keep your head warm, take a sweet kiss, it will do you no harm, do you no harm, I know." After this he sank into a quieter sleep, but soon stirred with a look of intense pain. "'Helen, Helen,' he murmured, "'will you break your promise? Have you changed in your feelings towards me? I have brought you the pinks. Won't you take the pinks, Helen?' Then he sighed as he added, "'It wasn't her fault. If she had only known!' Who was the Helen of that faraway time? Was this the Colonel's love story? But during all the night, whithersoever his mind wandered, at intervals it returned to the burden of a single strain, the harvesting. Towards daybreak he took it up again for the last time. Oh, boys, boys, boys! If you don't work faster, you won't finish the field today. Look how low the sun is. I'm going to the house. They can't finish the field today. Let them do what they can, but don't let them work late. I want Peter to go to the house with me. Tell him to come on." In the faint gray of the morning, Peter, who had been watching by the bedside all night, stole out of the room, and going into the garden, pulled a handful of pinks, a thing he had never done before, and, re-entering the colonel's bedroom, put them in a vase near his sleeping face. Soon afterwards the colonel opened his eyes and looked around him. At the foot of the bed stood Peter, and on one side sat the physician and a friend. The night lamp burned low, and through the folds of the curtains came the white light of early day. "'Put out the lamp and open the curtains,' he said feebly. "'It's day.' When they had drawn the curtains aside, his eyes fell on the pinks, sweet and fresh with the dew on them. He stretched out his hand and touched them caressingly, and his eyes sought Peter's with a look of grateful understanding. I want to be alone with Peter for a while," he said, turning his face towards the others. When they were left alone, it was some minutes before anything was said. Peter, not knowing what he did, but knowing what was coming, had gone to the window and hid himself behind the curtains, drawing them tightly around his form as though to shroud himself from sorrow. At length the colonel said, "'Come here!' Peter almost staggering forward, fell at the foot of the bed, and clasping the colonel's feet with one arm, pressed his cheek against them. "'Come closer!' Peter crept on his knees and buried his head on the colonel's thigh. "'Come up here, closer!' And putting one arm around Peter's neck, he laid the other hand softly on his head, and looked long and tenderly into his eyes. "'I've got to leave you, Peter. Don't you feel sorry for me?' "'Oh, Marsa Rome!' cried Peter, hiding his face, his whole form shaken by sobs. 
Peter, added the colonel with ineffable gentleness, if I had served my master as faithfully as you have served yours, I should not feel ashamed to stand in his presence. If my master is as merciful to me as you have been, I have fixed things so that you will be comfortable after I am gone. When your time comes, I should like you to be laid close to me. We can take the long sleep together. Are you willing? That's where I want to be laid. The colonel stretched out his hand to the vase, and taking the bunch of pinks, said very calmly, Leave these in my hand. I'll carry them with me. A moment more, and he added, If I shouldn't wake up any more, good-bye, Peter. Good-bye, Marcerome. And they shook hands a long time. After this the colonel lay back on the pillows. His soft, silvery hair contrasted strongly with his childlike, unspoiled, open face. To the day of his death, as is apt to be true of those who have lived pure lives but never married, he had a boyish strain in him, a softness of nature, showing itself even now in the gentle expression of his mouth. His brown eyes had in them the same boyish look when, just as he was falling asleep, he scarcely opened them to say, Pray, Peter." Peter, on his knees, and looking across the colonel's face towards the open door, through which the rays of the rising sun streamed in upon his hoary head, prayed, while the colonel fell asleep, adding a few words for himself, now left alone. Several hours later memory led the colonel back again through the dim gateway of the past, and out of that gateway his spirit finally took flight into the future. Peter lingered a year. The place went to the colonel's sister, but he was allowed to remain in his quarters. With much thinking of the past, his mind fell into a lightness and a weakness. Sometimes he would be heard crooning the burden of old hymns, or sometimes seen sitting beside the old brass-nailed trunk, fumbling with the spelling-book and the pilgrim's progress. Often, too, he walked out to the cemetery on the edge of town and each time could hardly find the colonel's grave amid the multitude of the dead. One gusty day in spring, the Scotch sexton, busy with the blades of bluegrass springing from the animated mold, saw his familiar figure standing motionless beside the colonel's resting place. He had taken off his hat, one of the colonel's last bequests, and laid it on the colonel's headstone. On his body he wore a strange coat of faded blue patched and weather-stained, and so moth-eaten that parts of the curious tales had dropped entirely away. In one hand he held an open Bible, and on a much-soiled page he was pointing with his finger to the following words, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. It would seem that, impelled by love and faith, and guided by his wandering reason, he had come forth to preach his last sermon on the immortality of the soul over the dust of his dead master. The sexton led him home, and soon afterwards a friend, who had loved them both, laid him beside the colonel. It was perhaps fitting that his winding-sheet should be the vestment in which, years agone, he had preached to his fellow-slaves in bondage. For if it so be that the dead of this planet shall come forth from their graves clad in the trappings of mortality, then Peter should arise on the resurrection day wearing his old jeans coat. End of section twenty six.